Welcome to the copyright office's hearing on the new technologies used by motion pictures and the television industry. At this hearing, uh, we will attempt to gather information for the copyright office study, which Chairman Kastenmeier and his House Judiciary Subcommittee uh, had requested us to do several months ago. Uh, we will complete our study early in 1989, as requested by Chairman Kastenmeier, and we will print the transcript of today's hearing, as well as the written statements, uh, as part of the, uh, the study in an appendix. Uh, both uh, will be available uh, for a modest stipend in this, this age of pay-as-you-go. As, as important as today's hearing is, it is only a small part of a, a much larger drama. Uh, we have already had extensive discussions with many of the men and women involved in these complex technologies. And I should mention the technologies uh, for the people in the audience. Uh, technologies are colorization, lexiconing, and panning and scanning. And I should further mention that lexiconing uh, is the term of art uh, used in the industry uh, for either stretching out or compressing the original length of a motion picture. Uh, two members of my uh, staff several weeks ago spent some time in Los Angeles gathering first-hand knowledge uh, of how Hollywood professionals put these new technologies to use. I want to thank uh, all of the people they've been talking to. I want to thank all of our witnesses today. And I want to thank all of those other people in the motion picture industry, the television industry, and the video industry who have already given so much of their time. For those parties still wishing to add their voices to our study, I will hold the record open until September 22nd uh, for any written statements. Before I describe the purpose and goals of today's hearing and our study, let me briefly retrace the Copyright Office's actions to date on the issue of colorization. Once and for all, I want to clear up a misconception that many people have about the decision I made recently on colorization. Last June, June of 87, that is, I issued uh, the final decision on the registrability of colorized motion pictures. At that time, I said that if a colorizer adds more than a trivial amount of new human authorship by adding color to a black and white work, then the Copyright Office would issue a registration for copyright for the additional authorship. The registration covers only the new colors that have been added. It does not expand or detract from any copyright in the original black and white film. It does not take anything out of the public domain. We base this decision on over 100 years of registering works for copyright, applying the law as defined by Congress and the courts. That law does not take aesthetic value into account. In no way did I endorse the practice of colorizing black and white motion pictures. The decision merely acknowledged that in some cases, not all cases, but some cases, there is sufficient human authorship to qualify for copyright registration. In these cases, the practice of colorizing a work originally made in black and white is the creation of a derivative work under the copyright law, 
and like all derivative works, it is done with the permission of the original copyright holder, or in the case of public domain works, it is done simply because the law and Congress allows it. It would take a change in the copyright law to prohibit the practice of colorization, and that is Congress's decision to make, not the Copyright Office. That brings us to the subject of today's hearing and to our study. Congress can, if it wishes, simply allow the existing practices, including our registration decision, to continue. It can require some form of consumer protection, such as labeling. It can require some restrictions on the uses of these technologies. Or finally, it can call for the outright ban on some or all of these practices, at least prospectively. Chairman Kastenmeier has to decide if we need new legislation. To help him decide, he wants detailed explanations of the current practices in the industry. It is a battle royal that pits one side against the other, between those who see the creation of a film as the creation of an immutable work of art. Uh, on the other hand, there are those who see a film as a simple commercial undertaking, with colorization, lexiconing, and panning and scanning only a means of creating new and lucrative markets for these works. In today's hearing, we will look at how these technologies are used. We will ask why the industries find them commercially necessary. What are the alternatives? What objections are made to the uses of these technologies and by whom? What aesthetic and commercial consequences result from the use of these technologies? These are some of the questions we need answers to. Uh, we will seek the answers today in the context of the existing copyright law including the issue of moral rights in the United States and in other countries. We will also look at the current contractual and collective bargaining agreements that govern these new technologies. Finally, we will look at what consumer protection, if any, Congress should look at, like labeling requirements, uh, like labeling requirements that Congress uh, implemented uh, this summer as part of the film preservation bill. We will also look at issues connected with what I call the protection of our cultural heritage. Are colorized black and white films still shown in public theaters, on TV, and on videotape in their original condition? I think uh, we can agree that uh, all uh, of us want to make sure that we preserve these treasures of our film industry and make sure that they remain a part of our culture. Uh, the question arises, uh, what role uh, should the government take in film preservation? Even more difficult, what role should it take in making films accessible to the public where there isn't any economically viable market for them? Finally, we will provide Congress with recommendations for legislative changes if we believe that they are necessary. But it is more important for us to offer Congress a range of options rather than decide if these changes are needed. Let me now introduce my panel for today's hearing. These individuals will also be my key contributors in the preparation of the Copyright Office study. I'm joined by three lawyers from my senior staff, William Patry on my immediate right, Eric Schwartz on my far right, and Louis Flax on my far left, and on my immediate left, uh, Dorothy Schrader, the general counsel of the Copyright Office. At this time, I would like to call our first panel of witnesses. I see they're already in place and eager to go. Uh, they re represent uh, three companies, uh, and to my knowledge, they are the only companies in the world that colorize uh, uh, motion pictures. I will ask you to uh, introduce yourselves, and I will, I will note uh, the presence of the former general counsel uh, of the uh, Copyright Office, uh, a gentleman who at our last hearing was described as the world's finest lawyer, <laughs> John Baumgarten, uh, and he's here to accompany Mr. Edelman. But gentlemen, if you would please uh, introduce yourselves and decide who's going to go first, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, my name is Bernard Weitzman. I'm with American Film Technologies. It's listed here George Jensen and Art Hartel, but they are not here. I am here. 
and I will speak on behalf of American Film Technologies and the industry in general. My name is Rob Word. I'm with Quintex Entertainment, uh, formerly Hal Roach Studios, and I'm senior vice president of the company and proud to represent us here today uh, to talk about colorization. My name is uh, Joe Edelman. I'm senior vice president of Color Systems Technology. I'm accompanied today by our Washington attorney, John Baumgarten, whom the register has already identified. We would like to start off our panel, if we may, by a 10-minute video presentation, half of which is devoted to an explanation visually of how the colorization process, particularly at Color System Technology, but in many respects applicable to all of the other coloring companies, how the process works, how it starts, what it does, what it does not do, the people involved, their skills, and their tasks. That would be followed by a brief demonstration of colorized expert excerpts, which our company did for several motion pictures uh, owned by the Turner Entertainment Company. Uh, briefly, at the end of that presentation are several still shots of pictures in production. And uh, immediately subsequent to that, Mr. Ward uh, will be presenting uh, just a few minutes of excerpts colored by colorization for a TV series, which is also a marketplace for colorized products. Just your sets. I think the picture tube needs little dusting. <laughs> the concept of coloring black and white material is not original. Uh, in the late 1890s, Thomas Edison had established an assembly line to hand paint black and white film. In 1917, different strands of film, one for reds, one for blue greens, were used to produce color by bonding them together. During the 1920s, alternative systems were developed. These included tinting and dyeing the black and white film and toning, which colored only the grays and shadows. With the advent of sound, color experimentation diminished because color dyeing interfered with the soundtrack. A few years later, Kodak developed new dyes, which were used until 1949. All of these attempts were to color convert black and white film. What we're doing is color converting videotape. This process is made up of six major steps. The first step is making a new print of the original film and transferring this to videotape. This is done on a scene by scene basis so that we can provide the best quality picture available on videotape for the coloring process. The next step involves our continuity department. Here a specialist identifies each individual shot in the film. A typical feature length film is made up from 800 to 1400 unique shots. Each one is cataloged individually. The next step involves the art director and research staff. The art director will establish the overall look for color selection for the entire picture. Using information obtained by the researchers, they'll establish specific colors for flesh, hair color, eye colors of key characters, and provide a general look for each set and location within the film. As we are doing this process, we keep in mind that we are creating a new form of entertainment that is not to be seen in an old movie palace on a 50-foot screen, but in the living room on a 20-inch television. The next step is to create a storyboard. This is a visual presentation of key shots within the film, utilizing the direction and guidance of the art director to establish the overall look for the entire movie. 
After approval of the storyboard, the bulk of the coloring work begins. Each individual shot in the movie is now colored. A number of keyframes will be selected from the shot to establish the position for masks which define areas of the picture, applying color sets to those areas which will include many hues and tones. These masks will specify individual areas of the picture. Within these areas may be multiple objects. The masks are available and can be created on five different planes. And this allows us the ability to blend and mix colors, the same as an artist would with paint. When mask areas overlap each other, the colors are added together, giving us an infinite tonal palette. Our colors are able to achieve these difficult goals because of their wide backgrounds in the areas of graphic arts, fine arts, cinematography, photography, and other artistic disciplines that are very useful to them on a day-to-day -day basis in their job. For consistency's sake, shots are not colored in the order they appear in the film. Rather, they're grouped by location and character. Therefore, at this point, our editor takes over. His task is to be sure that the original order is maintained as each individual shot is recorded into the final product. At this point, he will also balance the colors from scene to scene, assuring a smooth transition from one cut to the next. After approval of this final reel, by our art director, our client, and our internal staff, the product is complete. We now have a new color version of the film. The following are examples of new color converted product. If I had one wish to make, this is the wish I would choose. I'd want an old
something going on here. There certainly is. And it's that hit sitcom America has loved and laughed with for years. There's Japs up here. There's Japs over there. There's Japs over there. And there's Japs down here. Forget them. Because here, here is the Navy's real enemy. Here is McHale. Hal Roach Studios proudly presents McHale's Navy, the series that over the years has won the hearts of millions. But there's more to this classic series than meets the eye, because McHale's Navy will finally be seen in color. The way I see it, two brunettes, two redheads, and a blonde. Well, I can't see a thing. My glasses keep steaming up. But Hal Roach Studios knows that color isn't the only reason this package is a winner. I'm really going to get you. <laughs> Since its debut, this network hit has proven to be a success. Now, through colorization, that success is ensured again and again for generations of new viewers. Gee, I love that kind of talk. Today's situation comedies rarely go off the stage. This is not a Hollywood set, you know. This is a real naval base, and I'm a real base commander. McHale's Navy travels from the South Seas to European seaports, all in the name of fun and adventure. We're offering 138 episodes of unbeatable slapstick comedy that always tickles the funny bone. And in the battle for laughs, McHale's Navy offers a little R&R &R from other sitcoms that fail to deliver. Okay, girl. And of course, there's the superb cast of superstars who have only gotten bigger and even more popular over the years. Ernest Borgnine. McHale of the United States Navy. Tim Conway. It's in Charles Parker reporting aboard, sir. <laughs> Joe Flynn. Uh, why, me? why is it always me? Carl Valentine, Gavin McLeod, plus the regular crew of hilarious characters. This series has a broad-based demographic appeal because as a past network hit, it's already proven that it will appeal to men, women, and teens. See that? That chair was out to get me. Even as a black and white series, McHale's Navy is not outdated. <laughs> Colorization will just heighten its appeal with audiences everywhere. I got just screamed. The possibilities for access success are unlimited, and McHale's Navy will outperform and outmaneuver your competition while adding to the strength of your programming lineup. Hal Roach Studios gives you a rainbow of reasons why this hit is on target for your station. So don't you miss the boat. Join McHale's Navy and join in the celebration of an unsinkable comedy success. Come home to the classic, all new in color. McHale's Navy is now at your command. With all due respect, Mr. Edelman, and uh, with due deference to the importance of this hearing, I think many in the audience, including many in the panel here, would prefer to sit around and watch the movies that you've shown, shown <laughs> excerpts from today, but we should get on with the series. Well, business. we can arrange that, and we probably enjoy it more we'll as well. I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over first to Mr. Rob Ward of the uh, Colorization Inc., and then to Mr. Weissman, and I'll make some concluding remarks, and perhaps also Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, I should uh, first mention uh, what we just saw in the second clip, which was, uh, as you could see, a, uh, a television series. Now, this is the uh, the first situation comedy uh, that has been uh, colorized, and we're excited about it because what it's done is taken a, a black and white show that that uh, obviously still has some humor content to it that has been languishing on the shelves and. Uh, it always seems a shame uh, when we're dealing with the old black and white movies as the old black and white TV series that uh, it should just be limited to memories or to nostalgia buffs. And by, by creating uh, the new colors uh, for this series, uh, we will uh, create a, a new generation uh, of uh, viewers to appreciate this show. 
uh, much as uh, new generations today are discovering uh, the classic films. I noticed uh, the, uh, the clip uh, of uh, Cyrano de Bergerac with Jose Ferrar. It's a forgotten film done in 1950 that uh, won an, an Academy Award for Best Actor uh, for Jose Ferrar. And to see it in color uh, on TV just means that, uh, that many, many people are now going to get a chance to see that because there's, there's really nothing uh, to, uh, to entice them to even sample the show as, uh, uh, as you may or may not be aware uh, of the 88 million households uh, in the country. Uh, Ninety-six percent of them have at least one color TV set, uh, so that really uh, limits the appeal of black and white because people do uh, prefer to watch color at home. Uh, it's uh, television is a, a commercial enterprise, and uh, you know commercials are, have always been a part of free television. And while television in the 50s and early up until the mid to late 60s was in black and white, uh, we're now seeing uh, the majority of all shows being in color. In fact, in the uh, uh, TV Guide of last month, August 20th, uh, just a sampling of all the programs in that one week of television, 95% uh, of the shows were in color. And it's not that there are no black and white programs available, it's just that the stations refuse to buy them because, as I said, it's a commercial enterprise. And they, they are, are very competitive. They, uh, they have uh, their, their viewers that uh, they want to, to, to have as many of them as they can, and they, they just don't get them in black and white. And so the, the new technology of, uh, of being able to adapt the classic feature films and now uh, dipping into the, the classic <coughs> television series is going to, to really make available uh, these, these older films and TV shows, which, which we think is very exciting. Uh, the television series, of course, the ratio for the TV series uh, was designed to, to fit the, the size of a TV screen. And all of the older films that uh, were originally filmed in black and white up until about 1953 were all uh, in the same ratio or similar to what a TV screen is. Uh, to compete with the, the, the TV uh, uh, explosion in the mid to, and early 50s, uh, motion picture studios had to come up with different things like 3D and, uh, and widescreen. And widescreen, uh, as you know, does not fit uh, the TV screen. You see about, uh, oh, a half to two-thirds of the original image. That's why so often when you're watching a movie uh, made after 1953, uh, you see uh, abrupt pans or scans, and that's a, that's a technology that uh, was done originally uh, with little care uh, to adapt these films to television. Now, of course, technology has improved so much that, uh, that the, the producers and the directors get involved because when they originally were making these films, television was not there and there was no need for them to even consider uh, what was needed to make these films work on television. And now they get involved uh, so that you, when you're watching a movie, you don't see two noses talking because the, the framing, the composition was different. And they'll help to adapt that, uh, which is the, merely the selection of what is important to uh, the drama, to the comedy, to, to the actual action that's going on in the story, in the movie, so that that's what's seen. And it's a selective process. It's another step of editing that didn't exist before television because there was no need for it. It didn't exist before widescreen. Uh, uh, Cyrano and the wonderful MGM uh, uh, classics uh, and Warner Brothers films that were colorized that we've seen in these clips were done prior to the widescreen. And so uh, there's no need for them to be panned and scanned, but because they're in black and white, uh, there's little demand for them on television. And by, by colorizing them, uh, it's helping to meet the needs of the modern technology, which is television. Uh, television mm -hmm. has helped the majority of people are, are entertained. They see their films, uh, whether they rent them or whether they watch them over free TV. 
you know, they, they viewed him on television. Uh, so instead of watching the, the classic old films as they were originally intended on a 50 or a 75 foot screen in a dark theater with no interruptions, uh, where all the nuances of the black and whites and the grays would, would come across. Uh, they now watched them on a very small, although it's, a, it's getting larger from a 19 inch, which used to be standard, now the standard is about a 25 inch, but still it's quite a bit different from, from watching uh, a movie on television than it is to experience it on, on a large screen. And the audience preference obviously is for color on television because uh, they're buying the color TV sets. Uh, the networks, uh, it's been years since they've produced anything in black and white. And uh, they're trying to get a, a larger audience. Uh, when we're taking uh, the films in, in our company uh, and transferring them to videotape, we not only are preserving uh, a copy of that on videotape, but we're uh, oftentimes uh, creating a better copy than had been uh, in existence in television syndication uh, in the previous years. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, actually through the 70s, uh, movies and the television series were distributed and syndicated on 16 millimeter prints. And those would be shipped around from station to station and mutilated. Uh, Q dots, uh, which are a warning for commercials coming up, would be punched into the film, and uh, as, as, a, as a warning to the, uh, the switcher, the director at a TV station, when it was time to place in the commercial. These films would be scratched and battered, and uh, it just was a disservice to the, the wonderful work that had been done on these films initially. Uh, once they're transferred to videotape, uh, there are uh, processes of which, you know, we're proud to be uh, taking a lot of the scratches out, enhancing the audio, and, and making them look better. And those are things that must be done before the colorization process starts. Because if, if it's not done then, all of those scratches and the Q dots and the mutilated scenes and, and pieces that are missing, well, those same flaws will be inherent in the color. Uh, so there's quite a bit of restoration that goes on before the actual uh, colorization begins. I know in, in one of the films that uh, we, we colorized something to sing about with James Cagney, we looked for a print and it was a musical of course and Jimmy Cagney uh, being a hoofer it was ideal for, for color. It's one of those lost movies that, that uh, even film buffs never really, never really saw. So we found a print of it, but it was a reissue called The Battling Hoofer, and about 10 minutes had been taken out of it. And so we had to continue our search for another print, and we found another print that was the original length, a little bit longer, but it had scratches and it uh, was unsuitable for colorization. Finally, uh, we, we located five different prints and assembled uh, a complete version of this, uh, restored it in black and white. Uh, before the art directors uh, began to look at it uh, with an eye for uh, transferring the black and white to color and creating our color version of something to sing about. Now when that was completed, uh, we had already been marketing the restored black and white version in the video market. So the black and white version was available uh, in home video, even though, as you'll hear later, I'm sure, from the video store representatives, there's there's really little demand uh, from the consumer uh, for black and white. We did it because we, we felt it was a service to the public. And when the, the color came on the market, uh, obviously that's what people were choosing. And that's the one that uh, has been available on television. And uh, people have had a chance to see it now, just as they'll have a chance to see Sereno de Bergerac and uh, Jose Ferrar's wonderful performance. and. Uh, it's, it's just the technology that uh, is making it work. I, I know that uh, in Clint Eastwood's movie Bird, he's taken uh, Charlie Parker's single uh, composition where Charlie Parker is the only person playing. And to make it acceptable to today's audience in his new movie, <coughs> he hired other artists, other uh, instrumentalists to record on top of Charlie Parker's 
uh, original piece. And while he didn't destroy the original, what he did was he expanded on that original with new artists to contemporize the sound to make it available and entertaining for a new generation. Now, I'm not a big fan of Charlie Parker, but I'm going to see that movie, and I think the music will probably uh, appeal to people who who think that uh, Charlie Parker's perhaps a little too austere for them. And that's what we're trying to do, too, is to, to create something new that will appeal to generations, not just today, uh, but forever, uh, as long as there is uh, uh, the, the television medium of, of distribution, we feel that uh, these films should be seen, and rather than have them sit on the shelf, as McHale's Navy has been doing, uh, we're looking into rediscovering uh, not just classic movies, but classic TV shows, and continuing to keep them before the viewing public, which is what they were made for originally, uh, for pure entertainment purposes. And we, we feel they should still be entertaining people. There's no reason to hide them away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have two other members of the panel. Do you have something further to add? Uh, other? Um, my name is uh, Bernie Weitzman. I'm the newest kid on the block. Uh, American Film Technologies is the uh, third company that's entered in the colorization field. Uh, I'm probably the oldest gentleman in this group. Uh, I've been around the industry since uh, 1948, and just for a moment about... When you say the industry, you mean the motion picture? Motion industry. picture and television industry. Uh, just to give you a little background, because when, when we speak, I think it's important to know where we come from. And I wasn't born into color. I, I was born into the industry, and color came about through evolution. Uh, my, my first major experience in the broadcasting business, work, I, I worked on the original I Love Lucy which, by the way, was in black and white. And I think that if you, you saw the shows being filmed as I did from first-hand knowledge, you would, you would cry to have that show now done in color. <clears throat> and all the directors that were involved with it, I think, would agree with me. And there are a number of shows like that that Rob has pointed out that really need this kind of, of, of input and help to make it more outstanding and make the public be aware of, of what they can see. Well, the single most important point is that we're not touching the black and white version. We're giving the, 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 the public an option to see what it really looked like on the sound stage when it was shot in black and white, but really in color, and what it would look like in color after it was recreated. So I think that's a marvelous opportunity, plus the fact that our technology, my company in particular, I can speak for only my company, that I think we've done an incredible job of improving the technology to the extent that if everybody would stop talking about colorization and coloring and just looked at the picture for the quality that it represented, I don't believe if you ever took a poll and statistics that the, that the public would vote yay or nay because it was, it was in color because the public would think that that picture was originally shot in color. There would never be any doubt that that picture was shot in color even though the picture was originally shot in black and white and that's the advancement that we're giving, plus the fact that you always have the right to see it in black and white without touching it. Uh, our biggest customer uh, is Turner Entertainment, the same as, as Joe. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, our, our second major customer is Republic Pictures Corporation. The first picture that we did for them was a, a great classic black and white film called The Bells of St. Mary's which starred Bing Crosby and Ingrid Bergman. I wish I brought some of the film here, but I figured we had such limited time, I just didn't want to go on with, with so much film. I wanted to talk about it first-hand knowledge. And this went on the air in November, December of 1987. This was our first effort. That particular picture for Republic uh, got a, a nine, uh, was ninth in the Nielsen ratings, for a picture that was originally done in 1945. It was a single picture, no publicity, no promotion. It just went out and it, and it did a spectacular job because it was in color. And the picture had been around for 40, 43 years in black and white and never attained such a rating as it did when it was shown in color for the first time. The people from Republic were, were, were so impressed by that 
they only had two pictures with us originally. They picked up for an additional eight pictures. Now they want to go for 25 more because the receptiveness on the color basis has been so great as far as the public is concerned that they see a great future in it. They've also told me, as a matter of fact, that the video cassette version of this picture in color outsold the black and white version 10 to 1. Now, one of the simplest little studies that I can give you with all the complicated uh, reports and Nielsen's and statistics and so forth, there was a very impressive study done in Los Angeles uh, not too long ago by one of the Los Angeles stations. And they, they were interviewing the public at large and, and getting all kinds of comments. And finally, they went to one little seven-year-old kid and they said, why, why do you like color over black and white? What's your feeling about that? And the kid says, it looks better. That was the whole analysis. That's what it's all about. It looks better. It feels better. The public is more attracted to it. It's something that I believe uh, will, will show up in every statistic that we're, we're willing to take. Um, in addition, uh, one of our major customers is, uh, is Disney. Now, believe it or not, we're doing 10 hours of the Disney cartoons that Walt Disney originally put together in 1933. And they were in black and white. And we're coloring them now. And I guarantee you, if you looked at those colored cartoons, you couldn't pick out the cartoons of today versus the cartoons of 1933. They are that good. And Disney is, is confirming how good they are because they're paying us a lot of money to do them all. And they're very happy with them. And you, you all probably know that they're, that they're, they're very difficult. They're, they're, they're very they're, they're perfectionists. Uh, they want the best. They wouldn't, they wouldn't endanger their, their reputation and quality on doing something on a second-rate basis. And I think that's true of, uh, of Turner. Uh, it's true of Fox. It's true of every major organization today because we're selling to the public. The public has the right to turn that knob off or on. And if it isn't good, the public isn't going to pay for it. So we have tried to meet those public standards uh, by the quality and the effort. And we believe our process is extremely creative. We have 162 people employed in our plant in San Diego. And, and these, these people are, are, are all ages, predominantly under 35, because most of them have been uh, recent college graduates from the San Diego State, University of San Diego, Cal State of the Arts. And, and they're very artistic and very creative. And, uh, and, and they're not only able to create, but they also are, are able to uh, operate the computer. So you have to have the combination of the two talents. And these kids are astounding because they've become design artists, they've become creative artists, they've now put our, our color palette, believe it or not, is capable, and so therefore everybody thinks we can do everything, but we can't, is capable of, of doing 16,800,000 different color combinations. So people say, my God, give us that off blue and that off, you can't do everything perfectly, but but the technology and the state of the art that we're accomplishing in this business has become so good that I would challenge anyone to take a look at what we can do today. And we're improving every day. Some of the films that you've seen here today were some of the early films and some of the arguments that people have had. They look pastel and they look this and they look that. The other thing is that the customer also has the right to select what they want. In the Bells of St. Mary picture that I was describing earlier, the client wanted it to be subdued. He didn't want the colors to jump out and hit you. He wanted it to be very soft and quiet and, and commensurate with the picture that we were showing, which was a religious type of picture. And that's what we try to do. Look, we would work with the directors if they were alive and willing to work with them. We, we welcomed them. We, we were able to find an art director who, who worked on the Bells of St. Mary's, and we worked with him to come up with the, with the absolute creative look in its best form. So we go out of our way to try to research, work with people who may have been connected with the picture. We, we work with the academy. We work with the, with the public. We try to work with anyone that can help to make the picture look good with our technology. And we try to hire the best people there are, the most creative people available, and come up with product that the public will be proud of and, and never destroy the original work 
that will always be available to the public. Anyhow, that's my... Thank you very point. much. Uh, would you uh, want to add something else, Mr. Edelman? Yes, if I may. Uh, I'd like to request that my full statement be made a part of the record, and I would like to just highlight a couple areas that uh, neither Mr. Ward nor Mr. Weissman addressed. Although Mr. Weissman was very eloquent, it's his first time in, in front of a, a federal agency. It's my third. I think I'm getting a little weary of it, even though Washington's weather is very nice this week. Uh, our company, Telesystem Technology, has colorized approximately 50 motion pictures. Admittedly, some of the early ones, the ones that did, as Mr. Weitzman mentioned, uh, create and uh, cause some of the harsh criticism of, uh, as to quality, uh, are no different than any other form of early technology. We've improved considerably. We have invested $55 billion in capital. We have over 200 employees. And we're getting a little tired of being considered and charged with something that's in the nature of some criminal abomination in terms of our activity. We don't think we're doing any more than is consistent with the constitutional uh, premise behind the copyright law. Innovative dissemination of new means for a new generation of public, I think is the premise behind Article I of the Constitution. In layman's terms, we've not destroyed anything. The original negative is there in black and white. The prints are in black and white. And although we could not bring today a film in black and white, we did show you that if you turn off the color button, the original videotape is black and white. Um, we have made our black and white prints of colorized pictures available on request, gratis, to universities, to museums, to other such archival screenings. They are available for, in their black and white form for those few limited commercial areas that may want to license them, whether it's cable, a couple or three um, theatrical venues still left in this country, although very few. Uh, but as Mr. Ward said, what we are doing is supplying the public with um, enjoyable entertainment in the form in which the modern generation is accustomed to seeing it. We've spent a lot of money. We're taking risks. We're not apologetic. We don't ask for any guarantees. We uh, uh, ask that our works, derivative works, and the terminology of the copyright uh, law uh, be allowed the uh, freedom of the marketplace as any other derivative work. Uh, I want to touch on two matters, and then uh, I think that will conclude my remarks. Uh, the Copyright Office asked for some uh, information or input as to practices in foreign countries or reception or by foreign countries. There is an argument going on in one foreign country, but in terms of my experience, extensive experience over the past year in showing our product, there is a decided interest by major Western European countries and Eastern European countries including East Germany and the Soviet Union, in having our process, or the colorization process in general, implemented to convert their black and white films into a modern medium of exhibition so that their audiences will appreciate them and see some of their marvelous works. Uh, I've had French, British, Russian, Italian people come up to me in my visits to Europe and say, ask me about the process. I have a film. It was made in 1930. Nobody's watching it. Can I have it done? We've had inquiries from the BBC, uh, the lady of uh, television of, uh, of Great Britain. Um, pictures have been licensed to the BBC in colorized form. Pictures have been licensed to the French network in colorized form. Uh, and they are looking also for us to convert their films into the modern medium. There is a different law in France and Germany, as we're aware, moral rights, and they will have to contend with uh, what is required under their laws. Uh, we are subject, as may be one of the other witnesses we'll talk about today, to a lawsuit currently in Paris, not we ourselves, but we colorize a picture that was 
It's licensed by a French network, and uh, the heirs of John Huston brought an action in concert with the French Writers and Directors Union. Uh, I think we'll prevail at the trial that's uh, due later this month. And now I'd like to address finally the issue of contractual practices in our industry and what I think dangerously underlies uh, a lot of the charges we've been subjected to. There, have been, there are extensive collective bargaining and individual negotiations in the motion picture industry. I, at one time during my career, headed up the Association of Motion Picture and Television Producers and at various other times was a senior executive of both United Artists and Paramount and was very active in that arena in addition to others. It just would be mind-boggling to describe the uh, esoteric areas of collective bargaining agreements in the motion picture uh, industry, far beyond just minimum wages and working conditions. The Directors Guild of America, in particular, has for years and years and years uh, demanded, negotiated, and obtained what they call creative rights through their uh, collective bargaining agreements. They cover the rights of directors to be consulted, the rights of directors to do certain acts without interference, and limitations on what the studios can do. The, these negotiations have been long, and they've been successful for the Directors Guild uh, over the years. Um, they have, interestingly enough, antagonized other unions in terms of their demands. The Directors Guild and the Writers Guild have long battled ferociously as to screen credits. Who can say it's a so-and-so's film and who can't? Um, and the industry has sometimes been caught in the middle between two guilds battling for that kind of recognition. Uh, in the recent Writers Guild negotiations, which ended after a long, long strike, the Writers Guild asked for some protection from the producers, some additional creative rights. The Directors Guild reared up and said, you can't have them. Those are ours. And the producers were influenced not to grant those additional rights. But that's okay. That's the marketplace of collective bargaining negotiation, and there are also extensive and prolonged, heavy individual negotiations with uh, lawyers and agents representing directors, writers, and, and actors. We believe that's really where this argument of there is one uh, lies, and that's in the realm of the private sector negotiation. We don't believe that there's any need whatsoever for any federal legislation in this area. Uh, the National Film Preservation Board, which you recently uh, mentioned, uh, to us is also, in principle, unacceptable in terms of getting the government involved in any form in determining what is uh, of value, whether it's a motion picture, a book, painting, what have you. This is not where the government belongs. It's close to censorship, even though it's supposed to identify our classics. Can we live with the bill as it is? Yes, and we will have to if it's enacted, um, and abide by the labeling provisions, but we think it's a dangerous precedent. Uh, as I said, underlying this, in my opinion, is an attempt by one group in particular, Directors Guild, to achieve by legislation what they should achieve by negotiation and what maybe they have not today achieved by negotiation. Now, what they're really looking for, in our opinion, in my opinion, is not just to restrict or prohibit colorization. I think they're looking for the introduction piecemeal of moral rights in, the, in our country. And that's fine, but I think they should come out in the open and say so, and let moral rights be uh, introduced and debated in the halls of Congress for each and every artist, not just directors or principal screenwriters, if that's the way our legislators want to go, fine. But I don't think we should single out areas which are really insignificant in the overall view of moral rights. And they certainly don't belong to just directors. Um, I recall the register himself making some comments in our last meeting with Representative Kassemeyer 
pointing out very clearly that the Gebhardt Bill was quite exclusive and ignored the collaborative efforts of many other talents involved in film and television production, actors, cinematographers, other writers, composers, set designers, and I think that's accurately said so. It is a collaborative effort. And I think the moral rights of other countries recognize more than just directors and writers. But that's where I think all this stems from. I think that's where it belongs. Um, and uh, I'd like to come back to Washington as a non-participant next time. I thank you very much. Other uh, activities in the colorization area, in addition to motion pictures, we saw Mikhail's Navy. Are there other, other efforts to uh, to revive some of the great uh, uh, television classics from the 50s, uh, Playhouse 90 or, or Omnibus? We're very honored today to have in the audience Bob Sodak, who was the producer of the Omnibus series uh, back in the 50s. He's now the uh, head of the uh, motion picture broadcasting and, and recorded sound division of the Library of Congress. And I'm wondering if, if you're really focusing on situation comedies of a series type or whether they... Can I, can I address myself to that? In fact, we just completed a segment of World War II footage for War and Remembrance, the new mini-series by ABC that's going to start this November. And they did a ma magnificent job, and there will probably never be a series of that kind ever produced again. It, it cost over $100 million, and we did some of the footage for them that they couldn't possibly shoot today. We took the old World War II footage and really matched it to what they shot originally today. And I think that's another thing that we can do is, is bring back programs, as you're talking about, omnibus and great programs of that kind. The only problem that I can see for the present in that area is, A, the quality of the elements themselves that we have to work with to restore the color, and two, a cost factor. Because it is a very costly process that we, we are doing here in the color, coloring business. And if costs can be reduced, I think we can also add that great service to the public for posterity's sake. In addition, we're also working on restoration of, of color film that are, it's losing its color because of the chemical process. Some of the great films of all time that were originally shot in color uh, are fading because of the chemical deterioration. And we can bring that color back uh, to where it was originally, almost to the perfection of the original Technicolor shooting. And you will do that? even without the benefit of copyright protection? Yes. <laughs> well, it's already copyrighted material. So all, all we're doing is bringing it back. As you said earlier, it doesn't change the copyright position. One question, Mr. Edelman, uh, before uh, turning to the other members of the panel. You, uh, you mentioned you're talking to people in Europe. Who are you talking to? Are you talking to directors? Are you talking to broadcasters? Are you talking to people who own the film? We are talking mainly to broadcasters. We are talking to people who own films. And I myself have indeed had a couple of conversations with uh, directors. Uh, I don't think I'd like to name their names. Uh, those were private conversations. Uh, one was uh, from the UK in particular, a well-known director who did a picture in the 30s and would love it to see it on the screen again. Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn to Mr. Patry now uh, and uh, ask him to uh, ask a few questions. Mr. Word, you mentioned the Charlie Bird film, uh, which I've been following as well. One fact that hasn't been reported in the newspapers is whether Mr. Eastwood got Mr. Bird's heirs' permissions to rescore his music. Do you know whether that's in fact the case? Yes, I believe they uh, received the recording uh, that they've enhanced and added arrangements to uh, from uh, his widow in France. And so she, uh, she worked with uh, Eastwood, at least in supplying that. <coughs> Okay. That's rather a, a different fact than some of the facts that are involved here, uh, at least uh, with respect to the directors and uh, cinematographers and others, might be distinguishing fact. But I think that most people, even most directors, would agree that you all currently have the right to colorize motion pictures without the director's consent. Uh, 
um, absent any sort of contractual restrictions that people like Woody Allen might have, assuming that you do have that clear right. Should that really be the end of the matter, though, leaving aside that you have that legal right? Should you nevertheless go ahead and do it, notwithstanding that a substantial part of the public and maybe even a substantial number of seven-year-olds uh, uh, like it as well, if the director and the actors and the other creative people who are involved in it object to it, even find it morally repugnant? Should you go ahead and do it anyway, notwithstanding that you have the legal right to do it? Uh, well, the, the films that we are doing, uh, obviously we do have the legal right to do it. And in television, uh, we've discussed, uh, Mr. Edelman has discussed how uh, film is a collaborative art. Well, in, in television especially, it's certainly not a director's medium. It's a producer's medium. The director essentially has no say in... Uh, the packaging and the, the production. He's a person for hire who comes in on a weekly basis uh, brought in by the producers and it's the producers who are the creative force behind all TV shows. And you, you would agree though that, that certainly the director has some creative uh, well, impact he, of the movie. Well in a, in a movie the director is the boss and okay. theatrical films on television uh, it's, it's a different medium. It's okay. a producer's leave, medium. Leave television aside. My question is really not who has the overall final authority. My question is conceding, as you really have to, that directors and cinematographers and set and costume designers do have substantial creative input. My question is, leaving aside that you have the legal right to do it, should you go ahead and exercise that right when those individuals object to it? It's, it's, it's not a question I, I can answer. Uh, we're, we're doing you know, what is legally uh, proper uh, and making available. Uh, let's, let's look at it a, a different way. Uh, think about the, the directors and the cinematographers and the writers who created these films and who are no longer uh, around to, uh, to have any input at all. Is it right to, to have these films be forgotten for future generations and just remain to be seen by no one because they are not available in color and the hard work and the creativity that they went into creating the story and the mood and the message of these films uh, just be uh, totally forgotten and not available to future generations? But that, that's a different question. My question is when the people are there and the film is not forgotten. You can't say the Casablanca is forgotten. You can't say the Maltese Falcon is forgotten. You can't say the Citizen Kane is forgotten. When those people are around, and, and they object, your position is that you have the legal right to do it, and notwithstanding that uh, the people involved object to it on moral grounds, that it's okay to go ahead anyway. I think it's okay to go okay. ahead anyway, yes. Because uh, if you'll look at uh, uh, the people's uh, feeling uh, of when they made these movies, uh, their appreciation and their, their uh, compassion for them is as a feature film, as something to be shown in the theaters. We're certainly not talking about uh, destroying the integrity and the original intent of their film. We're talking about a, a new medium. Television is no way uh, close to what a, a motion picture experience is. And so for them to object to uh, adding uh, elements that are different for a theatrical exhibition, uh, I certainly understand that. But for making something available on a color television monitor, which is a new medium and something that, uh, that has uh, not very much relationship to uh, the motion picture experience, uh, it's, it's creating something that's totally new and accessible. Uh, so we're not changing at all their original intention of a theatrical film. It's, it's different. Television is not movies. Uh, theatrical is, uh, is a different experience. And so when they object to that, I certainly concur. But for uh, a television monitor to create something exciting and new and, and accessible uh, for, for TV, it's, it's really, we're talking apples and oranges. Television is not and never has been 
the same as a, a theatrical motion picture. It's just, it's different. Well, the comparison is really not theatrical to television. The comparison is black and white on television versus colorized on television. It's, uh, that's different also. Okay. You are willing, at least I believe Mr. Edelman's company is, to give directors the opportunity to consult and provide input on color selection. I believe there was a letter that Mr. Edelman sent to uh, Elliot Silverstein, the executive director of the Directors Guild, to that effect. My understanding is, though, is that you are not willing to give the directors the final say about uh, certainly colorization or certainly uh, um, all the other creative decisions. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct, and that is totally consistent, Mr. Patry, with the uh, traditional custom and usage in the motion picture industry and other areas aside from colorization. Unless the director owns the picture, or the co-owner, or has what is called the final cut, and only major directors at uh, certain studios can negotiate for that. He uh, customarily has the right to several cuts, which means ed the edited version of the pictures prior to release. Thereafter, it's the production company or studio or copyright owner, as you will, who has the final say, even today. You took the position in your testimony and in your written statement that the director's problems in this area should be resolved in collective bargaining uh, agreements or in the uh, labor context. Isn't that really illusory, though? Because if, as I believe the case is, uh, that the producers will not give the directors final say, you won't give them final say either. Isn't it is illusory to say then you can rely on collective bargaining because it's something that you're never going to bargain away. Well, they, uh, they often obtain, quote, final say in individual bargaining depending upon their talent and strength, but if they can't obtain it, so what? It's no business for their Congress to legislate their rights. They work as employees. They get paid stupendous sums for their work. And it's a matter of strength of bargaining. Well, I wasn't talking about, about legislation, and I agree if it's a matter of private contractual bargaining, Woody Allen c has gotten it. That's right. And uh, maybe other people can get it too. But in terms of the basic agreement, collective bargaining, right. I, underscoring collective, not individual, right? Under collective bargaining, it's a right, in fact, that the producers are not going to give to it, That's true, the because collective bargaining deals with minimum rights of every single person who is employed in that capacity. And just as the minimum director gets maybe 75000 to direct a job for scale, and the major director gets a million dollars, the collective bargaining agreement deals only with the minimum. Right. So that we can leave aside the idea of collective bargaining. If directors are going to get what they want, they're going to have to either have the stroke to get it through individual contract bargaining, or they're going to have that, to But do that doesn't mean that they may not get some of this. They have achieved over the years certain rights to control editing of pictures cut for television, network television. Yes. It's a gradual process. They may achieve certain other rights. In this year's collective bargaining agreement, they achieved the right, which we had offered, but they achieved it prospectively, to be consulted on colorization, panning and scanning, and time compression. Right, and my question was based on the right of consultation, that that right of consultation is not going to be converted into a final cut or, or final say, at least in collective bargaining, maybe through individual ones. Is that your understanding? Uh, I can't predict what may happen uh, in terms of uh, future negotiations. Okay, I don't have any more questions. Your written statement, by the way, was, I thought, most responsive and helpful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Patrick. Schwartz? Thank you. Um, Mr. Weitzman made mention of the ability to use this computer colorization process to restore works, but you're just talking about videotapes that you can restore for television and video markets, not for theatrical markets, right? Well, we're working on a, um, a uh, method now of being able to restore to color and put back into theatrical motion onto post motion theatrical motion picture film that will be capable of projecting it back on a motion picture screen, a color version of a black and white film through our, our current technology. We will be able to do that. And we think there are certain pictures that would be sensational 
after they're colored to be put back in the theater in, in, in color and shown to the public once, once again. When you, if you have to do that process, however, now when you create a colorized work, you create, start with a black and white print. Yes. Would you also have to clean up the black and white print at the beginning of the process? In the yes, same I, mean, way I, think, I think that's a service that, that we all give, that we make the prints look better for black and white purposes as well as color. So when you show them either way, they look far better after we we add our, our process to it than they did originally. Because even under that process, you will have to remove the, the images off of the print to make them electronic images first. So yeah, but we're not, we're not taking the images. I don't want that to be mistaken. We're not taking the, the images, images off. No, no, off. no, but I mean you're using the <laughs> we're image We're just transferring it print. to a videotape. Right. The original images always stay where they are. Right, but I mean you have to use that, that image that's, that's to start That's something that the public, I think, is confused on. Eric, you know, they, they think that we're really taking that film and we're doing funny things with it when, when we're not. We're not touching it at all. Mm -hmm. We're just making a copy for our purposes to color. Right. Um, is, it, is it true, or did someone else want to respond? Is it, is it true that um, the color contrast has always been such that when you turn down in this demonstration the color knob, um, that you always have the same black and white image. Early on in the process, did you ever have to uh, wash out or change the grayscale on on the prints in order in order to colorize? No, not in our process, we don't. Is you that true for all three? Uh, I'd like to address that. There seems to be some um, miscommunication, which apparently found its way into the regulation on the positive copies that we do something to tone down the gray levels or the contrast in preparing our videotapes for colorization. Uh, that is not the case at all. We maintain the best grayscale rendition possible uh, and now there is no attempt made to decrease or increase. It's just act the same contrast as the film. That was true early on in the process as well. It's always Absolutely. true. In fact, if the grayscale if the grayscale isn't there, some pictures we just can't do. So it has to be there to start with. We don't add or subtract to it. It's got to be there, or we can't work with it in any other way. We enhance the quality of the film itself by taking out the glitches and the scratches and the and the, and the change over real markers, all of those things that make it a better looking thing, but we can't remake the picture if, if it's bad to start with. I think there has been some confusion on this point, but uh, when films were seen on television as uh, 16 millimeter prints in syndication, which was the standard, uh, those films were, were copies of copies of copies, and quite often the grayscale almost disappeared and they were black and smudgy. What we are doing is restoring them to their original subtle grays and black blacks before the colorization process begins so that they are preserved in black and white. A black and white version is there before colorizing begins. And you know, we, we do not tamper uh, adversely with the film. Yeah, we, we take the, the bad rap for bad elements, but when you see the elements that like Turner has, the quality of the elements that they have and what we can do with that, and you see the perfection of color because the quality of the elements are there to start with. Okay. I just had a, one last question for Mr. Edelman. You mentioned that color systems technology makes available 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter prints. Um, first of all, I wondered if you could explain why you do that, and I think you said you do not charge for that. And also, are, were you only talking about prints that you were the copyright holders for? the copyright owners or for any films that you color? No, we only can deal with what we own. Oh. Uh, in addition to uh, colorizing for other customers, we do own our own mm -hmm. film library. Uh, we make them available. The reason I mentioned we make them available is that there are charges made that what we are doing in effect is going to remove any availability or opportunity for people to see the black and white. And uh, over the past six months, uh, on request, uh, I have uh, wanted people to know that we are not under some
campaign to withdraw black and white from the marketplace, and I deliberately made them available. It doesn't interfere with our marketing. It makes people more aware of the picture, and both forms are available. Okay. I don't have any more questions. Uh, let me uh, ask one brief question in response to one of the, one of the answers that I heard. You, you made uh, a very uh, uh, detailed, gave us a deep, detailed explanation of the, uh, the difficulty you had in finding the perfect print of the James Cagney film and uh, uh, the, the difficulties you went to in getting that, that perfect print. Now, did you make another perfect print that would be available for theatrical relief prior to your beginning of the polarization process, or did you, did you piece it together and leave it pieced together without making a, making a perfect final print that could be then shown in the theater? Uh, we don't really deal in, in prints. Uh, what we did is we, we located the prints and then transfer, in our transfer to videotape, it's through our videotape enhancement process that uh, we restored it. So uh, we're not equipped or set up to, uh, to work on uh, film. Uh, it's, it's a videotape process. But you weren't provided with the perfect well, we, we have uh, the, the black and white preserved on videotape, uh, not on film. Mm -hmm. Ms. Schrader? Uh, Mr. Edelman, I believe you mentioned that uh, you've licensed one or more films for showing on the BBC and perhaps elsewhere in Europe. Have those transmissions actually taken place? Have they been shown on television? No, they haven't, and I should be more precise. Uh, pictures we have colorized have been licensed. They have been licensed by Turner Entertainment Company, one to the BBC, which was the, uh, not yet been shown, and there have been some pressure exerted by the British Directors Guild as an uh, unofficial influence. So that's in suspense, but it has been licensed. Uh, uh, I believe it's a charge of a light brigade. And similarly, Turner has licensed the John Houston picture, Asheville Jungle, to one of the French networks. And that's the subject of a lawsuit right now. I myself have had discussions with the BBC in terms of pictures that are in the film library that I control, which I m mentioned, and they are amenable to license group. They, do, they have no policy there against not showing colorized pictures. No policy. The BBC has not entered into an, at least an informal agreement with a group of directors and in Britain, I believe, headed by Fred Zimmerman, uh, which would indicate that at least certain classics would not be shown. Not to my knowledge, and I've met with the head of programming there in, in May. Uh, I have a question for any one of the panel. Uh, would you admit that colorizing at any time could be so, could be done so poorly in quality that a director, an eminent director, of a well-known film uh, could feel that his or her reputation had been injured by the colorizing process. Why don't you take a crack with the microphone? Uh, some of my best friends are directors. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they object to anything. If, if, if they think it's, it's, it's their work. Uh, addressing myself to a situation, I've asked one of my director friends, how come you never object to a color film that's broadcast in black and white over a television set when you only have a black and white set? How come you never say, you cannot broadcast my color film that I created in color in black and white? Why isn't that an objection? Never a peep out of anybody. So I say that some directors will object to anything. We have been, we've offered to work with them up and down the line. Now, one of the things that we can't do with the director that, that Bill Patrick brought up before is give the director absolute final control. Some directors will never let a picture go. They will work on it interminably because they feel that it can always be improved. And if anybody else touches it, it's bad. Well, we can't survive. A company can't exist. We can't run a business. If somebody says, we're going to do it as long as we want to do it, we can never meet air dates, we can never meet budgets, we can never meet cost control, we can't do anything if the director has the absolute right to decide what's good or bad. 
So if a director says, I don't like it because what you, what, what, the way you're coloring it, we say, come on in, join us, help us with it. You're welcome, as long as you play by certain rules, that you can't do it your way totally, because there are certain other elements other than creativity that you have to control too. You got, we'll all be out of business. Does anyone want to take a crack at uh, Schrader's question in terms of a specific answer? Whether, uh, in terms of whether or not uh, there could be such a mutilation as to injure the reputation of the director? It seems like it's something that, that can't really happen because the director's uh, film is still uh, preserved and available and to, to put something in color is not going to ever destroy the story. Uh, all the, the colorizing is doing is continuing to keep that director's reputation alive. We had so many calls of congratulations and thank yous from people when we screened It's a Wonderful Life, which did a 10 rating nationally, sold over a quarter of a million home video cassettes in color people thanking us, older people saying, you know, my kids would have never seen that movie and it's such a life-affirming uh, message that it has helped them in their life. I certainly don't think that that, that kind of response for a, for a classic film that uh, obviously could easily be forgotten if it remained in black and white, except for the film buffs and the nostalgia buffs out there and the, the, the small number of uh, the percentage of people who are actually uh, film mavens uh, is, is going to be hurt. It's, it's enhanced that film by broadening the audience and it's brought that wonderful message uh, to hundreds of thousands more people and will continue to do so. Just one more thing. I'd just like to add, if, if any of you would ever have the opportunity to come to the plant and see the amount of research and the time spent on trying to make every picture look wonderful. You, you would, by the way, there are certain pictures that we can't color and we won't color because we know we can't do justice to the job. We actually refuse pictures. We'll, we'll let you know that. Because you think that we would take anything, we don't. Because we have a quality, we have a pride, we have a, an organization that gets business based on what our reputation is and the quality that we, that we show on the screen. So we do work at, at that and we try to accomplish that very thing. Thank you very much, Mr. Schrader. Uh, Mr. Black? Uh, just a few questions. Um, the point you just made, and a number of you made earlier, about uh, the importance of quality, the high quality that you're able to achieve with present technology, and also the problem uh, that in some of the earlier efforts, uh, the quality may not have been so high so that the adverse publicity may have unfairly uh, put the technology in the, into, put it into an unfavorable light. I assume that quality uh, remains key. And in that light, do you care at all whether a broadcaster or a producer who paid for the colorization process alters the color of a film which you've uh, colorized for them? And if so, do you take any steps to prevent that? I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you care whether people alter the colors on films which you have colorized? Uh, well, how do they do that? They could use another colorization process. They well, could, in a final create... analysis, well, in a final analysis based on market response, decide that, well, they're not quite satisfied with what you did. They make a couple of changes. That's their right if they own the film. So basically, it's, you're just simply providing a service and they take the product and they can exploit it. Well, that, 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 that's not totally true. Um, although they may have the right to do that. I mean, we, have the, the we work with the client step by step, keyframe to subsequent frame, the final picture, so the color will be exactly as we all agree it should look like. I mean, if there's some error somewhere along the line, or if there's some, if somebody's eyes should have been blue instead of brown, you'd want to change those. But I think basically the, the work has been done, and everybody accepts it as the final work, 
but it could be changed if something is radically wrong. There's no question about that. Uh, in the middle of uh, colorizing It's a Wonderful Life, uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars had already been spent in, in preparing it. Uh, it was one of the earlier films uh, to be colorized. Uh, a technological breakthrough happened, and so a decision was made to, to pull back and reevaluate, and so the process began anew, and it ended up costing over half a million dollars because that film was an important film. Uh, to, to redo what was already done rather than just leave it there and, and continue with the, the benefit of the new technology for the rest of the film. What was done was scrapped and it was started over uh, just for the reason of maintaining quality. I, I wish I had a dollar for every original motion picture that had to be reshot extensively after the picture has been either completed or, or two-thirds of the way through when you had to go back and after you looked at your dailies and you looked at the picture and you put it all together, the company had to decide to go back and reshoot, in great part, much of the picture. It's no different in, in the color business as opposed to doing it as an original picture. People make mistakes and you want to remedy them. To uh, answer your question, if uh, we have colored a picture for uh, Turner or for 20th Century Fox and they want to show it in a different way, as copyright owner, that's their right. If it's I own the picture and somebody's recoloring it, then I think they're violating my copyright. Uh, if, they want, if I've colorized the picture for one of these other companies and they want to show it in black and white, so be. I'm curious about uh, some of the comments you've, you've made about uh, international markets. Um, is there, is there any interest in licensing the various coloring technologies that you represent uh, for use abroad, or is there any licensing now? Um, there's a definite interest uh, in terms of my own company, uh, Mr. Flax, and I've been having some active discussions with uh, entertainment companies abroad. So I'm, I'm curious that one of the major developments in Europe is the explosion of the number of broadcast outlets, uh, never before and frequently commercial television. In light of the new and expanded market for telecommunications products in Europe and elsewhere, do you think that coloring technologies can become a significant element of the U.S. export trade for audiovisual works? Yes, I do. Uh, to the, there are a number of countries which don't even want our black and white films uh, for television. People in the European countries, as I understand it, were introduced to television later than people in America, and they are accustomed to seeing black and, uh, I'm sorry, they're accustomed to seeing color when they put on a television set, not black and white, other than perhaps the, the BBC in London, who I've mentioned before, but in the, in the countries which are now privatizing television networks, uh, it's all, uh, difficult to get a black and white picture, even an American one shown, and now if it's colorized, uh, it definitely would be an increased market. Uh, I don't know if uh, you'll recall, but at the, uh, the Senator Leahy's uh, meeting of May before last, Milos Forman, uh, in commenting on the colorization, uh, said that he had a director friend in Italy who was so very excited about now being able to convert all of his black and white films, of which there is no market, uh, to color so that they would be uh, re-evaluated and uh, enjoyed by another generation. And I think that speaks well for the, the growing need for uh, colorizing the black and white product. I'm, uh, we've, we are, we're different from the other two companies in that we're a sales and distribution company uh, as well. We don't color other people's product unless we uh, participate in, in the profits. We've just sold uh, all of our product uh, to a distributor in Tokyo, and I'm going there in, in two weeks to, to unveil uh, this process to another co country. And they are so very excited about it. The press conference was scheduled for this week, but because I was here, they've rescheduled it just so that uh, they can uh, you know, have a lot of hoopla, and there is great excitement about it because, again, uh, as they watch TV, because it, it came a little bit later, uh, they're used to watching television in color, and so there's many wonderful shows 
and films that they've never even seen, that they've only read about, and now they'll have an opportunity to experience these American films. I just want to add one uh, amusing, if not ironic, anecdote. There's a very famous French director, Jean-Luc Godard, who made a wonderful film in black and white called Breathless uh, under French law, and he has the right to make these decisions. He definitely wants to have that picture colorized. And I've heard it when I was over in Europe in May, and it was subsequently reported in our industry press. And lo and behold, uh, efforts are being made to stop him, the auteur of the picture, by the cinematographer's estate. Uh, that could be quite a mess if that kind of, uh, I think, uh, premise or legal system were introduced in this country. I was uh, I just one question about uh, the references in your statement uh, and in your remarks about uh, consultations with opponents uh, of uh, coloring processes. Uh, you pretty much told them, told us what they wanted, which was uh, just final approval, or in essence, a veto. But I am kind of curious about generally what you were willing to consider as a reasonable relationship with these interests within a voluntary framework. What essentially were you willing to consider as an acceptable, regular relationship? Um, consultation is a word that is used very frequently in agreements with directors and other talent in our business, and that means listening seriously to their input and comments on selection of colors, color theme, uh, color tone, uh, color drama, and uh, going along with it where we agreed. And, arguing with them if we didn't agree, but having the final decision for ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your comments. And, uh, your full statements will be made part of the record. Mr. Baumgarten. Thank you, Mr. Oldman. I wanted to say a word about Mr. Patry's question, because I've been sitting here thinking about it. And, uh, as I recall, Mr. Patry asked at the beginning uh, whether if uh, these companies had the legal right, or their customers had the legal right to colorize, uh, whether they should do it over the objections of the directors. Uh, and I think it's important to point out that the reason they have the legal right isn't unprincipled, and it is relevant to this. And this Congress, in this country, whatever may be the law in France or Germany or Italy or elsewhere, in this country, has struggled for decades with the question of how do you deal with a collaborative work like a motion picture? And the answer has been clear and simple and consistent, and that is you give the right to make those decisions to the employer for hire, generally the producer. And the right is given uh, not because anybody wants to step on the toes of the directors or other collaborators, but simply because that is the only way one can assure the, the way copyright works in this country rather than other countries, and that's to assure dissemination. And to assure dissemination in the existing form or forms made available by new technologies. If it were otherwise, we might have to conduct a survey, Mr. Patrick, not only of the directors, but every time a new technology came around, we would, I suppose, uh, under your premise, have to conduct a survey of the directors, the cinematographers, the script writers, the scenario writers, and then perhaps we should ask that the authors of the books what they think of uh, what the directors did to their product. Uh, I think it's uh, the fact that the right exists has is very... Uh, significant to the fact that, that these gentlemen and their customers have the right to exercise it. Uh, and it's, it's not only a matter of the Copyright Act, I think it's a matter of the individual contracts that are entered into. There's a reason that virtually every contract in this industry gives all rights, and all rights and proceeds of the director's services and the other ser contributor services to the producer. And that's because if it was otherwise, you would not be able to attract the investment that's necessary to produce films either today or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, so I think the, um, the right to exercise that is, is very much relevant to the right to exercise it, notwithstanding the aesthetic objections of some of the participants in the film who have sold their rights to object um, for rather handsome sums. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Appreciate you coming today, and uh, we'll be in touch with you over the next uh, few months as we prepare the, prepare the study. The next witness is Mr. Roger Mayer from Turner Entertainment Company.
while we're uh, arranging the uh, the change of witnesses, uh, I would like to recognize uh, two uh, distinguished uh, members of the audience uh, who came in uh, a few moments ago. Uh, uh, the United States Senate is well represented by Ed Baxter, the Chief Counsel of the Senate Subcommittee on Patents, Copyrights, and uh, Trademarks, and by uh, Matt Garrison, works with Senator Leahy on the Subcommittee on Science, and Law, and Technology. Thank you very much for coming over. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Register. Uh, you have received from us a uh, written comments, and you have heard from me uh, through various committees several times. So I thought that I might take a somewhat different approach, and that is rather than reading you a statement or trying to repeat what is in our statement, uh, I will just make a few comments on some key matters that I think uh, are of interest to you, uh, give you a little bit of background so that uh, maybe uh, uh, the extent of my expertise, uh, either positive or negative, is known and then uh, ask you to question me on whatever areas you would like to, because we have gone over these things many times and we have covered the key elements in our written statement. Uh, <clears throat> just to give you a quick background on me, I've been in the industry about 36, 37 years, uh, and uh, I'm glad to hear that Mr. Weitzman's been in longer, because I thought I was gonna be the oldest man here. Uh, I. Uh, was with only two companies before I came to Turner. I was with Columbia Pictures for nine years, and then I was with MGM for 25 years. The MGM function is important uh, with regard to what we're talking about because my function was uh, not only running the studio, the MGM studio from an administrative point of view, which includes a supervision on technology, but I also ran the MGM laboratory, which was one of the best and still is, uh, motion picture laboratories in the business, so I was involved in that type of work, and one of my main functions was the supervision and preservation of the MGM li library. And by library, I'm talking about the uh, 1,800 films and the several thousand uh, shorts and uh, cartoons and a thousand hours of television programming. So uh, I did that for a long period of time, and uh, obviously that was one of the reasons I ended up with Turner Entertainment Company because Turner Entertainment Company now owns some 3,300 movies, uh, well over 1,000 hours of programming and 4,000 hours of uh, uh, 4,000 shorts and cartoons. Uh, we also, when I was at MGM, uh, I had been working on the technology of colorization with several of the companies, actually both of the companies, the, re the, the first two that were represented here. And uh, when Turner bought the company, uh, we were, in a sense, ready to go forward with this type of work because of the work that had been done for a couple of years prior to the time he uh, uh, obtained the library. Uh, without boring you with the whole history of the uh, various machinations of, and deals that resulted in the uh, pictures ending up with Turner, uh, you should understand that Turner did pay approximately $1.3 billion for this library. And uh, there are two elements, I think, that are important in that statement. Uh, number one, obviously, uh, he bought it with the understanding that he would be the copyright proprietor and that he would be the owner and he would be able to uh, exercise the rights to go along with that. And uh, one of those was colorization, but far from the most important. Obviously, the uh, freedom to distribute and the freedom to uh, uh, show these pictures in any manner whatsoever. The key to that, of course, is that, uh, and also, one of the things he was buying was the preservation that had been done and our expertise in, pres in preservation for the future. We use the word preservation not only talking about nitrate to acetate conversion and uh, the types of things where, ni where uh, negatives deteriorate, but we also talk about the, uh, what we call a, a preservation policy. And that is, when you own thousands and thousands of negatives, you also own printing materials like IPs and INs, interpositives and inter, inter negatives. You own trailers, you own TV spots, you own foreign titles, you own uh, superimposed title versions. 
in order to keep these uh, films available for distribution throughout the world in every territory, you have to have a policy which says we're going to keep these things in good shape. We're going to store them correctly, we're going to treat them correctly, and when they start to deteriorate, we are going to have new ones made. And that's a very costly process, and that's what MGM did for all those years. That's what most of the companies do. The most prominent uh, until recent years were Disney and MGM. And uh, the reason for that is the expectation that if you do that, and you really don't know what you're doing it for, that when something comes along, you will be able to have something available for that new uh, uh, technology. And that was particularly, in my own personal experience, that was particularly true for the video cassette technology, because uh, most of the work on preservation and restoration was done prior to the time the video cassette market came along, and all of a sudden that opened up whole new fields uh, for the exploitation of these pictures. And I think colorization is another way that we will be able to uh, benefit from the amount of money that's been spent and the work that's been done on preservation and restoration and storage and all the other things. We are currently spending about a million dollars a year on that kind of work. And uh, without you know getting into too many uh, instances, I can think of a number where we simply sat uh, at one time when you're spending at least a million dollars a year on something and you have to put up with budget uh, 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 meetings and that sort of thing, uh, there is always an executive that will sit there and say, now wait a second, couldn't we avoid that this year? Uh, or they will sit there and say, well look, it's fine, why don't we just preserve these pictures but let's not preserve those? And I went through a lot of those meetings and fortunately uh, I and others were able to convince people that you cannot operate that way. If you do so, you may be dead wrong, because uh, what do you know about what somebody's going to want to see 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, and you are certainly wrong on what's going to be a classic. And uh, so that uh, things come back, things become popular again, things uh, achieve a status that you did not understand at the time. And I think it, uh, this type of new technology. HDTV is a whole other thing. Why preserve? Well, with high definition television coming in, the people that have film, and that's something you have heard the, uh, about videotape preservation this morning. You have heard of what they're doing on videotape. Well, we own a library. And the videotape preservation, that's terrific. And that, but what that motivates us to do is preserve the film. And we are delighted that we have, and we will continue to, you will note that there are many more companies now making a decision to shoot on film rather than videotape, even though it's more expensive. Why? Because they see that film is over 2,000 lines and videotape is not. And when high definition television comes in, you will be able to reproduce everything for high definition television if you're on film, but you will not in the current videotape systems. So. Uh, just to quickly talk, why, how do we select films for colorization? Uh, well, with uh, a lot of, with some subjective uh, input and some objective in, input, and not always very well. But uh, it, it is a matter of sitting down, taking a look at the pictures in your library that are in black and white, seeing whether they, in your opinion, are currently entertaining, currently would be something that people would want to see. And the answer to that is, how do you know? And the answer is, you don't. Any more than someone making a new motion picture who sits down and reads the scripts is right every time as to what picture is going to be uh, a success with the public. However, uh, we ha one would tend to want to choose pictures that each of us will have a different list of classics but that would include those classics. Because why do you think they're classics? You think they're good and you think uh, uh, people will enjoy them, and I do too, and that's why you choose them. So uh, they, uh, w the way we do it, just to give you a little bit of input, just a matter of interest, is that uh, uh, Turner asks a group of executives to get together with the people that they feel know the films and, and come up with a list 
of pictures that are recommended for colorization. And we take a look at three or four or five different lists, see to what extent uh, things are repeated from list to list. And then people sit down and run those pictures in black and white and see, uh, well, look, it still holds up, still a good picture. Uh, and if so, then it's chosen for colorization. And uh, is that an economic decision? Certainly it is. Uh, but no more an economic decision and no less a creative decision than the decision made to make a motion picture in the first place. Because we are spending $250,000, $300,000 to do this. We have marketing costs and we obviously want to do it in a way that has economic consequences. Uh, in regard to the restoration involved in the colorization process, I think I'd be repeating my, uh, what you've heard uh, uh, to some extent. Just, I would like to address something that was asked, however, about how it affects film. In our case, it does affect film, because uh, although what we are working with in order to create a colorized movie is a black and white videotape, a black and white master, made from black and white elements, and then we end up with a colorized color master from which dupes are made for broadcast. In order to get there, in our case, we get there from film, so that we will have the film in black and white in its restored version, and we do. So it does have a positive effect. The positive effect is because of the restoration involvement in the coloring process, but to my way of thinking, the more positive effect is that to the extent new technologies remain free and, rem and everybody that invests in a picture or invests in a library feels that if anything new comes along, they will be able to do it. It in really encourages uh, the uh, investment in motion pictures. When you're investing 10, 12, 15, 20 million dollars in a motion picture, uh, and I would like to, I hope you'll ask me some things about this, I'd like to address myself to this, uh, you would have a chilling effect on that, on the desire to make that kind of investment if it was felt that the director, the writer, or any other creative element of that picture could control and prevent you from distributing as you feel is economically sound. And I know of no particular proof over the years that that has in any way destroyed the creative efforts of these people. Sure, are there things that I have seen that I would not have done? Absolutely. Uh, are there things uh, that have ruined the reputation of the director due to the fact that they were done in a manner that really wasn't very good? I don't really think so, because I don't think that the public that sees this picture ha lets that reflect on the director. But the key element here is that you're not talking about a painting in which the cost is the cost of the canvas and paints and the time of the painter. And you're not talking about a book which may be a, a year or more in the life of an author, but beyond that is not the kind of collaborative effort does not involve that kind of investment. So I do think there is a difference. In regard to the uh, European sales and the foreign market and so forth, I can speak perhaps a, a bit more expertly on that. I did not bring figures with me, but we would be happy to supply them. Uh, there are foreign sales occurring. Uh, most notably for us in South America, Italy, and the Far East, we did. We have made a sale to Canal Plus in France, and that is the issue the, in that litigation. And we have made a sale to the BBC, where it has not yet been played. It is my understanding it will be. I cannot guarantee that, of course. Uh, we uh, look at it from a strictly commercial point of view, and to uh, respond to the matter of whether or not it, uh, this could be something that is good for earning money for the United States product outside the United States. I am certain that it is. And uh, I guess the best example would be that, that we at Turner have just changed our estimates of foreign income on each of these pictures and uh, 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 changed them in an upward manner substantially based upon our experience in the last 60 to 90 days. So uh, we think there is something to be said for that, and it is important. In regard to the marketing, 
of colorized and black and white versions, I would like to reassure you that not only is black and white available in all ways, it's available in 35 and 16 and 8 millimeter film, as well as in videotape, but we in fact uh, make it available. There is no one that can show that we have, they, they have ever asked for a black and white that we have not supplied, and we are now uh, attempting not just to answer the charges against us, most of which we don't think are valid, but we thought that it would be an interesting marketing uh, idea. We are now marketing the black and white and colorized video cassettes together with one ad side by side in video cassette stores this summer on two of our pictures. And I, as a matter of fact, I brought along the advertisement if you'd like to have that. Uh, and you might be interested, again, the charges that are made uh, without the facts. Uh, what this says is the picture. It's Adam's rib in this case. It's an advertisement of the video cassette, and then in small type underneath, also available in a colorized version and in stereo. And they are uh, being marketed side by side. You also might be interested, and all film buffs might be interested in the fact that I did look, uh, find out the sales. They've only been out there. Uh, three or four weeks, so I really can't give you anything definitive. But so far, the sales in black and white exceeds those in the colorized version. And uh, a lot of people <laughs> would look at us and say, gee, doesn't that disturb you? Absolutely not. Uh, we're delighted. Uh, we're only looking to distribute these pictures, market these pictures. And uh, if there are more people that would like to buy a video cassette in black and white than in color, uh, obviously we have no objection to that, and we welcome uh, making it available. And I think that one of the things that I am noticing, and uh, I'm not sure that this is anything one can prove, I think that what has happened here with this controversy partly, and partly because of the fact that through colorization we are definitely getting distribution we did not get. Uh, these pictures are showing in prime time on national television at least twice so far. They are being marketed by prime time, we're talking about 8 o'clock at night. Uh, we're talking about pictures that uh, had revenues of maybe $200,000 each over 10 years that have now had revenues of $800,000 each in one year. Uh, uh, this is not just an indication that uh, we are making some money, and that is not the issue here, but it also is an indication that uh, it is not a phony statement on our part to, to say that we are recreating interest in these pictures. And uh, we think they're marvelous movies. Obviously, Turner paid a lot of money for them, and we would like to have them seen, and this is one of the ways to get them seen, and if they're seen in black and white and in color, or only in black and white, or only in color, uh, we, we see nothing destroyed. I will not again repeat to you the fact that nothing in fact is destroyed. You've heard this, and I think you've got testimony to that effect. So uh, we will make them available. The pricing is the same. We are currently labeling them. Our videotape versions on the air contain uh, credits that say these are colorized versions by. As soon as this legislation passes, we are prepared to change that. Uh, if it does pass the Film Preservation Act, right, we are prepared to change the labeling to that. And the same thing is being done on video cassettes, and uh, we will be in conformance with that act as soon as it passes. Uh, we have very, very strong um, feelings, uh, somewhat along the lines that have been expressed to you before and may be expressed to you later, so I may leave that to other people that uh, this particular act has serious uh, problems for us uh, because of the kind of national censorship concept, to say nothing of the fact that I think a group of people sitting around trying to decide what's a classic uh, is almost a ludicrous concept. But anyway, that's a personal opinion. Some of the areas, and uh, I am prepared, I, I, I urge you to uh, throw them at me as you, as you can, because as a owner of this amount of film, and as a copyright proprietor of this amount of film, we are vastly interested in having the right to continue to market it all over the world, 
as best we can, because that's, we think that's the best thing for the films, and that anything that prevents that is neither in the public interest nor in the private interest. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I appreciate the eloquence of your statement and the quality of your written submission, which uh, I compliment you on. You mentioned the, uh, the unwillingness of uh, people in this country to uh, spend the 10 or $12 million uh, that's required to produce a, a motion picture uh, if they're not able to exploit the market to its fullest, if the creative contributors are able to uh, put the thumbs down on any proposed plan to exploit the aftermarket. Uh, the United States film industry is the most <coughs> robust in the world. Do you think the European film industries would be more robust if <coughs> there were no limits on the uh, aftermarket exploitation? I do, Mr. Allman, but I can't prove it. Uh, I really do. Uh, because I have experienced, obviously I've had uh, uh, a business relationship with creators throughout my life. And uh, all members of the Creative Rights Committee of the Directors Guild are personal friends of mine. Uh, and we have agreed to disagree. Uh, but in the main, I can state, you know, quite categorically that uh, there, most creators would like to retain control. They do not believe that their pictures are properly shown in many theaters, and in some cases they're right. Then they would like to uh, be able to check every sound system. They would be like, like to be able to control every projection system. And if I were director, I would like to as well. They do not want their film shown on airlines because that's not a very good way to see a film. They're right. It isn't. But it is part of the economic consequence of making one. And, uh, and I can go on and on. And the television exhibition and, uh, and 16 millimeter sound, which is not very good, and, and, uh, or at least not as good. And I think, though, that their claim that they don't go in here with open eyes they know that this is true. It is part of the employment relationship. It has been part of the individual bargaining and collective bargaining over the years. And uh, they recognize the fact that there does come a point that they will not be as successful and we will not be as successful if the control is not left to us and the people who put up the money. And I do not feel that anybody can point to uh, any uh, creative destruction for that. Uh, the strength of the American motion picture industry throughout the world, which is increasing, I'm glad to say, uh, is partly due to this, I feel, because as an example, uh, and I've gone through this many times, uh, directors would like to control which actor dubs the voice. They would like to control the translation that goes into superimposed titles. And again, these are creative things, and there are creative decisions to be made. And in many cases, they're right that it's not done as well as it should be. But if every time you wanted to dub a picture into French, you had to find the director or his estate to get them to approve the actors and the nuances and so forth, you would, again, chill the ability to go forward with this kind of thing. Uh, whereas uh, the uh, French moral rights doctrine, I think, does allow the director to control things like that. I think it's a real difference, and I think it's, it is at least a part of the economic health of the industry in this country. Thank you very much. I, I have other questions, but I think I will submit them for the record uh, in the interest of saving time and move on to uh, Mr. Patrick. Would you agree that the most that the directors are going to get from collective bargaining is the right of consultation and not the right of final say over colorization and editing? Not necessarily. Uh, although I would hope that that's the result. <laughs> I do not think it's an idle possibility that they could get these rights. Because uh, I would say to you that many of the creative rights that they have obtained uh, in the past uh, such as the right to uh, a first cut, the right to preview 
the right to uh, to edit for television, I sat around many, many meetings where the producers said, no way we would, would we ever give anything like that. It'll ruin the business, no way. Uh, and in some way, they figured out a way. Uh, is there a way for the directors to be involved in this process in order to have a degree of creative input? I think there is, and I think it, it does relate uh, when, when somebody says you can consult, that is not an idle thing. That involves time, it involves money, uh, and, uh, and I think it is a concession, and I think it is something they've earned. Would, is it possible in, a, in collective bargaining that they, they could obtain the right to veto this? Yes, it is possible. Is it likely? Probably not. Mr. Baumgarten gave uh, the sort of classic chicken little, the sky is falling, uh, argument for why this shouldn't happen. And in fact, as, as you said, the directors have uh, obtained things in the past that the producers fought and said, uh, oh no, you can't get this, you know, the, the industry will fall apart. Uh, the Writers Guild, as I understand it, uh, fought for the right of uh, determining who gets the credit on the screen. Uh, That's right. As I understand, the industry is probably rather relieved now that they do have that obligation uh, rather than the producers. So uh, perhaps it's a right that's uh, being fought and you're hearing just once again the natural reluctance of people who have certain authority to not want not to give that up. And perhaps the industry would not fall apart uh, if they did obtain that right. Perhaps you are correct, and I think that should be left to the uh, uh -huh. uh, to this kind of uh, uh, collective bargaining and individual bargaining. After all, it is true that if some directors have been able to obtain certain rights in individual agreements uh, that they c that cannot be obtained in collective bargaining, it must mean that it's possible to give it to somebody. But I, uh, I think the process works, and I think it should be left that way. And in fact, there's some high degree of self-regulation, I would think, as well, that uh, if someone has a right, whether it's by collective bargaining or even by legislation, uh, that if they exercise it in a way that's disastrous for all involved, that uh, they'll have difficulty getting work the next time around. I would think that that is correct, and I also think that you can turn that around and uh, say that anyone that acts in a disastrously non-creative matter toward an asset that he owns, uh, who, who in fact destroys something in the sense that the directors are talking about, then they have destroyed themselves. And uh, there is no uh, motivation for that that I know of. Okay. Assuming that Congress were to interfere in the collective bargaining of uh, arena by granting rights. Uh, you noted in your statement that there might be difficulties. In fact, you said there's no principled way to determine which parties other than the copyright owner should have moral rights. And you give examples of cinematographers, uh, actors, screenplay authors, soundtrack composers, everyone else that's involved, and that it, it makes more sense to give to one person, which is the copyright owner who's involved in, in the entire thing. In uh, the Director's Guild basic agreement, there's a, a preamble which basically says that the director works directly with all of the elements which constitute the variegated texture of a unit of film entertainment and information. The director's function is to contribute to all of the creative elements of a film and to participate in molding and integrating them into one cohesive, dramatic, and aesthetic whole. That seems to cut against the idea that the director might not be an appropriate person, in fact, to, to hold those rights rather than others. Uh, I think that is, in general, an accurate statement. And I think it's a statement in principle and is not always a matter of fact. Uh, and if one had to choose anybody other than uh, the copyright proprietor, uh, and you were trying to come up with a list in, in the order of contribution, uh, I would not like to choose between the director and the writer. Uh, maybe I'm prejudiced, but I have yet to seen a, see a picture 
where the director made a picture when the script wasn't very good, nor did the director make a very good picture if the story wasn't very good. So uh, I would have difficulty choosing between them. I'm prejudiced. I think that uh, a well-wrought script uh, can be directed by many directors to come up with a very good picture. A bad script, no director can make into a good uh, picture. So, you know, you'd have to make your choice there. As far as uh, the cinematographer is concerned, <laughs> I would like you to ask them rather than me. I can tell you I've stood on sets as the cinematographer set up every angle, told the director how to do it, told him where to, where to place the uh, actors, and said, if this is the effect you want to get, this is the way to get it. And then I've read the critic in the New York Times telling what a great job the director did in that, when I know damn well, having sat there, that it was the cinematographer that did it. And that's the kind of thing that goes on all the time. So I don't think there's an, a, a, an, a statement that you can make other than he is extremely important, he or she is extremely important, and one of the major creators. One, one final question. Uh, you testified about making the black and white and color available. On page nine of your statement, you say that, I'll let you turn to it, uh, at the bottom of the last paragraph, Turner will make the black and white version of each color converted motion picture available for theatrical and television distribution and where commercially practicable will market video cassettes in black and white as well as color converted versions. I read that as having a distinction between always making theatrical and television versions of black and white available, but only making uh, video cassettes of black and white available when they're commercially practicable. My question is, what's the basis for the distinction and how do you define commercially practicable? Well, I think that uh, the, the basis for the distinction was, I think all that was meant here was that you can only make something available. You can't make somebody buy it. And so uh, what this is meant to say, although it might be somewhat misleading, is that the black and white versions will be available in both film and videotape, period, available. You cannot, I, I think a distinction that was made that in order to get a video cassette made and out in the marketplace, it's got to be marketable. Someone's got to want to buy it. There really was no distinction meant by the, in the statement. The, everything will be available in the sense of if someone wants to license it, buy it, or whatever we do, it will be available. It will not be lost. We will not allow it to deteriorate. Nothing has been, uh, is unavailable. We cannot force somebody to buy it, obviously, and we can't force a theater to run it. Uh, and I think that was the distinction that was, we were trying to make. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. Schwartz? Uh, well, just, just to follow up on, then, on that last point, then, basically the video stores would have, would have to want the black and white videotapes because you wouldn't aggressively market it to them. No, uh, no, we are aggressively marketing it, Mr. No, Schwartz. No, now, now yeah. you are. But uh, if, it doesn't quite work that way. As I, you better talk to the video cassette dealers because the way I understand it, we can say, okay, here's a picture, and it's available in black and white and in color, uh, and we will. Uh, if the video, I don't know whether it's a wholesaler or a jobber or the stores themselves say, don't want that black and white, but we we'll order a thousand color. Uh, that's as far as we can go, and. Uh, uh, but uh, there is little or no problem in making black and white available under all circumstances, and that w that's what we intend to do. Who makes available the advertising for those videotapes? Do you, or, does it, or is it done at the video level? Uh, we, or our distributor in this case, uh, uh, comes up with the uh, advertising materials and the exploitation materials and I think the costs thereof are, uh, are depends on the negotiation. Sometimes they're split with video outlets and others. We pay for them. But it would always be your decision on the ads whether yes, or not it would to be. include black and white in the ad or the size 
of, of the sales pitch for the black and white vis-a-vis -vis the It black. would be if we attempt to control that. Uh, I am not knowledgeable enough about uh, how that works to know whether we can control it under all circumstances. The ads that I have seen are ads that we have approved and have controlled. Uh, I'm not expert enough to know whether you can do that in all circumstances. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the labeling requirement, which I know was fought very vigorously in the recent Film Preservation uh, Act, which Congress has not yet passed. Um, you, Turner does have a policy that they label that a film has been colorized, but you fought very vigorously the, the notion that director or any other creative artist would have the right to disclaim um, their distaste for the final product. Um, I, I assume you, you believe that that should be left to collective bargaining as well? Well, uh, that would be fine, uh, but, uh, and I think it should be left to collective bargaining, but the reason that we fought it is that I consider it negative from the point of view of marketing the film to the public. In some way or other, uh, the public is going to look at this and say, there's something wrong with it. Uh, when in many cases, uh, it was because the director would not involve himself, or in most cases, that neither the director nor anyone uh, really closely associated with that director is available because unfortunately they're dead. So there's a, there's a negative feeling, I, I think I used the term Mark of Cain, uh, that, uh, that you get from that. We can live with it, as, as uh, was stated before, but I do feel that it is not just a matter of uh, labeling, it's not just a matter of preventing misrepresentation, because I didn't think there was any misrepresentation, and I think the label and its contents has somewhat of a negative uh, implication. Well, not necessarily as, as a deceptive practice, but don't you think that it at least implies that the director, in the video we saw, Frank Capra's Arsenic and Old Lace, the name of the director is listed as prominently as the title of the film. If he strongly objects to the colorized version, um, but yet his name is still listed as, as his, pro it's his product, and it's advertised that way, obviously. It said Frank Capra's Arsenic and Old Lace. Um, you don't believe that at least implies that he had a hand in, in the production of, of what it is the viewer is seeing, whether it's in black and white or color. The average viewer would, wouldn't know that what the director did in the colorized version uh, was the direction, however much uh, input he had, as, as, as you and Bill were talking about with the cinematographers, and the other creative people, it is at least advertised as his picture and his name uh, is on the line. That, and I think that's an accurate statement. It is advertised as his picture, and if nothing were said, uh, there would be an implication that he in some way had something to do with it. Uh, but I think we've negated that by saying it is a colorized version. I, you cannot uh, educate the public as to the... Uh, uh, the uh, whether or not someone was involved, uh, but in most cases, of course, the people are not even here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know to what extent that misleads anybody. I've never... Uh, uh, my, you know, my feeling about it is that despite the fact that Mr. Capra certainly, with great sincerity, uh, objects to this process, it, it nevertheless has made one of his most wonderful pictures a classic. And that's It's a Wonderful Life. And uh, he may not see the truth of that, but it is true. And it is now a standard on the network every year and is one of the most beloved pictures. And it was a flop in black and white. I don't know why exactly, but it was. Uh, and uh, I, it, I find it you know, difficult to understand why uh, uh, this is something that he finds objectionable, but I do agree with you that unless, uh, that to the extent there is uh, a statement that the director's name is on the picture, anything that's on that screen, somebody may think the director did. 
It's also true that it says Frank Capra's arsenic and all lace. There may be a televised version or an edited version or a foreign version or any other number of versions, which he did not do and did not approve and hates, maybe. Uh, and uh, I don't see whether he, he, whether he is injured or where it is a matter of uh, uh, have any effect on his career or his, uh, his standing in the community, but uh, I can't argue that there might be such an implication. To, to move to the issue of film preservation, to your credit, you've persevered for, for many years uh, in preserving the MGM library, and, and you explained why it was done that I think you understood the nature of preservation as you preserve all films, and, and, and you let the test of time decide, in your case, what is marketable. And um, the, the question I had was, was the library actually losing money for, for the years before, prior to video? Um, you said that you preserved all your films in expectation that someday there would be a future market for it, not knowing what it was. But in the, in the interim before video, if these black and white films were sort of untouchables, or at least the majority of the library is, and there's a hundred titles that are constantly um, seen, what, what was happening in the interim to that library as far as the economics? Well, the, uh, this particular library, which is the only one I can speak to, but I think it, it would be typical, uh, was always profitable in one way or another uh, on an overall basis. But you have to uh, look at, at various factors. Uh, the, the profitability would shrink as markets shrank. Uh, the older pictures got, the less they were shown. And uh, the advent of color television had a devastating effect on, effect on the ownership of black and white. Uh, and uh, those things did occur. Uh, that does not mean, however, that owning the library was a disaster and the best example of the fact that that was not true is the fact that Mr. Turner went out and paid $1.3 billion for a library, which is more than most people would pay for a bunch of new pictures. So it is a very, very valuable asset. But it is a depleting asset unless you have the opportunity to use it any way where people would like to see these pictures. Now, last very quick question. Do you, do you think that if they're no longer economically um, worthwhile, do you think that there's ever a role for the government in, in preserving the library and, and preserving films that otherwise wouldn't be seen, and not just preserving them, but in making them accessible to the public? Yes, I, I think that's something that needs a lot of discussion. I think there could be a role for the government. I'm not going to say what, how the government should spend its money. Uh, I have been fortunate to be part of a private enterprise that was willing to spend private money because it was worth doing. There are millions of feet of film uh, that are deteriorating, that do not have any economic viability, or at least you cannot find anybody that thinks so. And that is an area where the government might step in and look at things. But where commercial companies own this film and where they have, uh, uh, they have incentive to preserve and in fact are preserving, I think that would be a waste of the government's money. Uh, but is there a, do I think film should be preserved? Do I think videotape should be preserved? I certainly do, but I do think that the private sector in most cases has the motivation to do so. And I think what the government should look for is the areas where there is no motivation. If I may follow up just uh, just very briefly, in your statement uh, on page two, you you, you mentioned the uh, the practices that Turner uh, uses in in regard to colorized uh, motion pictures. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, you market both black and whites uh, and and the colors, uh, several other factors. Uh, uh, the last one being that a black and white copy will be deposited with the Library of Congress. You used copy rather than black and white original version, uh, I assume that was not done for any ulterior purpose, but you will in fact that, What that meant was a print. <laughs> a print. <laughs> of any of whatever ver version we have that the library would want, but it would probably be the original version, yes. Right. I, I, I'm glad I clarified that point. Oh, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Schrader. Uh, Mr. Meyer, you said that uh, polarized film from your uh, owned by Turner has been licensed in several countries. Uh, South Africa, Italy, sorry. South America. South America, sorry. Uh, have any transmissions, any broadcast actually taken place? Yes, I think they have, Ms. Schrader, but I would like to get you that information rather than uh, 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 let me supply that to you because I am not absolutely certain. My understanding is yes, but let me get you the information. Uh, I would appreciate it if you would yes, follow up. Yes, we will that. submit that information to, to you. That. Uh, do you know if any of the broadcasters are seeking the permission of the director of the particular film as a condition of the, the transmission? Not to my knowledge, but I don't know. Uh, some opponents of colorizing say that colorizing will have an important impact on future production of motion pictures, that the only way that directors who oppose colorizing can protect themselves in the future is by making the motion picture in color in the first place. Uh, do you think that's likely to happen, that we'll have virtually 100% uh, uh, color production? If it does happen, is that a bad cultural development? Uh, it has happened. 99-point-some uh, percent of all pictures are made in color. And as far as I know, 100% of all television production is made in color. Uh, the only uh, theatrical motion pictures made in black and white are one from time to time made by a director that I think Marty Scorsese is making one now, and certainly Woody Allen has, although not in recent years. Uh, do I think that that, so in fact it's happened and it has nothing to do with colorization. Uh, uh, colorization really is an answer to the fact that the world wants color, people want to go to their theaters to see color and watch their television sets in color and so forth. What has happened is that, and I've watched this over the years, at first when color came in, cinematographers and directors had certain creative feelings toward it which made them feel that this particular subject matter was not appropriate for color. This was a gritty picture. This was one about boxing. This was one about the Second World War, whatever. And really, black and white was appropriate, not color. As they, over the years, worked with color, and I'm putting words in their mouths, but this is certainly my observation, and they found that color could be desaturated, that color could be worked with from a creative point of view, that color had perhaps much more creative viability than black and white did, and then finally that color was in demand, they finally changed their thinking, and it is not even a matter of discussion anymore as to whether a picture should be in black and white or color. So uh, I, is it a loss? that there are pictures, not pictures being made in black and white. I think creatively it is a loss, yes, because black and white photography is marvelous and, and people uh, certainly still take some pictures in black and white, although nobody takes their home movies in black and white anymore. Uh, but uh, I think this is a matter, again, that uh, both the creative community and the artistic community and, uh, and uh, economic reality will handle. And uh, I don't think this particular controversy will have any uh, effect on it. Mr. Black. Thank you. I'd just like to follow up first on a couple of questions that Eric asked. Uh, first on the question of labeling, do you, do you think it's possible for the parties at affected to get together and agree on labeling standards which go farther than the National uh, Film Preservation Board legislation if, if it becomes law, and could refer to things including the non-participation of certain creative personnel. Or do you think that uh, the legislation, if it becomes law, pretty much closes the door on uh, further voluntary arrangements on labeling? Uh, I don't think it does close the door, no. And is it possible that uh, an agreement could be reached that would be more 
uh, acceptable to both sides? Yes, I think the answer is yes. I know the focus of your testimony is on colorization, um, but um, since the Turner Organization is a, a renaissance organization, uh, I have a couple of questions that relate really more to the broadcasting area. Um, do you think it's possible for voluntary arrangements to deal with some of the conflicts which have arisen about alterations other than colorization? particularly things like uh, time compression and panning and scanning. I, uh, I would rather let someone that is expert in the broadcast field discuss that. That really isn't my bag. My comment would be, from the point of view of the motion picture industry and production where I've been, that it is not likely because there are so many indiv individual television stations and so many sys cable systems and so many uh, different competing interests throughout the world that I'm not sure you could control it even if you wanted to. So I think that I think it presents a very very practical problem, and that you might have agreement between parties that could not really control what went on. Yeah, I'm curious as well though. Uh, just as a general practice, I've noticed on some some films shown on television that there will be an announcement or. A a card that appears that says it's been edited for television, uh, but it's not a uniform practice. Uh, do you think that those sorts of uh, uh, notifications might be possible on a, a more systematic fashion, and also dealing with other sorts of editing problems? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, uh, if I were in on those discussions and was a little bit more expert, Mr. Flax, I could answer that. Uh, I would. Uh, think that the possibility should be investigated because I think it's the type of thing that responsible people should do. Uh, but whether it could be done on an overall uh, uh, agreement basis and be effective, I really can't say. Oh, I, I'd also like to thank you very much for your statement, which was very useful and, and, and lucid. I don't mean this to be critical of, of your, your testimony or of Turner, who's been quite cooperative in preservation matters. But in um, your discussions with Eric about the importance of preservation, you really suggested a dividing line of public and private responsibilities which left to the public sector the area where the private sector was not preserving films. On page 13 of your statement, you do refer to film archivists who estimate that 80% of all American films made before 1930 no longer exist. Uh, that's sort of a major and well-known cultural disaster that is the product of the decisions or the failure to decide a very hard-headed businessmen and women who, who didn't even sell their birthright, they just let it rot. So I'm not sure that the dividing line between public and private responsibilities and preservation which you suggest is a one that can assure as much as anything can be assured that the disaster of the older films preservation won't happen to us in the future. But I do appreciate it, mm -hmm. in fact, the willingness of Turner, and I hope others emulate it, to cooperate with institutions like the library, which have national responsibilities in the area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, appreciate uh, your testimony, and uh, uh, we will be following up with uh, written questions in the near future. Fine. Thank you, Mr. Obi. At this point, I propose that we take a five-minute break uh, to uh, give a, uh, a moment of relief uh, to uh, the audience and people who are working up here, and allow the, uh, the uh, Directors Guild of America to get set up for their presentation. If we can uh, begin again. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Arnold Lusker, the counsel to the Directors Guild of America. Thank you, Mr. Oman. My name is Arnold Lusker, and I am a partner in the law firm of Dow, Lonis, and Albertson. I am pleased to appear before your panel today, particularly because your concerns touch upon some of the most sensitive 
and important matters of artistic and creative expression for America's film directors. For the past one and a half years, I have served as special counsel to the Directors Guild of America in that organization's challenge to the technological assaults on our film heritage. In a highly public campaign, prominent directors, screenwriters, and actors have come to Washington to voice their outrage and their disappointment. Outrage at the drastic changes made to their films or films of their colleagues in the name of progress. Disappointment at the absence of any protection in American law to prevent what they view as mutilation of works of art. Perhaps the most eloquent and moving plea was made by John Houston, who spoke shortly before his death to the Congress after viewing the colorized version of the Maltese Falcon. We have a videotape, which is a living testament to Mr. Houston's anger, even after his death. And I would like to have that presented now. Ladies and gentlemen of the Congress, I come before you on behalf of many others to make a simple appeal. Save our work. We are, all of us, the custodians of our culture. Our culture defines not just who we are, but who and what we were. Those of us who have labored a lifetime to create a body of work look to you for the preservation of that work in the form we chose to make it. I believe we have that moral right, even in the face of what sometimes appears to be a conspiracy to degrade the national character, to bring it down to the lowest common denominator, to condition it to accept falsehood at face value. In 1941, I directed a film entitled The Maltese Falcon. It was made in black and white just like sculptors choose to make something in clay or cast it in bronze or carved in marble. It is not to be conceived in any other way than in black and white. On the night that I looked at it, or tried to look at, a computer-colored version of the Maltese Falcon, I asked myself if such an example of mindless insipidity could be worth anyone's attention in this threatened world, a world beset by terrorists. The answer, of course, is most certainly. For it's very mindlessness, in the first place, allows for assaults of the crazed zealots. The Maltese Falcon has been colored by Ted Turner, who announced somewhat smugly when he heard the thunderclap of protest to the computer coloring of my film. But the last time he looked, he owned it. Having said that, he probably slept well that night. After he obliterated the work of some of the artists and embarrassed others who were living, including me, a director is a guide to the other film artists involved in the making of a movie. His presence offers a protection for them. He tries not to ask of them anything that will make them appear as less than their best. In fact, they know that one of his tasks and his skill is to get every one of them to do more and better than they thought they could. They're a kind of family, and the director is a kind of father or mother, as the case may be. And when he or she does his or her job, they trust the director. In the case of the Maltese Falcon, that trust along with our work itself has been obliterated. The work of Arthur Edison, the director of photography, was obliterated by some engineer's idea of what was good color. Painting by the computer numbers on the back of Edison's light and shadow. Robert Haas, art director, has obliterated his sets designs for black and white, splashed over with pale and faded colors. Humphrey Bogart and Mary Astor 
so careful of their images, bushwhacked by the Coloroids when they were unable to defend themselves. All of these who had trust in me, and I who had trust in them, and in the film and its future, bushwhacked. And there's only one film, and I'm only one director. And these are only a few of the artists who will be subjected to an eternal, unjustified public humiliation, joyfully presented as entertainment, but the vandals whom we of the Directors Guild oppose today. Save the past for the future. Every future needs a past upon which to build itself and to define itself. Provide some protection for the film artists of the United States and for the work they have produced, which has become such a popular art for the nation. Preserve the way we saw ourselves. Preserve the memory of both the limitation of available techniques and the way we worked within them. The truth is what is an issue here, <coughs> historical truth. That truth is being cynically distorted for future <coughs> generations by those to whom truth means nothing. Thank you. With John Huston's inspiration, the director's complaint was presented by some of America's greatest contemporary directors like Woody Allen, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and Sidney Pollack. Their case came at a fortuitous time because just as colorization hit the front pages, Congress debated the United States' as joining the Berne Convention. To the directors, the Berne Treaty, with its firm expression of moral rights, was and is the logical predicate for their relief. As the directors repeatedly explained, if the United States joins the convention, then it must assure its citizens a full measure of protection for moral rights in its law. In the simple statement of Article 6 bis lies the potential for protection of their works. The Byrne debate has ended with the House adopting and the Senate leaning to a minimalist approach which suggests that there already exists significant moral rights protection in U.S. laws. However, no one could adequately answer the director who asked, where can I turn in U.S. law to stop colorization? Perhaps in some measure, this hearing may provide a further record on the matter. In your inquiry, you asked whether employing these new technologies affects the integrity of the films. I have another videotape which is instructive. This tape includes a CBS evening news story on time compression and a Siskel and Ebert discussion of panning and scanning. There are days in these fast-forward times when it really seems that life is speeding up. Miami lawyer Donald Pevsner got that feeling one night, taping a TV showing of his favorite movie, Casablanca. I thought I would never see you again. Timing the tape later, he wondered why the uncut version he'd recorded was shorter than an edited version he'd had before, and discovered the movie had been speeded up. The more they move, the more it's noticeable. And see how fast Humphrey Bogart raises the cigarette to his lips. Sidney Greenstreet just got up as though we were being launched from a pad at Cape Canaveral. Pevsner had stumbled on a common practice in broadcasting, speeding up programs, mainly movies, to fit a certain time slot or to get more commercials in. 
It's called time compression. It bugs me because, number one, philosophically, I don't think they should tamper with classic movies. To show you how all this works, we've put together this demonstration. First, technicians take the film or tape they want to speed up and put it through a special playback machine. That's an easy enough matter, simply speeding up the film or tape. But as anyone with a home tape recorder knows, when you do that, people start sounding like chipmunks, which is where a device called a lexicon comes in. It electronically lowers the pitch back down where it belongs. And presto, the pictures are running faster, the sound stays the same. We look at time compression as being a very valuable um, uh, advantage to the viewer when it's properly used. But what's proper? Hollywood directors contend that running films even slightly faster destroys the pacing, the timing. So you can play games with other people's work. And where does it stop, you know? Don't we have any respect for what we create? To show you how fast the seconds can add up, here's a scene from Casablanca. Regular speed on the top, speed it up on the bottom. Dude, I'm not good at being noble. I don't think my seat at the top around the three little people down on the top of Philip Lee and the crazy world. Someday you'll understand that. You'll understand that. He's looking at you, kid. He's looking at you, kid. Broadcasters argue lexicon compression is the best way to fit movies into a given time slot. We have to accomplish that task by physically removing pieces of the movie, editing them out. And we prefer to run a movie uncut if we can, and the lexicon allows us to do that. So far, the Federal Communications Commission has refused to get involved in the time Nothing compression knows. issue, saying it violates no rules. But critics insist there should at least be a broadcast warning that the program's been compressed. At the very, very least, uh, this film has been speeded up by uh, so that uh, that individual can help take the discredit. In a way, it's a very old issue. One reason they used to run silent films so fast was to squeeze in an extra screening a day. And time compression is the 80s version of that. So when you tune in and hear them saying, Play it. The question might be, how fast? <laughs> David Browning, CBS News, Hollywood. Here's another horrible example of how they destroy widescreen movies when they try to cram them into the video format. If they don't just chop down the middle, they use a process Gene mentioned called panning and scanning, where they pan back and forth across a widescreen picture in an attempt to always be showing the most interesting thing. And after a while, you do get seasick. You need a barf bag, and you miss the good stuff. This is a scene from a wonderful 1957 musical starring Fred Astaire and called Silk Stockings. Now, in widescreen, you could see a stare there on the right side of the screen, and also at the same time, everybody on the left, including Peter Laurie there. See him on the left? But now, of course, we don't see a stare. And now we don't see Laurie, but we do see a stare. And now we kind of see a stare's fork. <laughs> now we sort of see him again, but we don't see Peter Laurie or the girl in red there who's going to dance with him. Now we don't see a stare. When we cut back to him, we'll find that he got up on the table. Oh, that's terrific. Sarah was great at jumping up and down off of things. Now we see her, and he gets down off the table, but we miss it. And so there he is again, but we didn't get to see that. So we didn't get to see the moment where Sarah jumped off the table. Now that may not seem like such a big deal, but the whole dance was choreographed for the whole wide screen. And the fact that Sarah leaped down from the table in perfect timing to take that dancer into his arms would work a lot better if we could see him do it. And as far as I'm concerned, if I'm looking at a Fred Astaire musical you number, see Fred Astaire. I don't want to have any moments when I can't see what Fred Astaire was and doing. And of course, the whole legend of Fred Astaire is that he insisted on, early in his career, mm -hmm. showing the entire body. Mm -hmm. And some people now, uh, sitting in laboratories, are making a decision to cut him off at the knees or, to, or cut him or out. Cut him off the, altogether, the, because the fact that it was all done in one shot was right. important, too. It all took place in real time, but not this way. Not this way. Another problem with home video is subtitle films. Many people don't like to watch subtitle movies on a big theater screen that are often too hard to read, they say. Well, the problem is even worse, as you can imagine, on a small screen, as in this classic French murder mystery called Diabolique. Binoculars won't help. And the same is true for a superb French intellectual comedy by Eric Romer called Summer. Happy squinting, everyone. The problem isn't a laughing matter, because with bad subtitling, 
fewer video stores will stock foreign films. They'll say, look, you can't even see it on the small screen. You won't go in the movie theaters. Why would you rent it at all? And that means that some of our greatest films, subtitled foreign films, That's will right. not be stocked. The problem is, when a movie is on the size of an enormous uh, theater screen, right. subtitles this big can be read from 16 rows back. If you take the same movie and put it in video with the same subtitles, right. they're too small. If you sit Movies too close have got to, the to set. be re-subtitled at the very least right. for video. Yeah, and if you try and sit too close to the set, you can't get your eyes up to look at the top of the screen. When we come back, some good news. It is not necessary to pan and scan and slice and dice widescreen movies. Not if you're willing to keep an open mind about an approach called letterboxing. Continuing our special program about what's right and wrong with home video, in the first segment of the show, we played some horrible examples of widescreen movies that were butchered by being crammed into the TV screen format. Well, since most of the movies made in the last 33 years have been shot in widescreen, does that mean we are doomed forever to get only part of the picture? Well, not necessarily. And the answer is a matter of simple mathematics. This is how Steven Spielberg's 1985 movie, The Color Purple, would look if it were viewed in the TV size video format. But Spielberg, who has a lot of clout in Hollywood, didn't want his careful compositions to be chopped at the side, and so he insisted that the home video version of The Color Purple be released in the so-called letterbox format, where the original widescreen image is shown with a black band at the top and bottom. Woody Allen, another director with clout, used the same approach for the video version of his movie, Manhattan. We were downstairs at the Castelli Gallery, we saw the photography exhibition. Incredible, absolutely incredible. Really, you like that? The, the photographs downstairs yes, at the Castelli Gallery? Great, absolutely great. Did you? No, I, I really felt it was very derivative. To me, it looked like it was straight out of Diane Arbus, but it had none of the width. Really? Well, you know, we didn't like him as much as the, the plexiglass sculpture, that I will admit. I mean, really? You like the plexiglass, huh? You didn't like the plexiglass sculpture either? Oh, that's interesting. No, it, I don't know. Alan pioneered this approach. He was the first director to do it. Now, of course, there are a lot of people who say they don't like letterboxing because they want the whole screen of their TV filled. They don't want any empty spaces at the top or at the bottom. So. Video companies have been reluctant to put letterbox formats on the market. Recently, however, some really impressive letterbox movies have appeared on Laserdisc and tape from the Criterion Collection. And what we're going to do now is provide some dramatic examples of the difference between the two formulas. Researching this show, we uncovered a visual classic that can be found in letterbox format. It's a film that I didn't much care for as it first came out as a drama, but the production design of the movie Blade Runner by Lawrence G. Paul and the art direction by David Snyder are spectacular, and you can really see it in a letterbox format. To prove it, we're going to cut back and forth now between the full screen version of Blade Runner that you've been getting at your local video store for a couple of years now, and the newly released Laserdisc with letterboxing. This is the dramatic opening scene of the film set in Los Angeles in the year 2019. Comparing these two versions is like comparing a true aerial view with a postal card snapshot. There's no other way to express it. It's two entirely different movies. And I was skeptical when I went to see Blade Runner a second time because everyone had been raving about its visual beauty, but I could really appreciate it when I saw it compared with the video version that's normally in Frequently what happens in a movie like Braid Runner is they use emptiness, they use blackness and space to isolate the character. Well, of course, if you make it like this, you just see a close-up of the character, you don't get the emptiness over here, you get a totally different feeling. And the other thing that I noticed, which is, you know, the, the top, let's focus on the part that people are still going to resist long after the show is played, which is, I don't want to see that black at the top and black at the bottom. Well, if the image is mesmerizing, as it is in the case of Blade Runner, you're not looking at the black and bottom. That's right. You're looking right through the center of your screen. Now let's take another example of a movie that gains a lot more than it loses through the letterbox format. This one is called The Graduate. It's Mike Nichols' great 1967 comedy that made Dustin Hoffman into a star. And it has now been released in a letterbox format by Criterion. Here is one of the, well, probably the most famous scenes from the movie. 
seen here first, all the way through in the letterbox format. What are you doing? Well, it's pretty obvious you don't want me around anymore. Well, look, uh, I was kind of upset there. Uh, I'm sorry I said those things. It's all right. I think I can understand why I'm disgusting to you. Well, no. Look, I like you. I wouldn't keep coming here if I didn't like you. Now, that's a very dramatic composition. And remember, it was all in one shot. There were no cuts. Dustin Hoffman was in the right background and Bancroft in the left foreground. But look how much that shot loses when it's shown in the full video format. You can't even see what Mrs. Robinson is doing most of the time. You can't even see she's in the scene part of the time. And instead of one unbroken shot, look here where they cut to show her and then cut back to Benjamin again. The point is clear, the directors of widescreen movies compose their pictures for the whole screen, and if you see only part of the screen, you're not getting the right picture. Instead of characters on opposite sides of the screen, you get first one character and then the other one. Instead of three people sitting in a row, you get first these two and then these two, and the guy in the middle seems to bounce back and forth. It makes you dizzy. It makes you dizzy, it makes you unhappy at movies that are good. Coming up next, we'll show you a solution to subtitle films on home video, and you're going to see a difference that is quite amazing. Continuing our special show on how to improve movies on home video, another problem that everybody complains about is subtitles. All too often, the video version of a foreign language film is simply the theatrical version with the same subtitles, which on video are either too small or too faint to be read. That has led to a lot of consumer resistance to subtitled movies, and people are missing a lot of good foreign films that way. Here's a tragic example. It involves Akira Kurosawa's classic film, The Seven Samurai, which has been voted one of the ten greatest films of all time. But the subtitles are so bad here that you can hardly even see that they're even there. <laughs> And that's really a shame, because yeah. even if that is one of the greatest films of all time, you watch it for five minutes and you turn it off. No, no. Que surprise. Oui, que surprise. <laughs> tu connais Pauline, ma cousine? Non, vous ne vous connaissez pas, c'est la première fois qu'elle vient. Bonjour. If all foreign films were subtitled that clearly, I think they'd rent and sell a lot more of them. That's no question about that. It's a pleasure. Another great solution for subtitling movies shot in the widescreen format also involves the thing we were talking about just a segment ago called letterboxing, with black bands at the top and at the bottom, so you get the entire original image, plus the subtitles are printed clearly in white, typically, against the bottom black band. For example, let's look at another famous samurai epic directed by Akira Kurosawa, The Hidden Fortress. This is the movie that inspired in part the Star Wars trilogy, and these two funny arguing characters were the models for the robots R2-D2 and C-3PO. <laughs> that excellent subtitling is available both on the Criterion Collection's Laserdisc format as well as the Cinematheque Collection Home video cassette format, and this is the way it should be done. It really does make such a difference. It's like being able to speak the language. Yeah. You don't even have to sweat and struggle in order right. to see the subtitles. Another natural place where you want better subtitles is in opera films, and they're making a lot of progress in that area. Here's a properly subtitled video disc version of Placido Domingo and Renata Scotto in the Metropolitan Opera celebrated production of Francesca de Rimini. <laughs> That's a beautiful production with those great pre-Raphaelite sets. And of course, it helps so much when you can read the subtitles and you know what's going on. Exactly. Many opera companies beat home video to the punch in this method using super titles above the stage in live performances. I've enjoyed operas much more presented that way. It kind of helps to know what's going on, and that's the theme of all of our complaints 
in solutions on this show. We hate anything that hides the movie from us, whether they cut it off the top, bottom, or pan and scan. And we applaud any technological development that gives us a truer image of the filmmaker's work, be it visual or what is being spoken. The ultimate point, just endorsed by those tapes, is yes, technology can undermine the integrity of the original films in a material way, in a way not contemplated by the original director. <clears throat> this fact reflects upon the congressional testimony given by Woody Allen and Steven Spielberg in particular, when they each remark that only the film artists, the principal director and principal screenwriter, not the consumer, not the user, not even the owner of the economic interest in copyright should be entitled to change the finished film. Colorization, panning and scanning, time compression and the like, all processes which alter film, changing it materially and without the consent or even input of the creator, diminish the integrity of the film. One of the difficult points of this debate is that alterations are being made to older films, ones made 20, 30, and 40 years ago. Contracts which could offer some guidance as to legal entitlements are impossible to come by, and even if they were found, they would most certainly be silent on the significance of colorization or panning and scanning. After all, Ted Turner was barely a kid in those days. In the course of my work with the directors, I heard a story which I am not sure is apocryphal or true, but which raises an interesting question. The story is that Cary Grant's contracts provided that he did not have to appear on the set unless the lighting was just right, not too bright, not too soft. Legally, he could walk off until the setting for the film was perfect. It was up to his director to get it right. Whether his contract required it or not, the director did get the lighting just right. Now, how does colorization fit into that mix 40 years later? Black and white film lighting is an art form not duplicated by color computers, and colorization changes hues, shading, and makeup. Should Cary Grant or his director and their heirs have a claim for breach of contract if one of his movies is colorized? The directors would answer yes. A sign from the Copyright Office that such a claim has validity might send men's, many scurrying for old contracts before they try to colorize their films. We know today that in France, some protection under a moral rights principle may be available. As the material we have already submitted indicates, a French court, at the behest of the heirs of John Houston, has stayed temporarily the broadcast of a colorized version of the asphalt jungle pending a full hearing on the merits. That full hearing will be held later this month and could clarify Article 6 bis rights and set an international standard for other countries to model. Your inquiry also seeks to explore where the legislation is needed and if so, what form should it take. In the DGA's view, legislation is urgently necessary. The National Film Preservation Board, which Congress may finally enact within the next few days, is but a modest beginning. It is a proposal which acknowledges the value of film in American art and which makes a simple effort at truthful labeling of certain motion pictures which have been materially altered. But it in no way suffices the concern of the directors of films. Only the clearest statement that faithful adherence to the Byrne principles of moral rights and the entitlement of the principal director and principal screenwriter to prevent material alterations of film without their consent will sufficiently answer their plea. And that concludes my statement. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Lusker. You, you do <coughs> mention the, uh, the specific uh, requirements that Cary Grant imposed uh, for his uh, agreeing to participate, uh, but still you would limit the rights to the director and the uh, screenwriters and not to expand the, the concept of moral rights as some people understand them to other participants. Uh, 
uh, such as actors and actresses uh, in, the, in the motion picture. How, how can you justify this in, in terms of artistic contribution? Well, I say I think that in, in recognition of the fact that we have a, an artist uh, with us, uh, an actress mm -hmm. from Australia, uh, Mrs. Johnny Bridge, and it's a, it's a subject of great interest to her. Well, I, I think that th there are practicalities that the Directors Guild in, in basically evolving a, uh, uh, an answer and approach to the problems that they've, that they've outlined, uh, they, they recognize their practicalities. Motion pictures are a collaborative art. As has been explained, uh, dozens if not hundreds of people participate uh, in the process. And the director, however, and the screenwriter, as um, uh, Mr. Mayer has also indicated, are the people that throughout the entire film have principal responsibility. They are the ones, the director in, in particular, is the one that everyone entrusts to pull the whole project together. And if you could select one spokesman or two spokesmen in, in, in the sense of the, the screenwriter who is also um, the, one of the, the foundation, found, foundators of creating the concept for the film, if you, could, if you could select the spokespeople for that particular work, it would be the director and it would be the, the screenwriter. The screen actors have officially acknowledged this position. Uh, Ginger Rogers, when she testified uh, before uh, Senator Leahy, uh, acknowledged that uh, the actors, in, in, from her statement in representing the Screen Actors Guild, would place their uh, trust and faith in the director, who uh, they felt they trusted to, uh, to put them right on the screen to begin with. So there is, there's been a general sense uh, uh, within the film community that the director and the screenwriter are the right people to, to assert the moral rights. Thank you very much. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I will turn to Mr. Patrick. We had testimony from uh, Ted Turner that they paid $1.3 billion to acquire its library, including MGM's film. In their written statement, they say that from 1976 to 1986, MGM spent approximately $30 million on preservation. In the last two years, they said Turner has spent about $2,800,000 on preservation. My question is, what has the DGA done to preserve classic films? I am not personally familiar with all the activities of the DGA in this area, although the DG DGA in connection um, <clears throat> with their work in Hollywood has been very active um, in uh, in, in a variety of, of materials, and, I, and I'll be pleased to provide some additional material for the record with, with respect to that. We'll take a specific example, perhaps. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life, one of the first <coughs> films that was colorized and a film that caused a lot of uh, the initial adverse publicity. It was in the public domain because of a failure to renew. Um, anybody can go ahead and colorize it. Anybody can go ahead and market it in the black and white form. DGA members have been uh, vociferous uh, in their objections to it, uh, as has uh, Jimmy Stewart and others. But I haven't seen any indication that DGA members or anybody else has taken any steps to market it in the black and white form, whether it's 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter, seems to me that if the idea is to educate the public about the form that is you know, the purest, the best form for it, then why hasn't anybody who cares about it and who has gone to Congress and to the Copyright Office done anything, in fact, to get it out in that form? Um, I, I gather taking It's a Wonderful Life in particular, uh, It's a Wonderful Life was um, appreciated in the last uh, 10 to 15 years as a, as a classic American film, principally in its black and white form. I mean, it was not colorization which made It's a Wonderful Life a classic film. It was classic in its black and white form. As, as you know, the availability of, um, uh, of motion pictures for television and theatrical broadcast involves complex organizations involved in distribution, and those companies that are in the business of distributing motion pictures have gotten the film out. It, it, I recall uh, seeing the film uh, regularly on, on television in Washington during uh, Christmas seasons in the past uh, dozen years, even without the availability of the colorization. So the film is out there. 
I don't know whether, you know, in terms of uh, a particular director, I mean, the Directors Guild is a, uh, is, is a labor organization, and, uh, and uh, there are other people that, that independently market films. This is a fair statement, though, really, to say that the directors leave preservation and other aspects up to the producers and the distributors, and that they themselves really don't do anything in terms of getting out the films and the forms that they want. It's wonderful, like you said, you saw it on TV. Yeah, but was it panned and scanned? Was it you know, time compressed? Was it edited? I mean, I'm really not clear. If well, the directors I'm, I'm, are doing anything other than complaining about what other people are doing and not doing anything themselves. I'm, I'm confident, uh, although again, I, I've been involved with the Directors Guild focused on, on the Washington matters, but I'm confident uh, that uh, the Directors Guild, based in uh, uh, California, at least one wing is, uh, has worked with um, uh, film, film critics and film schools in, in preservation and individuals, I mean, you're, you're looking at an organization of 8,500 individuals, <clears throat> and many of them in their individual capacities, uh, whether the credit redounds to the, to the guild as such, or the individuals, have been involved in, uh, in concern for films. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, again, I would be pleased to uh, provide further information for the record in this regard. Yes, that would be quite helpful. Isn't it also true that, as uh, Turner's statement says, that they have spent uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars each year on projects involving preservation, and that the only way they can really do that economically is to exploit it in these other media, and that if you are successful in getting what you wanted, that in reality the result would be that there would be less preservation, that there would be less access to the works that everybody truly cares about. The, the motivations for preservation, I, I, I guess, can vary uh, depending upon uh, one's business goals and, and individual uh, feelings. I, I, clearly, the Turner Company sees an economic benefit in uh, working through films. I don't know what, they, what the Turner Company did in terms of film preservation before uh, it hit upon the colorization uh, opportunity, and clearly the um, some of the guidance from the copyright office that if you want to get a copyright in a colorized version, you've got to submit uh, quality uh, original black and whites may be a motivating factor in some of their activity. Uh, but there, there are obviously hundreds of people or thousands of people involved in the film industry, and many people on both sides of this issue are very uh, dedicated and concerned individuals about quality films. I don't know whether uh, completely attacking motivations uh, is, is the point, but film preservation is an important cultural and historical concern. The, uh, the, the point that Sidney Pollack made, for example, in connection with his congressional testimony was that the, the black and white films that were, that were made in the 30s and 40s evoked an historical context, created a, a cultural uh, milieu and image which uh, is is distorted when they are colorized, and um, preservation is is in ex in, has become somewhat involved, but I think to a large extent it's a somewhat separate issue um, compared with color the colorization question. The question wasn't about motives, and I think we can all assume that everyone's motives are excellent. That everyone truly cares about the issues that we're talking about. The question, put more bluntly or crudely is that it's a capitalist society and that you're not going to get somebody like Ted Turner or anyone else to invest $1.3 billion if they can't make a buck off of it. And they can't make a buck off of it, arguably, if they can't market it in the very forms about which the Directors Guild are complaining. Well, Turner's motivations in investing the money, I think, were, were, were quite uh, multiple. Uh, the, uh, the actual acquisition cost probably amounted to substantially less than that. He spun off uh, uh, studio space and, and lots, and he used uh, his, his super station in Atlanta was absorbing a tremendous uh, annual cost in, uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, the need to feed uh, programming on that particular channel. 
the DGA wants us to have final say in alterations, material alterations, because its members believe that they're the best ones in the best position to protect the aesthetic value of the film. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But the DGA doesn't mind if individual directors permit their films to be materially altered. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Individual directors could permit their films to be cut up, colorized, mutilated, spindled, uh, whatever it is, as long as they say that's fine. Now, my question is this. Since that's true, the desire that we're really talking about, one, of preserving the original aesthetic value of the film is not for the public at all. If the public objects, let's say that an individual director uh, permitted his film, he or she, uh, to, permitted his or her film to be mutilated, the public objected and say, we wanted to see this film in its original form, then the GGA would basically say, tough luck. Um, the, the film directors have explained that in their view, film, besides being entertainment, is art. And to an extent, the uh, Film Preservation Act that uh, Congress is considering has some acknowledgement of that fact. And the bottom line answer is yes. If, if an artist, if a film director, uh, agrees uh, that this is the way the film should be, that is the way the film should be. It is, it is to an extent, um, a, uh, um, a dictatorship of the creator. The creator says, this is my work. Woody Allen recently uh, produced a film that got uh, very poor reviews. Uh, but that was his film, and that's the way he wanted to do it. You wanted to see that film? That's the way you got to see it. Maybe if it was in black and white and if you colored it, more people would like it. That's not what Woody Allen wanted. You wanted to see this film made by Woody Allen? That's what you do. If you don't like it, you say you don't like it. If you do like it, you have the opportunity. But it, it remains. Milos Forman had indicated, and in, in, I think uh, there was earlier reference to him, that uh, he did four films in black and white. Two of them he could see colorized. Two of them he would not. But he would want to participate in the process. And the bottom line point is that it is his reputation, as you were, one of the other remarks, Frank Capra's name is up there, as large as the title, because that's what they're selling. It is their reputation. They have a right to say, I want to change my reputation. I want it colored. Fine, you can do that. But it is their decision and not the decision of a third party. And not well, the decision of the consumer or viewer. What about the cinematographer? What about the actor? What about the set designer, the art director? If, <clears throat> uh, as in the case, of, as Ralph mentioned, of Breathless. I mean, is it really okay if Jean-Luc Godard wants to have his work colorized and the cinematographer says no? Well, we're, we are... I recognize we're not dealing in a perfect world. And if, if we got 150 or 200 people that work together on a film, you might have trouble uh, finishing a couple of sentences, much less reaching a decision about it. The director is recognized, as you read in, in, in the uh, collective bargaining agreements, and it's recognized by the individuals that work on the films. Now, there may be some uh, examples of disagreement, but the general thrust and statement of the major unions that have been involved and the major individuals that have, that have made their presentations is, yes, we will, the director has fathered the film from beginning to end, and we will put our trust and faith in the director to see to it that the film is preserved the way uh, the, he believes it should be. And if that trust is broken, then it's too bad. If the trust is broken, then I think people may reassess it at, at some future point, but at this, at this stage, we know that a director like John Houston is outraged at what is being done to the Maltese Falcon. I, uh, you might find someone who worked on the film who would say it's fine if it's colorized, but it is clear that he is outraged by that, and there is no trust that has yet at least been documented that I'm aware of that has been broken in this, in this area. But, uh, Except for Breathless. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the breathless situation. And, uh, um, I, Your I idea I'm about having the director be the principal one, can't you really turn that against you and use the argument that I believe uh, Turner made is that's the producer. I mean, if you're going to pick one person, then 
why isn't the copyright lawyer? Mr. Baumgarten, who, if not the greatest lawyer in the world, is certainly the greatest copyright lawyer in the world, uh, eloquently spoke about uh, the principle set out in the Copyright Act about giving it to the copyright owner. So if we're going to pick one person, I mean, why not stick to the principles that are enunciated in the Copyright Act? Well, with, with all due respect, if you start with Mr. Turner, Mr. Turner basically is involved in a corporation. A corporation is uh, essentially a group of individual shareholders who own stock and, and, and so, so forth. To say that they, that the stockholders, uh, through their appointed individuals, uh, can make the artistic judgments with respect to the film seems to be carrying it too far. The, the people involved in the making of the films have, with relatively single voice, said the directors should be the ones to, to make the, these decisions. Now, actually, don't you have that right presently? Couldn't a director <clears throat> say, hey, I'm going to finance this myself, or, God forbid, I'm going to take less money for this picture to have it made the way I want to. <clears throat> Isn't what you're really saying is you want your cake and eat it too. You want the high salaries that you get for it, but you also don't want to take the financial risk of having it edited afterwards. Um, I, I think you have to sort of keep an historical perspective on this today too. The films that are being colorized, if we're focusing just on colorization, were made 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, it, it may be a different sort of situation today where um, the directors, the writers, and everyone know colorization is out there, and this is one of the new technologies we have to deal with. We're looking retrospectively as well. These men are, 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 are may, have made their claim on behalf of colleagues whose films were made 40 years ago, and you, we're, we're trying to say, how should society deal with changes made where the, the expectations, the, the social contracts, the economic contracts that were made 40 years ago when John Houston made the Maltese Falcon, uh, colorization was not a factor. If you're saying today, shouldn't they have you know, more of a stake? And shouldn't they, you know, Woody Allen has a production company um, and can make his own movies. I mean, but again, those are, there are only a limited number of people that might be in that in that individual situation. The response, of course, that you would get from Turner and others is that your example of 30 years ago is actually a very good one, because at that time, in the heyday of the studios and whatever, that the director's uh, contribution was not as significant. But, you know, we've, there's a lot of testimony in that. One final question, because we're going over. In terms of the moral rights that, that you want, you make a distinction between production and post-production, as I understand it. <coughs> that you accept the idea that during the production of the motion picture, <coughs> however things shake out, they shake out. After it's uh, been completed, then you want the ability to stop material alterations to that film. Is that accurate? I, I would just clarify that the, the phrase post-production has meaning within the film industry, which is after the conclusion of filming, they, they then do the post-production work and put the fin finished product together. There, there is a point which the directors have defined as after previews and theatrical releases where, where you try it out, you come up with everybody's agreed, this is the film, this is what we're going to let out into the marketplace. That is the, the, the film that all parties involved have signed off on, and that is the one which thereafter material alterations uh, uh, would require okay. consent. My question is this. When you're in that production process, you are using pre-existing works typically. You are using the works of a novelist, for example. You're using works of performers or whatever. For those people, that is the post-production process for them. My understanding is, is that you would not be in favor of granting moral rights to a novelist whose work, in his or her opinion, has been mutilated. Is that well, correct? The, the, the issue of um, right, what films do to books has, has come up frequently, and um, the, the basic point is that if a novelist or an author contracts and has a one-on-one -on -one relationship with, a, with an entity to produce the film, they have that right, and they, they, they cede whatever rights or they retain whatever rights in that contractual relationship. And after that contract is executed, what is done with the film 
they have basically acknowledged. Their moral rights would, with respect to their work would relate to their literature uh, and not with respect to the film. That's right. And that same argument can be made for the director's canon, that they're one on one with the producers. And that's purely a contract matter. And if you're going to treat the novelist and everyone else as a contract matter, why shouldn't we treat the directors as a contract matter too? What's the difference? The, the primary difference is that we're dealing, in the case of colorization, with works that were made decades ago. And uh, the, the effort now is to take a work of Frank Capra's, for example, or uh, um, John Huston, and uh, to make drastic changes. I mean, uh, some people may, may view, and, and I might be among them, view a television screen of uh, a black and white film and you see the, the color version, and it doesn't look that bad. I mean, they're, they're, you know, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is to the people for whom the creative effort was a, uh, of their sweat and their toil, the sophistication that they put into it their image in, in not just um, 1988, but looking decades into the future and what people will think of their work. And that's what they're concerned about. It's, 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 it's more of an historical concern with their reputation. And they care about this. They care about it passionately. But don't you think that the writer whose work is in Bushard cares passionately and cares about his reputation or her reputation in the future too? Uh, there may be contractual basis that they can deal with that, but, they, but you can still go to the book. Their reputation is made <clears throat> in the book, and, and, and that's what they created. They were not a filmmaker, they were a writer. Thank you. Mr. Schwartz, um, I have questions about moral rights and, and the right prospectively and retroactively. If Congress, if the Senate were to change its mind before the passage of the Byrne legislation and reconstitute the original language in the Kastenmeyer bill, for instance, and a moral right was enacted today, how did the directors argue that they would get past the Fifth Amendment arguments made by Turner and others about the government taking away from the copyright owner the rights that they bought? Well, it, it, it becomes a question of what are the rights. I mean, the bundle of rights of, of, of copyright, um, I'll draw an analogy uh, <clears throat> to, um, uh, to cable television. When Congress passed the uh, 1976 Act, it made major changes with respect to um, the cable television industry, creating a compulsory license, uh, forcing, in effect, uh, certain access uh, in, in the context of uh, public availability uh, of, of programming. Supreme Court cases um, uh, before that uh, raised, uh, raised questions about rights of, of owners of programming <clears throat> with respect to cable television. Congress can, in the context of defining what are the copyright rights, mold and make changes in them during the course of, um, uh, uh, of, of legislating copyrights. And, and this is also, I mean, this is a constitutional And basis you believe they would have the right to stop the colorization of films that were made 30 years ago with the right, obviously? If the, 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 owner, the owner of a film has a right to do what he wants with that particular film, uh, subject to whatever limitations uh, Congress might impose on it. Well, how can you be sure for instance, in the case of panning and scanning, which has existed since 1961, I think, or 62, which the directors have basically held their nose and, and gone along with because, as many of them very honestly uh, agree, that there's a lot of economics in showing films on mm -hmm. TV. There's a lot of money to be made, and it's good for the film industry. How could you be sure that since these moral rights would be enforced by a court, that any court would rule that, a, that panning and scanning, which was already done, um, would be defined in, in any way as a mutilation or distortion of the work when you have 20 years of precedent of allowing this to have continued. Um, when maybe, maybe the directors haven't liked it, but, but it has been allowed to continue as a contractual right of the studios and producers. Well, if, if the case were brought, that would obviously be a fact that would have to be dealt with. I don't know uh, uh, 
how a court would handle it. Certainly, uh, industry practices can have bearing on a court decision in that regard. The, the directors have explained that colorization was the last straw. They, they had seen their films uh, exhibited in, in a fashion which distressed them for many years, uh, and they, they did live with it under the system, and it sort of reached the breaking point. And uh, um, how things would end up in a court context, uh, it might be difficult to predict. We are uh, running short. Let me explain briefly what we're going to do. We're going to try to break as quickly as possible, <coughs> asking all the questions we have to ask of Mr. Lusker. Uh, break till 2. Uh, then we'll come back with the video dealers uh, and uh, take the Motion Picture Association uh, thereafter to allow uh, certain prior commitments to be met. And uh, hope to have about 45 minutes for lunch, if that's OK with all of you in the audience. Having said that, let me turn to Ms. Schrader. Uh, Mr. Lutzker, uh, with respect to the moral rights that the directors seek, uh, are any time limits placed on those claims? Do you see any limit to them? Well, I know the directors um, would, would like an open-endedness to it. Um, I think that the uh, The notion of, of copyright obviously has limited durations. Um, yes, I was going to ask you if you think an unlimited right would be uh, within con Congress's I, I, authority. Um, I've, I've, thought, I've thought about the issue. I, don't, I can't say as I've resolved it. I think it is a, uh, it, it, it is a difficult question. And uh, clearly, they would like as long a period of time as would be legally appropriate. Uh, and. Uh, uh, to say forever less a day might satisfy them. There might be some that would want forever. Um, I, don't, I don't have an immediate answer to that because I, I think that is one, of, one legal question which uh, um, certainly uh, a, an extended period of time uh, would, I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at, a, um, at an art form which has basically arisen in the last 50 or 60 years. and. Uh, uh, I think they're looking certainly to, to some distance in the future, minimally the term of copyright, which is 75 years. Uh, regarding what would constitute a material alteration, I believe the phrase used in the uh, Film Preservation Act and certainly in the Film Integrity Act that have been proposed, uh, but not really further defined. Uh, what what uh, realistic limits would the directors place on the nature of the changes, that, that, so that there would be some changes that could be made that are not objectionable, and others that perhaps could be objected to. If you can't respond now in detail, uh, perhaps the directors would be thinking about that, that question and give us uh, a response later, because the, the idea that you have a system where apparently a, an objection can be made simply because an individual director uh, doesn't like what happened to the film, doesn't seem to be a system that can realistically be uh, administered by the courts. Well, uh, th there has been some effort uh, to, to define and explain the, uh, the nature of material alteration. Certainly, there's some things that, that are clear. Colorization constitutes a material alteration of a film work. Um, as the, the tapes have shown, panning and scanning uh, under current technologies uh, with the letterbox uh, uh, technique at least provides an alternative to panning and scanning, and, and the directors may feel that that also has some, some, some problems. Time compression, if you look at uh, the technology as it, uh, again, the example with the uh, closing scene from, from Casablanca, the, the, the changes that are made in, uh, in the pauses and the like constitute things that they feel are uh, materially, uh, potentially materially changing the, the integrity of the film. Well, just one follow-up question. Are you saying, then, that every colorized film is objectionable? That every act of panning and scanning is objectionable? You're, you're, not, you're not really no, saying no, it I, has to be material uh, the, ma Material is a word which um, the courts do grapple with in, in, in various degrees. Um, the incidental uh, use of a panning or scanning may not be material. 
Uh, colorization is, is something which is done to an entire work of art, and, and that's, I, I think, a somewhat different. Well, the material, you were using material in the sense of the quantity of the film that has been changed. Well, it, 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 I mean, there are examples, yes. It, it, um, Milos Forman, who um, uh, directed uh, Hair, uh, described uh, a version of that film which had been edited uh, in, and lost approximately a third of the time. Uh, editing of that sort is, uh, I mean, you, you, you can quantify materiality in, in some respects. There may, there may be other standards that, that, that need to be applied. A single pan or a scan would not necessarily be uh, material with respect to a particular film. Thank you. Uh, you uh, you've said that you think legislation is urgently necessary, but haven't specified the sort of legislation. Uh, specifically, uh, do you do you think that HR 2400 is uh, the essential framework in which this these questions ought to be dealt, or do you think that uh, some modified version of that or wholly new proposal should be considered in the next Congress? I think the HR 2400 uh, expresses, as far as the film community, the film directors concerned, the parameters of, of the type of legislation they'd like to see. There can be changes in that. Um, that would be the general framework. The, the, the notion um, in uh, Congressman Castamara's original version uh, of incorporation of the moral rights languages is, is another alternative. Thank you. Well, that uh, concludes the questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Lesker. Appreciate you being here. And uh, we'll uh, be submitting additional questions for the record. Sir. The uh, hearing uh, stands in recess until 2 o'clock sharp. Thank you very much. Come to order. The uh, next witness uh, will be taken out of out of order, uh, but uh, we uh, are trying to accommodate people's varying requirements. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, right now Mr. Joshua Sapin from the American Movies Classics Channel. Uh, if you could uh, give us something that would identify uh, the American movie. Movies Classics Channel, and uh, where you're from, we'd be grateful. Sure, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to participate, and thanks for the amendment to the schedule, the accommodation. Um, I'm the president of American Movie Classics Channel, which is a cable TV service that serves 13 million subscribers across the, the nation. It's carried on a variety of different services in different markets, from New York to California, Miami, et cetera. Headquartered uh, where? We are headquartered in uh, Long Island, Woodbury, Long Island. Uh, owned by two cable companies, one called Cablevision, the other called TCI. Been in business since 1984 uh, and were carried in a number of different configurations in different areas and different cable systems. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I wanted to um, address what we think is the issue, and that is really not to denounce the technology of colorization itself. Um, but really to determine whether or not the technology ultimately denies access to an important part of America's heritage. Um, and another question, I guess, that we think is worth addressing is if the process is allowed to proceed without restraint, what other technological alterations, some stated today and talked about and some unforeseen, are likely to follow? And for purposes, frankly, of, of drama, but I think it is relevant, we have constructed a brief 60-second tape that <clears throat> um, illustrates what could be uh, a foreseeable next step if the adulteration of films is allowed to occur. If we could play the tape.
<laughs> uh, truly beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have to like your own curves. <laughs> right. You know, it, excuse the theatrics. It's, it, there's a there's a point in it, and a, a rather serious point as we see it, and that is that that what we saw there, though entertaining, I think to some degree when one looks at it as popular, is not necessarily good. And I guess the question when we think about it is, uh, can it happen? I think the answer is absolutely. It may be the next logical step. Would it increase viewership and expand the market or the viewership of these films? I think conceivably it could, but ultimately the question is, should we be allowed, should the free market be allowed to adulterate the movie in that manner? And I guess we think the answer is not. Um, we're here to discuss what happens with colorized movies, and my real feeling is that if the decision moves along as it appears to be heading, we may regret what we've done as we look back in future generations and see that we were um, somewhat short-sighted. Um, the tape we just played is an extension, and it is indeed an extension from today's conversations of what could happen, but I think it is exemplary. Um, changing the sound track is very easy to do if one is so inclined, and I'm sure that research could be produced that would demonstrate its appeal to younger people, that they would prefer a Madonna soundtrack to one by Irving Berlin. But it's not okay for us to do this. It's not okay for us to do this and claim to preserve the original film because the nature of the way people experience most things is that they go to the most immediate popular material, whether it's good or bad, as long as it's fashionable. And the effort to colorize black and white films is a way, in that sense, to appeal to the most immediate and possibly the basis interest, I think in large part in the interest of economic gain. We have, in fact, as we were asked to do in, in, the, in the prepared papers, conducted some research on the appeal of colorized movies, and we've found in markets that are representative, I think, reasonably of the country, um, that our subscribers, who are viewers of American movie classics, are strongly opposed to colorization. I guess there's no shock there because there are people who watch the black and white movies that are, in fact, make up American movie classics. We don't show colorized movies or movies that are adulterated in any form. Um, but we don't dispute the research or the testimony of the people who've spoken previously that say that there is indeed very strong appeal, and in fact appeal that could, to some degree, expand the audience for the movies in this new form. Um, I think the key thing that, that we have to offer is that, is that appeal is not necessarily what determines access. And access, I guess, is the key word. In large part, what determines and creates access is what is most imme immediately marketable to the largest and, in some cases, the newest audiences. We've heard today from proponents of colorization who say that as long as the original version of the film still exists, the consumer can choose between the two. Um, as a movie exhibitor, my own feeling is that that is, to some degree, a fallacy. The issue is really not the existence of both versions of the films. It has nothing to do with allowing the black and white negative to be held in a vault somewhere or to exist somewhere. The real issue, and I guess it speaks to the manner in which the movie, <laughs> movies are consumed, if you will, in America, is about proximity and about accessibility. The mere existence of art doesn't guarantee the experience of it, and people will see the distorted version instead of the original. The real issues, I think, as we look at colorization, are accessibility, availability, and preservation, but accessibility number one. Um, research is not the primary reason to oppose the colorization of classic films. The primary reason, we feel, is broader and more important. It's the preservation of culture and, again, access to those cultural artifacts. Such preservation, we think, in the long run, also fosters, ultimately, the economic enterprise. And as a business exhibiting these films, we can help prevent the disintegration, if, if you excuse the drama, of that piece of our cultural heritage. I guess I think that, that we may be able to learn a little bit about this issue by looking at um, a couple of other arenas where this same um, substantive issue is taking place. Um, because it seems to me that the question is often grappled with by societies and government is how to balance consumer demand, current economic interests, and the need for the preservation of culture. Take, if we will, architecture for one example, and excuse me for the analogy, I'll try and bring it home rather quickly. Um, 
the question is, I think, if you look at architecture, should all big buildings be adapted or torn down if it suits the current economic climate? If land is exploitable by developers and usable by consumers, should we protect it or allow unrestricted tampering? What happens to a society that doesn't protect its cultural artifacts? What happens, I think, is that you get the distortion of cultural history. I think that's why so many Americans travel to Europe to see its cultural traditions. Europeans arguably have done a much better job in protecting their architecture and history um, with no thought of the future and no sense of the past we could destroy all the artifacts of our dynamic culture. If one looked exclusively at the consumer interest or demand in short-term economic, economics in the field of architecture, I think we would end up with no historic preservation and arguably very few buildings that were built before 1950 would remain standing. The reason is that in primary real estate areas, there's always the opportunity for additional development and exploitation of property. It's always there. There are always people willing to rent apartments or retail space. But our society, as it relates to architecture, has determined that it's to the benefit of all the people to protect certain buildings and to preserve certain neighborhoods. Um, architecture and historic preservation says that if there's a reason to preserve architecture, um, it is because of its part of America's past and history. In fact, preservation in certain areas has resulted in more vibrant economies in areas which have received landmark design designations, such as nearby Georgetown, Philadelphia Society Hill, and New York's Greenwich Village, tampering or development is either completely restricted or constrained by very specific guidelines. The effect, I think, in those areas has been to maintain um, what are now some of the most vibrant tourist areas. Nevertheless, there will always be those developers who would, if they were not legislated to do otherwise, um, there to develop and exploit the property and disregard history. Um, I think one more analogy, and I'll be finished with the analogies, has to do with literature, and it may be even more relevant to what we are dealing with today. We have wonderful novels that are taught in our schools, Moby Dick, For Whom the Bell Tolls, of Mice and Men, and we have condensed notes that are often marketed under the brand name Cliff Notes. I had them when I went to school, and they've been around, I guess, for quite some time. They're a brief sort of 20-page synopsis of each book. Given the option, I think that in almost every case, a child would not read the full book or the literature, um, but would read the cliff notes. And in fact, teachers have a tough time making sure that kids read the books and don't just buy the cliff notes and take the tests. I think there, it's, people realize that it's quite important to the children's education to read the literature. Um, to deny children access to the books, to lock the book away, and keep only the cliff notes accessible would amount to, I think, a cultural deprivation. At best, to put the, the book and the notes side by side in the bookstore, still, most would still choose to read only the cliff notes. But just as with film, to limit access to the original would be real deprivation. And this is the direction I think that we're headed. The mere existence of the original, I think cliff notes may bear out, is not enough. Because when the tampered version exists, access to the original by virtue of the forces of the market and the inclination of a consuming public may in fact ultimately limit access to the original. If you believe that American literature is important, it's not enough to have those books available in just three esoteric bookstores in America, because if only the cliff notes are readily available to the children of America, we've not made that preservation and availability of the original meaningful. We can just say it to ourselves, and it doesn't have meaning in terms of what their daily experience is like. And I think ultimately we'd sort of pay the price for it. So if we relegate something to, to the closet and don't put it on the shelf and get wide distribution and utilize the marketing mechanisms of the American system of business, we've essentially shut off access to consumers. So it is not, allow, it is not enough to allow something to exist. You have to support it within a system that in reality provides opportunity for exposure. It's a fallacy to say, as some have said, if it's there and it exists, it's there. The truth is, there doesn't end with existence. There ends with a real determination of access, availability, and distribution. The limited distribution of black and white films has not yet had an effect on our service, American Movie Classics. Our library consists of movies already licensed from many studios. The contractual agreements specify which films we can air, when we can air them, how we can promote them, and the quality standards that we require. 
Our current contracts have, in fact, not been affected, though we have been asked during negotiations if we will take colorized films, and we won't. But colorization is now clearly an issue for the studios that own, own the films. The process of colorization is expensive, and once a film is colorized, the company needs to recoup that expense. If we allow those forces to dictate, then the all-important access ultimately could be very seriously threatened. If we look at the precedent, um, we can see what will happen if we simply push the colorized version. It'll be harder and harder to get hold of a black and white version, and in fact, it really may ultimately fall out of readily accessible distribution. It may become something which is ultimately inaccessible. Um, <clears throat> the, I guess the other question is, come, coming back to the little bit of theatrics in the front, is what is next? If we adulterate the material to increase its popularity and take the creative decisions out of the hands of the original makers and put them in the hands of the business people, then exactly how far do businesses go and what are the implications? What, in fact, if we do change the soundtrack? It is arguable to say that we're creating the same mood as you saw in, in the piece of film that we showed a few moments ago, but contemporary music makes it, makes it more appealing. So if you use the argument in that sense for pro-colorization, that it will expand audience, then you would change the soundtrack and use contemporary music, and you've heard what it would sound like. It is the next logical step in the exploitation of material by people who are looking to, to increase the market, marketability of what I think is arguably art. But at the same time, it destroys the very essence of it. And it's not acceptable to say that the existence of it makes that activity acceptable. Our concern is really not for the immediate, from our own point of view, or for what the ramifications are for the people viewing films, it really is for five years from now. Um, with the colorization technology improved, when the color wash picture looks a little bit better, and when the colorizers can market better their new and improved version, the danger is that access to this cultural artifact, which I think does have some meaning and does have some real merit, visceral merit in terms of understanding what was made, what was intended, and what the experience was like, will disappear. People won't have the opportunity to see it. And if that time comes when only the colorized versions are available, um, and the memories of black and white films are only, in fact, memories, I think we may have done a disservice to future generations. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stephen. Could you uh, just state briefly again the, your proposal, what it is you propose that the government do to save the day? Um, I'm not certain that I have an entirely specific proposal as to how the government should act. Um, I do think that there needs to be, um, that the actions need to absolutely ensure the present access to the current viewing and consuming public and the future viewing and consuming public, and that, that the issue on which the activity should turn should have to do with not only preservation, but with access. And I, 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 in truth, I can't presume to exactly figure out how to do it, but I think that that is what is fundamental. You mean access in ways to, other than having a print available in the archives of the Library of right, Congress? Right. Even if there is no market for the, uh, no public interest in the, in the material. Well, I think there is public interest. I think that that has well, been... Well, I think if there were public interest, it would be available, there would be access? Uh, can you say just what you said? Uh, it just makes economic sense to me that if there were a public interest, the free market being what it, what it is, it would rush to fill that, that demand, and, and there would be access, there would be prints available of the, of the original. I guess, I guess I'm not sure from where I sit that it is that simple, that the free market works so elegantly and without flaws. I think that, that a couple of factors may mitigate against that in the case of colorization. And I think one is that, that um, people, people, consumers, tend to be inclined to go toward that which is most familiar to them. And if you put, and, and excuse the word, dazzling colors, and as we did in our example, a familiar and contemporary soundtrack, 
on, on a movie, it may increase the appeal, the marketability, and the free market will drive toward that. So at least in response to your question, I would say that that is a dangerous uh, reliance to have as it relates to literature and art or popular culture, if we can define movies that way. So I think there may need to be some, some activity on behalf of the government that ensures that that access remains. The free market can't necessarily work by itself. I think secondarily, what seems to be occurring is that the investment in colorized films and the necessity of recouping that investment um, could, uh, I'll say a bad word, color the activities of the free market so it was not entirely responsive to the interests of consumers, but rather was uh, driven to rationalize and recoup an investment. And so that, that creates a, a business prejudice as well as the uh, consumer prejudice that I mentioned earlier. I was wondering <coughs> whether or not the, uh, the uh, American Movies Classics channel uh, shows only uh, uncut movies without commercial interruption, no panning and scanning, and, and all letterboxed to preserve the original structure. We show no commercials, none are interrupted. We, uh, where we can show movies that are not panned and scanned, I don't think we have a 100% track record in that because we are not able to find movies in every case that are not pan and scanned. Um, so we endeavor to do that whenever and wherever possible um, and whenever and wherever films are available in that manner. <laughs> I guess it, it depends upon what the issue is. Um, the government said you only had to show films that were designated as classics by the Librarian of Congress. Would that uh, be okay with you? Probably not. Okay. So, that, at least for your business, relying on the free market is fine? In large part, yes. But it's not okay for the people who want to exhibit uh, or distribute the films that have been lexicon, pan and scan or colorized. I think it has some dangers. You don't have any facts that controvert what Turner has stated about availability of black and white prints. Turner has said that they will make the black and white print available, period, for theatrical. You talked about some sort of idea that maybe in marketing things that would be skewed, but you don't have any facts that would controvert what Turner said they were going to do. Uh, no, not specifically, although I think that there is a, a fair amount of um, observed consumer behavior that would suggest that over an extended period of time, that which is more contemporary is consumed somewhat more. Well, I wanted to ask you about that, too. On page three of your statement, you say the nature of the way people experience most things is that they go to the most immediate popular material, whether it's good or bad, as long as it's fashionable. And the effort to colorize classic black and white films is just a way to appeal to the basis interest, the lowest common denominator. My first question is whether you have any empirical data, any survey or something, that people are in fact motivated by base interests and that they're just really going to go to the most immediate popular things. Well, I think that if you look at for instance, uh, the television industry itself um, and the, the structure of the, the broadcasting side of it particularly, I think what one finds is that, and I think the economics tend to, tend to influence that, but what one finds in broadcast television is that for programs to remain on the air, in largest part, they need to appeal to a very substantial audience. They need to appeal to 20% of the viewing audience at that time in order to be carried on minimum a broadcast network. Um, it, we think, I think, that there is some danger in that or, and that it is not necessarily in the best interest of our society to set up a, a structure for broadcasting and dissemination of information and entertainment that makes that an obligation of existence to be viewed and consumed by that larger group of people. I think somewhere in our past, the government saw fit to set up public broadcasting, which was there in part to provide alternative programming 
that would not necessarily reach that big a group of people because they felt that there was some import to it. It seems to me you're caught between two positions. One is that other people are too stupid to know what they want or to appreciate good things. And uh, if that's the case, that then you uh, have to determine for them what they have to see. I mean, it's marvelous that you have your show and that you um, take the steps that you do to make sure that you show things in a pristine form. But isn't what you're really saying is that everybody has to watch things the way you want to and that if they're too stupid to appreciate things the way that you think they should be done, that A, you either educate them, which apparently you might believe is a hopeless task, or you're simply going to deprive them of it totally. No, that, that really isn't the sentiment that we have toward viewers and consumers whatsoever. The sentiment has to do with, with the inclination on the part of viewers, consumers, to gravitate toward that which is most familiar, that which is most immediately popular, and that which provokes an immediate response. And that that, that inclination, unchecked, is uh, potentially dangerous. How are you going to check it? Well, I think a number of things are, are, are done to check it in the, in the way the, the, that the cable and broadcasting industries are currently organized. I think that there are there are obscenity laws, there is something called prime time access that, that attempts to stimulate local programming. There are a number of uh, constraints and constructions that are made in order to uh, mitigate that. I think that they need to be reasonable, they can be liberal. Um, they don't at begin to presume that people are stupid, but they do attempt to protect to some degree for minority interests, different points of view, uh, and a whole host of other issues. But aren't minority interests protected by your show, or your, your channel? And I mean, you really have to either fish or cut bait in this, I think, which is that either you say, I'm, we're not going to let people watch things in forms we don't like, or you are. The, you know, the, the argument that, 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 that I tried to suggest in the end when I was asked a question by Mr. Oman about what I proposed was not that I didn't propose anything specifically. What I did suggest is that we need to ensure in some manner the access to what we consider is a piece of American heritage. And if, if one believes that the access is in fact in danger of disappearing and that it has some merit to view things in their original intended form, then some sort of control needs to be in place to ensure that that access um, occurs. And it, it, it sort of ends there. And that seems to me a fairly reasonable position to take and that there's a substantial precedent for it in uh, broadcasting, cable, uh, and many other areas of communication and information. So that would be OK for the mutilated versions, quote unquote, to be distributed as long as the other versions were available too. I th yeah, I think that I think that that access to the original, real access, not existence, is um, the ultimate goal, and that uh, colorized versions um, are not the best way to go. But the critical issue is access to the original through video cassette or broadcast, or it doesn't matter. I think that that w whatever is, and I'm, and I'm not providing a specific answer for media, whatever is being utilized by a great number of people, whatever technology at a given point in time, um, is what's important, and that's where the access needs to be ensured. And that's going to be TV, most likely. Yeah, but it may, it may not necessarily be in cable video TV. Cassette. It could well be in video cassette, or it could be in some other form of distribution. Which is what Turner is doing, is enough by putting things out in black and white and the color. Yeah, I guess I, yeah, I don't know if everything is released in black and white or in color, or if they're all given equal shelf space, or if um, there's the same degree of marketing behind them, and if, and if the access is really the same in each case. And if, in fact, the black and white costs less than the color, as is the case for many of them, that would be an incentive for people to buy the black and white. I think that's very reasonable. Yeah, and if they don't, <coughs> are you going to make them buy it? I'm sorry? And if they don't buy it, and if it sits on the shelf because people don't want it, then what are you going to do about access? We'd go hit them. <laughs> okay. well, I'll leave it on that. <laughs> I, I find a certain irony uh, 
in, in this discussion, if it had taken place in the early 50s, uh, the film purists that prevailed, we'd all be watching motion pictures in the way the director intended in motion pictures and not on television, and you would be in a different line of work than you are today. It's, I guess Well, I am aware of the complexity of this question. Uh, and I said, I speak mainly for protecting what are regarded as the classic films. And those films are, become incoherent when they're edited simply for the purpose of squeezing them into a shorter time period, changing the tempo, and the connection between scenes in order to insert ever-increasing amounts of commercials. Um, so in this complex area, uh, I think my first concern is for the, those films that will become an important part of America's film heritage, those films that Professor Belton and the growing numbers of educators across the country are using in classrooms and, as he suggested, uh, the films that become the inspiration for the filmmakers of the future. How would Francis Coppola or Martin Scorsese or David Lynch develop their insights into filmmaking if the films on television, where they saw them mostly, of George Stevens and John Huston and Alfred Hitchcock and D.W. Griffith and Charlie Chaplin were distorted by the imposition of colors. They would have no sense of it. And David Lynch would have not made the beautiful black and white film, The Elephant Man. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask Mr. Patry to take the floor. I have no question for Mr. Stevens. Uh, what a relief. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a few for Mr. Belton, though, so if that's bad luck, I apologize. On, uh, Page eight, within your testimony, you talk about a uh, idea that the names of the companies and of the technicians involved in the tanning and scanning ought also to be listed. Is that? Could you explain the reason for that? It's kind of like a badge of shame or something that you want to impose. Um, or? No, it, it's, it's not entirely my idea. Mila Schwarman suggested that um, because um, in, in in the Hollywood industry, which is a collaborative industry, everyone receives credit for the work they put into a film, and they're very proud of the credit they receive on a film. And if, if this subsidiary industry is developing, uh, we ought to um, acknowledge their work. Um, they, they have made a significant contribution to the film, uh, negative in my, in my estimation. But I, I believe that if, if we look at the downside of this, that, that uh, we're going to live for another 50 years or longer with colorization and panning and scanning and lexiconing, at least it ought to be better than it is. And, and I think there might be some sort of pride in craft if, uh, if names were listed. It would also provide a, a, consumer, a consumer information um, label so that we would know uh, m more clearly that, that the film had been altered. What consumer interest is there in finding out who the art director were in a particular colorizing film? I mean, are you saying that you're gonna, you want to require this, or if they want it, they can put it on? I think it ought to be required, um, just as, uh, again, most motion picture credits are, are, are fairly extensive in acknowledging uh, the activities of, of, of the, the people who have, who have worked, on, worked on the production. But that's voluntary, and in fact, everybody wants their name on there, and there are lots of disputes mm -hmm. about getting well, proper credit. Well, I turn it around. Why would they not want their names on, on these films? Well, that, my question is reversed. Why do you want it put on there? I, th I think it, it uh, makes it much clearer for the consumer to, to see that, that, that this is a separate stage of production involving a separate list of credits that, it is, that will remain sort of distinct from the original credits, but w which will in some way um, identify the film for, uh, for, for uh, consumer choice. That's right, above and beyond uh, the, a label along the lines of the film registry board, right? That's not sufficient? A, a, a label, yeah. This film has been colorized or materially altered. This is above and beyond. I, mean, yeah. I think that there should be something above and okay. beyond that, yes. You gave the example of the Revival House. 
that was showing certain films, and then the video store across the street or the close proximity uh, got a list of the titles that was showing and then advertised, uh, why pay five dollars you can watch it at home at your convenience? My question to you is, what on earth was the what was that revival of theater offering? I mean, you say that the video cassette stores uh, really only appeal to the most popular sort of, uh, of uh, first-run sort of movies. And my question is, if that's all a revival house is showing, is films you know that are already on video cassette, what was the big shake? And I'll preface that I own uh, a. Uh, letterbox copy of the Kira Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress and Woody Allen's uh, Manhattan mm -hmm. myself. And I would go, in fact, to a revival theater to see them on the widescreen because it does present an obviously different experience. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if that's all revival houses are doing, that might be some explanation for why there are not that many of them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a copy of, of the, um, the exact you know, schedules that, that were duplicated. Of course, revival houses are also uh, commercial enterprises, and, and there, there are a, a, a finite number of film classics, uh, the Janus catalog, uh, so on and so forth, that uh, revival houses show repeatedly, and, and many of these films are, are certainly available in the videotape market. Um, I would argue that the consumers, if, if, for example, we're talking about The Hidden Fortress, um, or let, no, let's pick something else. Uh, say uh, the Revival House was showing uh, Chinatown, Roman Polanski's Chinatown. They, they would be showing it in 35 millimeter Cinemascope, Panavision. And the, the video store across the street would, would have a videotape hand and scan. Um, they're not saying my videotape is hand and scan. They're, they're saying this is as good as what you're going to get in the theater. Um, and the, the public is, is, has, no, has no way of, of deciding or making the decision that this, is, this tape is not going to be as good as what we see in the theater. Um, but unfortunately, the economic uh, competition resulted in the demise of, of that particular kind of theatrical ex exhibition situation. I would, I would certainly know that a video cassette I'm getting is different than what I'm going to see in the, in, on the big screen and certainly give me the choice about what to do. Okay, one, I'll sum up here really quickly because um, I know we're out of time. You, you have a proposal for uh, making 16 millimeter and other things available, which is putting a tax on pre-recorded video cassettes and other things. Um, are you saying that it's okay to have hand and scanned and, and colorized things distributed as long as there's a tax on them that goes to fund these other things, the 16 millimeter format? Mm -hmm. And if so, how are you going to make the producers come up with the 16 millimeter format? I mean, if it's not there, how are you going to get somebody to, to, uh, to market it? Uh, I, I made no statement at all about whether it's okay to have uh, pan and scan versions of video cassettes in distribution. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know whether, um, whether the ac academic community can um, decide on, on sort of matters of principle and law that, that, that are, are that difficult. All I can address is the problem that we face in educating tomorrow's uh, film goers and, and filmmakers. Um, these, um, we, we, we uh, we were very, very much interested in cooperating with Ted Turner, who owns the rights to many of these films which are no longer available to us. So that uh, we would like to, uh, to to involve every every element uh, of the of the um, the contemporary marketplace, ar archivists, distributors, producers, in making films genuinely available, not just available in the archive, but available in the classroom, available also to, for non theatrical for, for theatrical distribution for those houses which uh, which want to want to have these titles available. Um, to strike 16 millimeter neg negatives is extremely expensive, especially if there is no not a, a no negative in existence. So this is this is why a, a, um, a sizable amount of money through a tax uh, is is necessary. Um, and those are going to be pre-recorded video cassettes, as you propose. And one would imagine that they would have to be penned and scanned video cassettes for there to be any market to give you the money that you need to get the expensive 16 millimeter formats you want, right? Wouldn't that be ironic? Yes, um, that's my question. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not legislating what uh, I would I would accept a tax on any pre-recorded video cassette, uh, personally or institutionally. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to discriminate and, and exempt taxation from hand and scan prints. No. Uh, by the way, that this taxation idea is not without precedent. I, I believe that when there was a discussion about the, the every pre, every blank video cassette ought to be taxed to provide residuals for the television personalities who would be taped by home consumers and that this, this tax was eventually dropped. But 
it, it certainly has, has had some sort of um, ballpark experience in Washington, so it's not an important idea, except perhaps in certain political climates. Okay, thank you. I, I am compelled to observe that that proposal wasn't warmly embraced, and I don't think, <laughs> and, and I don't think that the residual would have gone directly to the old actor's home. It would have poured into the pockets of the movie producers, as, as far as I know, the owners of copyright. And it was not a tax, but a royalty. Mm -hmm. Schwartz? Uh, I have one question for Mr. Stevens. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you on your recent Emmy. Thank you. Um, and wanted to ask you, as someone who spent 20 years in film preservation, the question I've been asking all day is, how do you build um, an interest in, in a young generation with the demographics working against you in these films, and what role does the government play now, and what role should it play? Should it play a larger role in preserving and creating? There are now, what, six cities with revival houses? You're speaking of the um, showing of films in, in, in theaters. theaters. <clears throat> I think that, uh, that that practice will ironically will grow even in the face of the competition of video cassettes and cable because I think it whets the appetite as Mr. Patry indicated he would both have the videotape and go to the theater um, and I think it's a complex question but I think it's much like all of the issues we face here today I think it's very good that we're meeting and that these are being discussed um, I think there are solutions I think the panning and scanning question is really just blindness that has kept us from dealing with that. The networks decided that they didn't want to show panned and scanned film. I think uh, Roger Mayer uh, is a friend of mine. And, uh, we've, we've worked together on things. We've, dis we've disagreed about things. But I would not be surprised if Roger Mayer would see the value of panning and scanning these films that were preserved under his aegis at MGM so that they would be shown in their proper aspect ratio, hopefully without colors. Um, but, the, but to be less disputatious, the, the, the great color musicals of N MGM, they absolutely look absurd on television uh, when the dancers keep going out of the frame and the tanner and scanner is trying to catch up with them and cut to a close up of someone on the other side. So, there was an old saying uh, around Hollywood some time ago that movie moguls react to only two impulses. It might have been Oscar Levant who would be credited. He said those impulses are terror and greed. Um, I think the fact that these hearings are being held, the fact that Mr. Stewart came to Washington, the fact that the, the directors have come to Washington, the fact that we're here today, is having an effect on the custodians of our heritage. I wonder whether black and white versions, as is suggested they will be, of the Turner films would be available were it not for the spotlight that has been placed on this question by John Huston and other prominent filmmakers. Uh, I will not get into the question of, of how readily available those films will be. They certainly will not be available on Turner Broadcasting, but we do hope, uh, and I, I, I suspect that if Mr. Mayor says it will be done, it will be done, that those films will be readily available in black and white. Uh, I read recently in Variety that uh, the owner of Video 83 in New York Times Square, which gets as good a cross-section as you would find, tourists from all over the world, lower class people who work around here and executives who work around here. Um, the people who want older movies are more interested in black and white. I'd say 99 out of 100 want the original. Now that certainly contrasts with what we hear about the research conducted by the network that broadcasts colorized films. And I, of course, it's their research and their network so I don't suspect we get much to the bottom of that. But I think that if reasonable people meet and continue to deal with this, that we can find solutions. As I said, I think the panning and scanning, if you 
really focused the people in the industry on it and in the video business and in the television business, uh, a great change could be made there. What does concern me is when we raise these questions and we simplify it. When I hear someone say, do you want the government to tell you what you can show? There are other solutions than that. I have great respect for public service. Uh, and I respect you as public servants. And I urge you to continue to deal with this issue and seek solutions. My father lost the case in Los Angeles. <clears throat> over here in the Supreme Court from 1896 up until the historic Brown decision in 1954, great advocates went into that court and said to the nine justices, do you want the government to tell, your, to tell a man in South Carolina who his daughter has to sit next to in school? And year by year, the answer favored those attorneys until 1954 when someone decided, yes, we want the government to intervene on the behalf of people who are segregated by race. And I think there are areas here where a, an enlightened government and its public servants can contribute to this dialogue without interfering too horrendously in the free market what do you think about the idea of the government, even though it's a, it's a board of private citizens, it's still under the auspices of the government, choosing 25 films as classics? I mean, that seems to run against the notion you started out with as a film preservationist, that you preserve all films, the, the story you told mm -hmm. about your father. You preserve all films and let the test of time decide what it is that is a classic and what, what isn't. I, my answer to that, I guess it's better than nothing, and it certainly is not a particularly enlightened or foolproof system. It's a, it's a result of compromise. But I think that this is an issue that will not go away. I think others will be discussing it in the future, and that hopefully uh, we will find a way in our democratic process to safeguard our culture and the right of citizens today and in the future to see the works of great filmmakers in the fashion in which they were designed. Are either one of you aware of any surveys on the issue of letterboxing? You said the networks made these decisions. Are either of you aware of any marketing surveys of viewer reaction to letterboxing? How, how they would they like I would just say that these great films were made Nobody, Hitchcock didn't, the, the, you know, viewer surveys are something that, uh, you know, now they make movies based on viewer surveys. These films that we admire and esteem um, were made by people who didn't need viewer surveys. No, no, my they question just, was whether or not people don't, don't like Letterbox. The networks decided that Letterboxing is not something that viewers would want to see, and my question is, how did they decide that? I would probably say probably in the same way they decided uh, to increase the amount of commercials from six minutes to 14 minutes, uh, in either the path of least resistance or uh, without much thought. Um, as I understand it, um, though the FCC was not involved in this decision at all, and you know, we're talking about the uh, 60s when, when these programs were being bought up, the networks reasoned that uh, the appearance of black masking above and below the image might give uh, home audiences the, some sort of notion that, that they were not receiving the proper signal and that they would deluge the, the uh, broadcaster's office with phone calls, though they, I don't think they ever did any experiments in, in this. Uh, so this, this was uh, their rationale behind it. I don't believe that, um, that there have been very many network broadcasts of letterboxed films, so there would be no viewer survey. The only place in which letterbox films exist as a, as a phenomenon is in the video sales and rentals area and cable television um, distribution. And the FCC never made a ruling on whether no, or not the, they could. In it, fact, the FCC said they, they, you, you could transmit letterbox right. film if you want because you're transmitting a full signal. That's fine. Mr. 
Schrader. Mr. Stevens, in terms of uh, specific solutions, you mentioned uh, that it would, of course, be ideal to restrict the number of commercials that could be inserted in a given hour of television, as, as of course, you know, that's regulated by the Federal Communications Commission. We uh, might make some recommendations to Congress. Uh, uh, I personally have my doubts as to whether Congress would want to legislate as to the number of commercials and would probably uh, defer to the FCC on that point. So uh, that's just an observation that that's, that's an issue that may still rest in the hands of the, the FCC commissioners. Uh, but in terms of other specific solutions, are you in fact suggesting that uh, there should be additional moral rights legislation at the federal level uh, so that other directors uh, would be able to stop the editing of their films for television, for example, as your father attempted to do in the mid-60s? I, I would say that I, I would hope that the moral rights issue will be further considered uh, by Congress. I'm not certain that I have the precise solution to it, but I think it's certainly worthy of an airing, continued uh, further airing. That's like taking the fifth, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was, I, I was wondering if, uh, if, if you were inclined to favor mm -hmm. such legislation, whether you had uh, uh, considered the, the possible impact on the, on the production and distribution of films, whether based on your experience in the film industry, mm -hmm. Uh, as a producer and director and so forth, uh, whether you, you feel that uh, the industry could easily uh, continue uh, in a profitable way, producing high quality films uh, under a moral rights regime. Uh, there's been some suggestion that, uh, although it's a complex uh, uh, situation, that one reason that uh, the film industry in Europe uh, may not uh, be as strong as it is, is because uh, the lack of control at the production level uh, results in uh, fewer films being produced and fewer profitable films. Um, respectfully, I, I do not think that is the reason that European films are less successful at the box office. And I would say that the only reason, in, in the view of some, that the motion picture and television industry has survived as long as it has is because it's indestructible. Um, and I think it might even survive a certain kind of a moral rights uh, legislation. But I do emphasize that I do not have a definition of what some moral rights legislation might be. Would that moral rights that you're seeking go as far as to allow the director to prevent the motion picture from being shown on television at all? I really do not have a, a view uh, as to any specifics on a moral rights clause. I, am, I see myself here more as, a, as a, an attempt to protect those whose work is complete and uh, exists for the ages rather than uh, the moral rights question in the future. What? Uh, yes, uh, Professor Belton, um, do you do you think that federal policy, uh, national policy in this area, should be more concerned with the protection of the work which a film artist has created against its material alteration, or whether it should focus more on the right of the artist who created the work? To control the material alteration of those films, or both. Uh, I wouldn't be uh, adverse to both. As the Library of Congress, of course, is uh, it, one of its many many duties is to is to preserve motion pictures and uh, to be a repository for 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 historical objects and and, and for us film history. Um, the Copyright Office itself, on the other hand, is. Uh, is, is involved in uh, awarding, or, or you know, it, it, I, I would say administering uh, copyright protection to uh, to those who, who who own it. 
One, I mean, one of the, the, I guess, the arguments that I always go back to is that, that my understanding, though I'm not a lawyer, and I may open up all sorts of problems here, is that one of the basic premises of copyright law and protection is to encourage creativity. This gives a certain amount of control of, or for the exploitation of, of the, the work that's performed to that group of people who, who, cre who created it. And my argument is, in, in my presentation, is that um, panning and scanning and colorization have essentially el eliminated options for creative artists. Therefore, they're counter to uh, copyright protection. Colorization is, 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 is a, a similar problem, which is, it, I, I think it was uh, just about um, a year and two months ago that the Copyright Office decided to, to give copyright protection to colorized works. I see that as, as in some ways counterproductive to the spirit of copyright law, spirit of copyright protection. Um, and uh, we, we all know that the law can be read in different ways uh, to more, more fully realize its spirit. I think that perhaps we, we could in include, without legislating, some sort of, here, here with the word, moral rights aspect to, to our interpretation of what copyright protection is doing, without necessarily instituting a moral, moral rights provision or bill that became law. It, it's a matter, really, of, of, of the, the people who are making the decisions about how, how works are to be made and, and consumed. The uh, proposal in your uh, statement for a National Film Clearinghouse, um, is this uh, its debut? Uh, has, uh, is this an idea which you or other educators involved in film have discussed before, and if so, with whom? And uh, it has been uh, discussed by the uh, the task force on task force on film integrity for the Society for Cinema Studies. I've discussed it also with uh, one or two archivists, um, and uh, that's about as far as it has gotten. That's all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your participation. I propose a five-minute break. Uh, that's uh, okay, and we'll, uh, we'll be back uh, with our uh, witness uh, is Mr. Peter Nolan of the Motion Picture Associate, representing the Motion Picture Association of America. Uh, Mr. Mr. Nolan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Register. <clears throat> Just for the record, I am Vice President of Council of the Walt Disney Company. I'm speaking today on behalf of both the Walt Disney Company, but also the Motion Picture Association of America. Before I get to my remarks, I want to state also for the record that we are the copyright owner of the Siskel and Ebert Show, <laughs> which the DGA, without permission, edited and publicly performed. But we won't object. Well, we were told that uh, they had gotten permission. <laughs> because we asked that question. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we didn't agree to have it edited. <laughs> Nick Counter, who is also supposed to be here today for the motion picture industry. He is president of the Alliance, which is the collective bargaining organization for the motion picture producers. Unfortunately, could not make it uh, because of negotiations pending with the Teamsters Union. And his statement, he asked to be put into the record, and he is more than willing to answer any written questions that are submitted to him. We understand that the fundamental issue facing the Copyright Office in this hearing is whether to recommend to Congress enactment of a federal moral rights law applicable to motion pictures and to television production. Mr. Register, we along with a lot of other copyright owners, not just motion picture owners, vigorously disagree with this position of the Directors Guild, which, which, which favors enactment of a moral rights law. There's one concept I would like to convey that perhaps crystallizes the essence of the rest of my remarks, and that is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
We are very successful in the motion picture industry in exporting our products around the world. We compete and dominate other markets with our copyrighted work. We think one of the advantages we have over other producers of motion pictures is that we do not have interference with the work for hire doctrine, which is somewhat unique for our country. I'm not saying it's the sole reason, but I think it's a contributing factor. In our view, moral rights legislation such as H.R. 2400 is neither necessary nor appropriate for a variety of reasons that I will get into. Mr. Register, the, the panning and scanning, and by the way, I'm not sure if there is a scanning. It's a panning, really. The panning and time compression technologies are tools that are very valuable to society. They permit producers, such as those that I represent, to make their products available to a wide variety of people, wider than uh, would be true without them. And indeed, that is fulfilling one of the major and fundamental goals of the Copyright Act, at least as I have always understood it, and that is to encourage, for the benefit of society, the widest dissemination of, of original work as possible. Today, motion pictures are delivered to the consumer through a wide, wide and very expanding range of transmission media, from motion picture theaters to free broadcast television to basic cable, to pay cable, pay-per-view, video cassettes, DBS, and a whole raft of other transmission vehicles. Our work must be capable of being adapted for the particular needs of these transmission media. The technologies under discussion today allow for those, allow for those uh, adaptations to take place and to encourage the wide dissemination of our product. When a motion picture is created for theatrical release, the dimensions of the image are those of a typical theater screen. Theater screens have a wide aspect ratio. By contrast, television has a, has a different one, a smaller one. And it has to be, the motion picture has to be adapted in some way for the product to be shown on television. Since 1961, panning has been used to accomplish this means. There were a variety of, of attempts at other methods, and they just didn't work. Through the panning process, the motion picture image is adapted so that the entire screen is filled with a visual image. And despite what you may have heard from others at this microphone today, we are absolutely convinced that the public would rather see it that way than with a letterbox. Time compression and expansion facilitate also the airing of these motion pictures for on commercial television and on uh, um, airlines. In the absence of time compression, it would be necessary to eliminate more footage from the original version of a motion picture to meet the requirements of broadcast television and the, and the uh, airlines. The studios and transfer houses take great care in employing time compression and expansion. They are careful to work within acceptable limits of these techniques so that we make sure that the integrity of the film to the extent possible considering the transmission media, is maintained. An example this morning was given of Steven Spielberg requiring its distributor in video cassette format to use Letterbox. That same producer is allowing E.T., his biggest grossing picture ever, in fact, in the whole industry, to be both Letterbox and Pan not panned by the critics, but just panned for the television set. And the reason for that is, is he wants wide dissemination of that product. Now, he 
is very much and was very much involved in that <coughs> transfer process to make sure that the panning was correct. Disney does that as well. Every theatrical motion picture we transfer to video cassette, we ask the director to come in and sit and watch the process and to approve that process. Every single theatrical motion picture we produce has this done. And the reason for that is twofold. One is that we want the integrity of the film to be maintained as, to the extent possible, given the particular technology. And secondly, the directors are demanding that as a price for them to continue to do business with us. We are in competition with the other motion picture studios for the talents of these directors. So we want to curry their favor. This is one way we are forced to do it. If, even if we didn't want to do it, we would be forced to do it because of the competition. Now obviously these technologies, and again one of them dates back to 1961, permit us to reach markets that we otherwise might not be able to get, such as television. They allow us to provide viewers with diverse viewing options. <coughs> I must stress the importance of non-theatrical markets to the motion picture industry and to the well-being of our industry. If we can't reach these markets, then the U.S. motion picture and television businesses, the preeminent entertainment industry in the world, will be grievously wounded. We will not disappear, but we will be grievously wounded. This is so because ours is a high-risk, high-cost enterprise. According to the to the Motion Picture Association of America. The average cost of producing a motion picture in this country is now around $20 million. Add to that around $9 million in print and advertising costs, and you can see why this is a very big investment for our company to make. It is also a fact that most motion pictures produced by American producers don't make a profit from their worldwide theatrical exhibition. It's estimated that two-thirds of the MPAA company motion pictures never recoup their costs. Now, in order to improve the odds for financial success, the copyright owners must have the freedom to adapt their motion pictures to the differing needs of the consumer and the various transmission media. If legislation were enacted that called into question the copyright owner's ability to do this, the widespread performance of their products, so essential to the recoupment of our huge investments, would be seriously hurt. I would like to address <coughs> very briefly H.R. 2400, which, as you know, would grant, if enacted, directors a veto right over material changes. Let me just say that we are opposed to it. I have gone into some great length in the paper that we are submitting for the record, and I invite your attention to those remarks. But we feel that this is precisely the kind of legislation that would seriously injure our business. Mr. Register, the relentless advance of technology constantly poses new questions for copyright experts. You're more aware of that than anybody in this room. Many of these technologies threaten fundamental principles of copyright law, such as new equipment that facilitates duplication of copyrighted works without the authority of rights owners. Other technologies further fundamental principles of copyright by expanding consumer access creative works, while at the same time respecting the rights of copyright owners. That is the line that must, in our opinion, be drawn. We urge the Copyright Office and Congress to remain vigilant to this distinction, to discourage the former and to encourage the latter. To do so would be consistent with the Copyright Act and the underlying constitutional grant that allows Congress to enact legislation. Those are the those are my remarks, and I ask that they be put into the record. 
your record will be included in full, and uh, we are grateful for your, your participation and uh, for the uh, thoroughness of your statement. Let me ask you the same question I asked Mr. Stevens. Is there any middle ground that can be worked out uh, uh, that would allow for the editing of motion pictures for television other and other non-theatrical media in a way that would meet the approval of the director? I think so. You will never, in my opinion, satisfy a director on issues like this completely. On the other hand, um, I think a lot of the voluntary processes that are now taking place, such as the one I mentioned during my remarks, um, do go a long way toward reconciling the differences between the two groups. Um, I would prefer that, I mean, obviously I prefer that the things be worked out voluntarily. I think anybody would agree with that. Um, we do have the collective bargaining process. We have the individual contract negotiation process. Plus, we have market forces, such as I referred to, that encourage this kind of reconciliation. Thank you. Ms. Patrick? Uh, my questions are rather detailed ones about the collective bargaining agreement and some sections. Uh, <coughs> and in light of the fact that we're going to try and finish by 5.30, uh, I'll, if you don't mind, submit them to you uh, in writing. I would not be in a position to answer those in any case. <laughs> submit them to <laughs> Nick Counter. Nick Counter. Yeah, sure. You being the imperial you with the capital Y. <laughs> Mr. Schwartz? Uh, I just have, I'll keep myself brief too and then submit some questions to you. But I had a question about how you would see the actual practical results of moral rights being enacted. Um, assuming in your worst nightmare that, that they were enacted, I guess actually your worst nightmare would be if Mickey Mouse died or something. Um, would, would, you, would you really expect a director to invoke these rights I mean, first of all, it, it's, it's a, it would take a jury to decide what was a mutilation or distortion, would it not? That's correct, the way the proposed legislation is now written. Right. Do you, do you and, and you say that a director, you never, you never see directors, that it would actually be satisfied, but don't you think that a director would, wouldn't invoke it the same way they invoke their rights to get the director's cut to the studio, um, and that is it's a working process to get there. They, they get what they finally want is their cut and turn the, turn the picture over to the studio for marketing. Um, the, the point being that wouldn't they just invoke it in those... It would have to be a case that involved mutilation or distortion as a, as a court-imposed ruling of what mutilation or distortion was. Um, and it would be something that would be very rarely invoked as a, as a court-imposed right. Don't you see that? Do you see it that way or not? Um, <clears throat> I will give you a computer printout at some point of all the litigation that is filed against our company. You can categorize about half of it as totally frivolous. Mm -hmm. So the ingenuity of litigants in this country for creating claims and through the courts is <coughs> boundless. Well, you might, and in how many of those frivolous cases have you won? We win them all. <laughs> so it would create more business for your legal department. But, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but the practical impact. And take away money that we could invest in new creative work. I'm just going to submit a couple more questions to you if that's okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schwartz. Uh, Mr. Schrader? Uh, Mr. Nolan, uh, do you remember companies who are having uh, films colorized fully expect to be able to market those films in Europe 
Uh, do you expect that there will not be claims of moral rights, or if there are claims, that they'll be unsuccessful? Um, I don't believe they would be successful, but on the other hand, it, it is an issue of first impression around the world. Uh, I don't know of any case other than the trial court uh, preliminary ruling. And um, I'm not sure how courts around the world will come out on it. In the course of marketing films in the past, have your companies experienced any significant problems in distributing films because of moral rights claims? The directors, if, for example, especially where you hire foreign directors? The only serious problem we ever have had is with an American writer of an underlying literary work who sued us in France for a purported violation of his moral rights. The case involved the motion picture Aristocat. The case went all the way up to the French Supreme Court, which affirmed the Court of Appeals ruling that we did not violate the moral rights uh, of this author. But not in terms of any of these technologies. We've never had a claim. That's apparently Disney's experience. Why do you think there's so few cases? Uh, is well, it because you don't violate the moral rights? <clears throat> um, I suspect so. But also, um, I think Americans are reluctant to file suit in foreign courts. And also, um, foreigners are generally more reluctant than Americans to file suit. That's my speculation. What? Uh, thank you very much for uh, the useful information in your statement about uh, panning and scanning uh, and time compression and the importance that uh, you attach to it in dealing with uh, the broadcast market. I see your point that uh, it would be difficult to deal with or exploit the broadcasters, the broadcast market, if you didn't have a high degree of freedom to adapt the product for the use uh, that's compatible with the way the broadcaster gets its returns, commercial interruptions, time slots, and so on and so forth. But what if, uh, instead of complicating your relationship with the directors, legislation would be passed which simply prevented the broadcasters from showing your product in, in an adulterated form? Now, I don't, adulterated form is not the legal language, but I think you know what I mean. But if they said that theatrical films, if they were going to be broadcast on television, shown on cable television, had to be shown in, uh, a, in a complete version in which they were theatrically distributed. And do you think that regulating that end, as opposed to the relationships between you and the directors, would so modify the broadcast market that the film industry would still be hurt? I think so. I also would think it's a political impossibility. That's my guess, based upon having been in legislative fights with the broadcast industry. But yes, I think we would get hurt. The second question has to do with uh, Professor Bolton's testimony. Uh, he had pointed to the difficulty that uh, film educators have in acquiring complete high quality film materials used in teaching, and that the availability of product derived from television or for the video market just isn't adequate for those purposes and to that end. He, considering proposing an idea for a film clearinghouse to facilitate the creation and distribution where necessary of such film materials for education. Pushing aside for the moment how that would be paid for, um, taking do you think that that is the sort of a possibility that the Motion Picture Association of America and its companies would be willing to explore with uh, educational interests to see if there is a problem, and if so, whether a clearinghouse is a good mechanism? 
this is the first I've heard of this problem. We have a very aggressive marketing program for our motion pictures in the educational market. Disney. Disney, yes. Yeah. Um, I can't speak to the other companies on this issue because I'm not prepared on it, but um, we, we can perhaps do a survey of our member companies to see if they would be willing to do it. From Disney's standpoint, we don't really see a need for it because we are out there marketing our films directly to the educational market and have for years and years. Thank we have a natural interest in the educational uh, market because that is one of our focus target groups for our motion pictures. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nolan. We will be submitting additional questions uh, that you can share as appropriate with your co-witness. Thank you very much, and thank you also for adjusting the schedule. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. The next panel is the Video Dealers panel. We're very pleased to welcome Van Stevenson of Errols and Mr. Burton Wides, uh, counsel to the Video Software Dealers Association. Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Wides. Thank you, Mr. Roman. Uh, just for the record, I'm Director of Public Relations for Errols Incorporated, and we're a suburban Washington-based video retail chain, uh, and we have 165 stores in nine states in the District of Columbia. Um, we've been marketing a handful of colorized motion pictures on video cassette, primarily for sale over the past couple of years. And it's become evident to us, based on sales, that there is a segment of the population that prefers to purchase the colorized version of certain motion pictures on videotape. It is likely that many of those customers that purchased the colorized version would not have bought the title if it was not available in color. Uh, in 1987, for example, we merchandised It's a Wonderful Life in both black and white and color. We sold 2,113 copies in color at $9.95 and 648 copies in black and white at $7.95. Um, we support the position of the Video Software Dealers Association of which our company is a member. Uh, we believe the consumer should have the freedom of choice if such a choice exists with a particular motion picture. Uh, we're a retailer in business to serve the general public's desire for motion pictures on video cassette, and the success of our business is based on the demand for that product. Colorized movies on video cassette will only survive if there is consumer demand, and at this point it appears there will continue to be a demand for both colorized as well as black and white versions of certain motion pictures. Um, those are essentially my comments, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Mr. Wise? Thank you, Mr. Oman. I am appearing as legislative counsel to the Video Software Dealers Association, which is the national trade association of uh, video distributors and retailers, representing close to 20,000 of the estimated 30,000 retail home video stores. Industry analysts also estimate that there are tens of additional thousands of convenience stores, gas stations, supermarkets, and other businesses that deal in significant amounts of rental and sale of video. We have not submitted a formal statement to supplement the uh, data and statement provided by Errols, but uh, we have worked with the staff and are obtaining additional data from other members. Uh, we may have a statement to submit uh, after the hearing, after reviewing the record. However, um, we've just been through a major effort in connection with the legislation in the Interior Appropriations Bill, uh, and based on our experience in that regard, I'd like to offer several brief observations that may be useful or at least relevant to your uh, present inquiry. Initially, we were really merely interested observers. As the saying goes, we, we didn't have a dog in that fight. We, we made clear to the Congress and the parties involved that a recent survey of our membership indicated overwhelmingly that the members of the SDA 
preferred no restraint on the availability of colorized films because of what Mr. Stevenson referred to, the clear interest on the part of a large portion of their customers uh, for colorized films. And this was certainly consistent with what has been the hallmark of our industry, which is serving the public through their freedom of choice. However, it soon became clear that many of the proposals would have a very unfair and unjustified impact on our dealers. Our dealers are basically innocent bystanders to the dispute in that it involves uh, circumstances over which they have no control and uh, incomplete information, particularly with regard to what changes may have been made in a film and certainly with regard to whether those changes may have met a particular official standard for triggering labeling or other allegedly remedial requirements. Therefore, we did participate vigorously in the legislation, legislative consideration of the Morazic Yates Amendment. And I would like to offer for the record copies of several VSDA communications to the Congress which detailed our concerns with these kinds of proposals. As a result of these communications by many members across the country to their senators and congressmen, a number of changes were made in that legislation. Based on that experience, I'd like to simply offer three observations uh, which we think uh, are part of the lesson of that experience. The first is that in any attempt by bureaucratic ballot or a delegation to an industry group with official status to judge artistic merit or to assess the degree to which the so-called integrity of a work has been impaired as to whether it should trigger governmental regulations we're really opening a Pandora's box of both constitutional and policy problems. The constitutional problems, which you're aware of, involve not only First Amendment issues, but also, depending on the structure of the scheme, questions of delegation to private parties, questions of separation of powers, or at a policy level, extreme micromanagement by the government. In the case of the copyright law, we ran into Orwellian suggestions that the copyright law had to be furthered by curtailing and um, exposing even to copyright liability copyright owners. We found in particular, to take one example, that there were proposals and still are proposals for extending any labeling requirements to advertising and other promotional materials. And we believe that exponentially compounds some of the First Amendment concerns as well as the policy concerns. In the actual business of video, home video retailing, advertising and promotional materials cover a very wide range, going from nationwide media campaigns by the producing studios to thousands of individual retail stores and family businesses taking out local media advertisements, to promotional materials and displays in stores, to handouts at the counter, and even to mailings to consumers. To try to encompass that universe under imposed government regulations for required inclusion of disclosure or other information, we think pre creates incredible complexities and incredible practical burdens for our members. And I think at some point, it even raises the question or the need to keep in perspective in the pursuit of artistic integrity, uh, incentive for creators, some perspective of this industry and its regulation relative to government regulation of commerce generally. Grocery stores that have special advertisements for sales of food products they sell are not required to in any way replicate labeling that is required by the government on their cans of soup. Pharmacies in advertising for either over-the-counter drugs or prescription drugs are not required to replicate or include in their advertisements any aspect of the labeling information required by FDA. Even convenience stores in advertising specials on cartons of cigarettes 
and not required to repeat the Surgeon General's warning. Now, in this store. Now, at some point, one has to wonder, in terms of singling out um, the uh, industry for what kind of regulation there's going to be as to how far one is going to go. The second observation I'd like to make, and the second lesson we learned, is that in order to meet these problems, the proposals, while they may start out as consisting of a few apparently simple enunciated principles of equity or concern, end up usually being sufficiently complex schemes as to make the Rube Goldberg weep with envy, and in the process really make this area a prime candidate for the, the same law of unintended consequences of congressional legislation. And I would really urge you, in considering any proposals, not only to focus on the extent to which those proposals meet the alleged problems, which is the purpose of the inquiry, or the potential or perceived problems, but the degree to which they create more problems than they solve. In our case, we are particularly concerned about the impact on the video dealers, as I mentioned. But there's also a question of their impact on our customers. The inquiry notice for your study and for the <coughs> hearing refers to the impact of the technology on access for the public to audiovisual work. I would urge you to also take into account the impact of proposed solutions on the access of the public to audiovisual work. I think the technologies certainly increase the access to the public in that, in the case of colorization, whole new generations of young Americans have been able to enjoy films they probably otherwise would not pick uh, to see, uh, given the predilection of a great many of them for seeing films in color, whether that's for good or ill. But beyond that, when there is extensive regulation, and as many of these proposals uh, would include, the threat of liability or other financial loss for video dealers it is going to be a considerable drop off in their interest and willingness in carrying some of these films and therefore the public will in fact be denied access to them another point on the access question is the question of disclosure for the public benefit i think that and I credit the American consumer with a little more intelligence. I think after decades of watching films on television and many years of watching films and video cassettes, the American people know that they are seeing something that is not going to be exactly the same as seeing it in a large screen theater. And I think disclosing that fact to them through a very cumbersome uh, series of requirements and regulations is of marginal utility to them, although may serve other purposes or be on other agendas. Lastly, I would observe that in collecting the data, although you are under, obviously, an injunction from the Congress to report back, if the inferior appropriations provision is finally enacted, given the complexity and given the great likelihood of unintended consequences on the consumers, on the video retailers, and on many other facets of the dissemination of movies in America. I would think that one of the main recommendations you could make to the Congress is that critical data would include how the existing provisions in the Interior Bill in fact work out in the real world and impact over the next year or two before any larger scheme or more ambitious uh, effort is undertaken to broaden this kind of intrusion in the private market. And that concludes my remarks, and we'd be prepared to take the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, have uh, one question, and uh, you can perhaps uh, choose who will answer amongst you. Uh, we have some suggestion that sales of colorized uh, motion pictures outstrip the sales of black and white motion pictures, but that the rentals of black and white motion pictures uh, outstrip the rentals of colorized, the colorized versions. 
Is that your experience? Uh, is that the experience of the members of the Video Dealers Association? Uh, and if so, is there some rational explanation for it? You want to well, I can, I can do it on, on behalf of, of Errol's. If I take a look at sales, um, and this is through June of this year, and we'll include, I'll include 1987 in, in those figures also, we sold a total of um, let's see here, 2,307 colorized versions of motion pictures and 2,132 in black and white. Now, based on my testimony, you know that It's a Wonderful Life was the majority. Um, in some cases, for example, if I take a look at the Maltese Falcon, we sold a total of 591 in black and white, six colorized. Depends, it, it really varies depending on, on title and availability in terms of sales. Now, another, another thing that I want to mention is the price of an individual movie. That has more of a guiding factor than anything on whether somebody will buy a film or not. It's correct in terms of black and white because the majority of films that are being colorized are classics and they are among the least rented in our stores. So we may add, for example, we may buy um, 60 copies of Good Morning America per store throughout the chain where it's a wonderful life. We may have three black and white and one color in each of our locations. So based on title, you know, based on title, based on time, each title varies. Is that for sales or rental or both? I mean, the three and one. Okay, that's for that's for rental. Sales sales is a, will will vary depending on store and neighborhood. There's no experience that that you will stock more of the colored because it's a higher price tag and fewer of the black and white, and therefore there are fewer black and white sales and more colored sales. No, it depends. It depends on demand. It depends on title. It depends on store. You would you would fill try to fill the demand as as a right. As a well, I mean, mo most of our sales, except in the Christmas season, most of our sales are special order unless the tape is a very, very low price where we can stock it and we believe there's going to be a demand for it. Okay. okay. Well, I will uh, forego the opportunity of other questions, though there are thousands of people in this, people in this, in this city who would, who would kill for the opportunity to have the chance to grill <laughs> Bert Wise the way he grilled them in the witness stand at the right hand of Senator Kennedy. But uh, I will forego that pleasure. And, uh, that's back on to uh, Bill Patrick. All right. I first have a question for Mr. Stevens. Have you had any experience with letterboxing? Any feedback from your customers about letterboxing? Not at this point, no. Just based on your knowledge of the industry, do you think that if it were required that uh, films be letterboxed, that that would have an adverse impact on your business? I think it would have a tremendously adverse impact on our, on our business uh, because I think it's been testified before by other witnesses um, when people watch television, they're used to watching it full frame, and it's a, it's a different medium, a different way of, of watching a particular work, whether it be you know, a motion picture or a made-for-home video tape. And uh, after 40-some you know, years of experience in terms of watching television, I think people realize that when they sit down to watch a motion picture on videotape. And I think there would be, I think there'd be a lot of complaints uh, I think you would turn a lot of people off to, to the home video experience. You, can I, can I interrupt just if, it was, if it was required on all, you know, on all right. subsequent motion pictures, yeah. you wouldn't want to give the viewers the option that you give them in the black and white uh, and color uh, environment. You wouldn't want to give them the opportunity of having the pan and scan version or the or the uh, the letterbox version uh, to choose the one they prefer. For rental or for sale? Well, for rental or sale. Well, it would it, it would depend. Um, I'm and I and I'm just I'm just speculating at this point. I would think the majority of our customers would prefer full screen. Even with an example like the Fred Astaire, where he kept popping in and out of the screen. Well, the only reason I happening. say the only reason I say that I guess is because we have after running a hundred million tapes since 1981, uh, I'm not aware of any complaints or, you know, anybody asking to, to be able to see a film in that particular form. 
direct dramatic comment. I, I probably should just gracefully keep my head down uh, after your kind deferral, but I, I should say that in the, in the practical world of video retailing, some of the stores are sufficiently small in size in terms of their physical space that a requirement that they need to carry a black and white uh, and a color film and uh, a pen and scan version and uh, other versions of the film as well, at some point is going to impact uh, either on their decision to carry the film at all in terms of the, the space it would take up if they think they perhaps want to have one or two copies for a few people who might be interested, or uh, on the number of films they will carry overall. So there are some, again, some unintended consequences of trying to cover all the permutations. I was just thinking in terms of a voluntary decision by the shop owner that he or she would make more money if they carried both versions, that there are those who would buy uh, Seven Brides and Seven Brothers if it were in the letterbox format, but they wouldn't buy it because it was a small screen format and they lost half of the effect. I think just in terms of the letterbox format, it would it would take a tremendous advertising campaign and a consumer education effort to, to, to educate people to what it was in the first place. No, I see that as a problem. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's quite okay. And in fact, what's wrong with that? Well, I suppose not, nothing's necessarily um, nothing's necessarily wrong with that. Um, but I, I think people, based on looking at a television screen, might feel cheated because the entire screen isn't filled. If there was a labeling requ uh, requirement uh, that said, you know, this film has been uh, uh, letterboxed. Uh, I think, I, we, I think our, our switchboard would, would light up like it's never lit up before. You don't, you being arrow here for a second, mm -hmm. um, don't have any difficulties with the sort of labeling uh, that the uh, companies do on boxes or other material? No, not at all, because we use the original art and place it on our own boxes. Okay. Mr. Wise, you had mentioned um, the specter of uh, going down a slippery slope uh, for some liability for video dealers or having to do extra advertising. As far as I know, there are no existing uh, bills, amendments, or proposals that would in any way require any labeling beyond that which is in the Film Registry Board uh, legislation. Do you know of any? That's, well, two, the two answers to your question. In the first place, in the course of the uh, Senate House conference, some compromise <coughs> proposals were advanced, which included expanding the disclosure requirements beyond the labeling on the package to any uh, advertising. And I believe that the uh, Katzenmeyer bill also includes a comparable requirement with regard to promotional materials apart from the package. Secondly, with regard to the uh, provision before it was changed, the House provision uh, prohibited <coughs> distribution uh, in its, the form finally passed the House, prohibited any distribution of items which did not carry the appropriate labeling, which meant that while we might not have had a liability put on a label, we faced the distinct prospect, especially with the situation there, where, as you know, in the early versions as passed by the House, the rules of the game could be changed in a kaleidoscopic fashion as to what was on the, even after the right. films had gone into distribution. Right. Uh, we could, our members easily could have been caught with inventory they had bought in perfect good faith, uh, which then suddenly, in effect, became contraband on their shelves and was non-distributable. Okay, there was just... no clear question as to whether they could be compensated. Uh, with regard to the bill as it was passed in conference and right. has now passed the House, that has been remedied, I, I think it's fair to say, in response to our expression of concern. You can live with the way it is now. Uh, well, I believe it needs Or you're going to live with it the way it is now <laughs> in any event. Uh, I believe I it essentially meets our concern. Yeah. Uh, one final question. There is um, an issue of Variety, uh, August 3rd, 1988, which says about colorization. Uh, more recently, the Video Software Dealers Association polled its membership on the subject and then decided for undisclosed reasons not to release its findings. Do you have anything more? Sure, that that's could... inaccurate. The, okay. the, uh, the SDA put out a press release indicating the results of the poll 
it was not a formal research document. It was basically a um, letter response, tear-off kind of response. The results were tabulated and, and made uh, public by VSDA, and uh, overwhelmingly the dealers indicated that, as I indicated in response to the question, that they opposed restraints because uh, such a significant number of their customers clearly wanted access to colorized uh, films uh, originally black and white. Okay, if you would mind giving us a copy of that? that yes, would, uh, <coughs> and thank you, Mr. Stevenson, for all of the cooperation that you gave us in responding <coughs> to our letter to you, too. That's helpful. Mr. Schwartz? Yeah, I also want to thank Mr. Stevenson. I think most of our questions are answered by the, we, we gave you a long list of questions to answer about your sales, and you voluntarily gave us the answer to a lot of your sales rental statistics and it was very helpful for us. Um, the one observation I might have about letterboxing is that if people don't know it exists, they, they will never know whether they like it or not. And um, I, I don't think that if it was forced on them, um, you're right, your switchboard would ring um, like crazy, but I think that gradually it might grow on them, it might not, but so far, except for two directors, um, there are three or four directors, there's not much chance to see that. And I think a second observation is something Mr. Wide said about um, space. That's a little troubling because I think if, uh, if in fact w one of the arguments for colorization uh, is that uh, viewers have choices, um, it's, it, there's a problem there in just physical space that Someday they might not have a choice because the colorized versions rent or sell more uh, than, I mean, it's, the statistics are really too early is what the bottom line is right now to really know. And it might just be that the colorized take off like crazy and there's not the shelf space or not the desire to continue carrying the other versions. Well, I'm assuming that uh, the uh, people that uh, some of the previous witnesses spoke about who have a strong interest in the pristine classic version will continue to provide, uh, you know, some consumer demand, I think is a question of degree. And I was only trying to point out that at some point, a proliferation of variations of a particular title does raise the space, do raise the space, uh, space consideration. Mm -hmm. One other comment I think I want to make is that I think that in our, in our company's case, depending on how letterboxing might evolve, certainly we would carry those or make them available to customers that would want them. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be more apt to be in a sales mode than it would be in a rental mode. Mm -hmm. um, finally, very quickly, um, Mr. Turner, in, uh, the Turner statement said that they will always make available black and white and color um, products for theatrical and TV markets, but that they would only make video products um, available in black and white were commercially practicable. Since your sales statistics, the sales statistics are pretty close to each other right now and the rentals are, are pretty close as well. I wonder if, if you have any fears about um, getting access. You don't have a space problem in most of your stores, they're pretty large. Um, and do you, do you foresee a day when, when you might have a problem getting access? It becomes less commercial, commercially practical practicable, but there is a small market, a small minority of people um, who still demand it, the consumer demand that you mentioned of a minority of people. Do you see any problems with that? I think, I think it's difficult to tell. If, if, for example, a particular title was released from the Turner Library that's not there now and it was only available in color, um, I think that we would, we would probably to satisfy that other demand is indicate that you you know you can buy the colorized version and watch it in black and white. I mean it's a simple adjustment on a, you know on your television to change it, and I think we would take that responsibility because we do have a, you know significant number of customers that will buy films and want them in their original form, and certainly with a colorized version you can always watch it in black and white. We, although we've heard some conflicting. Um, maybe, some, maybe not today, but in some of our other discussions about whether or not, in fact, by turning down the, the knob, the, you're seeing a, a, a uh, copy which, in which the contrast is as good as it could have been in other, in other versions, black and white versions. Well, I think, it, as with any technology, um, you know, in the, 
in the beginning of its introduction, there are always certain flaws that have to be worked out. And I would I would imagine in the future with the companies that that are um, that are using colorized techniques, um, will preserve that integrity and it will be there. I might add that if one really wants to pursue the principle of consumer choice, uh, if you have a family. Uh, with a number of children, uh, two parents who might well have some very strong opinions about whether they want to see the film in black and white or color, and being able to rent it in color and turn the knob on your dial to black and white, which my understanding for the overwhelming number of films, and certainly any in the future with current technology, is extremely close, if not identical, in terms of the values, is really the best way to preserve the alternative for the public to see either one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have no questions. I just thank you for your informative testimony. Thank you. Well, my God. Are you prepared to make a prediction on the outcome of the upcoming election based on <laughs> rentals, <laughs> rentals during the Democratic <laughs> Convention and the Republican Convention? Not, not today. I don't think. We'll, we'll be waiting. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. The next witness is Professor Peter Yazzie of American University, and my staff tells me that I should most definitely remind him of the time constraints. <laughs> <laughs> That's not that. Uh, That's the, fact that uh, the fact that uh, we are, our, our court stenographer uh, must leave at, uh, at 5.30. We'll, we'll be able to cover any overlap uh, on the videotape, but we do urge you to try to keep your remarks within the, uh, the 10 minute well, right. I have to. I have a class to teach at six, so I'm going to have to do my best as well. Me too. <laughs> I am a teacher of copyright law at American University Law School, which I guess qualifies me to speak about either nothing or everything, depending on one's point of view. I also have a fairly long-standing interest in the application of copyright principles to what might be called classic American motion pictures. I've, I've litigated some in the area and written some about the question. And that interest, in some sense, predates my years as a lawyer. Part of my misspent youth was devoted to watching and writing about movies and teaching film studies courses and running a couple of repertory revival motion picture houses. So. Although I can no longer claim to be a, a professional film student, I am jealously guarding my amateur status in the, in the root sense of the, of the word. In the interest of full disclosure, I should say something else, which is that I yield to no one <coughs> in my suspicion of the colorization technology and all its works. I'm one of those people who will go to extremes to view motion pictures in black and white original formats, believing that they are superior in aesthetic quality and in historical interest. And I'm more than that. I'm someone who will proselytize actively whenever given the opportunity in favor of those original forms and formats. I've said all this about myself, throwing my customary modesty to the wind, because I think it bears on the issue that I want to address. I think that it's the existence of people like me and our views that creates the colorization problem if one can be said to exist. That problem, it seems to me, is not so much one having to do with the interests of the makers of the motion pictures that are at risk from colorization, but with the interests of the audience who deserve a meaningful choice, who deserve to put it differently, and to use again a word that's been used, well used, I think, in all the testimony that I've heard this afternoon who deserve access. And what I want to suggest today, and what I argue at greater length in my prepared testimony, is that an approach to the colorization problem based on extending the concept of authorship and expanding the rights enjoyed by individual authors isn't likely to address effectively that public interest in access. I think it's important to remember, and you've certainly been reminded often enough this afternoon, that the copyright system has ultimately a public purpose. It exists in the end to further public access to works of creativity and not simply to recognize 
the contributions of creative workers. Generally speaking, in the history of English and American copyright law, we've had a lot of success in promoting those public interests by focusing our attention on the concept of individual authorship. But the concept of individual authorship isn't a universal solvent. Like all conceptual constructs, it has its limitations where utility is concerned. And I think in the case before us now, that concept may have, have reached the limits of its utility. If our concern is with public access to the black and white versions of motion pictures, then giving any group of private persons a waivable right to object to their colorization seems to me unlikely to produce the desired result, unlikely to promote the access which we are striving to assure. It's predictable, I think, even inevitable, that were such rights in the nature of moral rights to be created, they would, in most cases, for one reason or another, go unexercised. Now, the argument that filmmakers are somehow, in, in some real sense, some extra-legal sense, the authors of the movies they create, doesn't seem to me to compel the conclusion that they ought to be invested with private rights to object to colorization or to other alterations of those films. The concept of authorship, with all of its multiple associations, is after all not a real concept. It's a construct, a legal and cultural construct, which has been concocted over time, over the last 300 odd years or so, to serve a, a variety of important functions. It's important to remember, too, that outside of the legal arena, the utility of the concept of authorship as a means of coming to grips with works of creativity is being severely challenged. The notion that authors are linked to their works by some kind of intimate, unbreakable, umbilical connection that should survive the commercialization of those works, the notion that inheres in the moral rights philosophy is, I think, very much a byproduct of a particular vision of authorship, a vision that is a byproduct of romantic late 18th and early 19th century visions of the creative process. And that's a understanding of authorship that many contemporary critics are at least attempting to repudiate in favor of critical approaches that emphasize what might be called the sovereignty of the reader. The critics to whom I refer argue that the intentions of the creator of a work, even to the extent that we may be able to determine them, don't really matter, shouldn't really count, once that work has been released to the public, what we in our copyright jargon would term publication. For those critics, it's the audience member, the reader, the consumer or user who is ultimately responsible for determining a work's significance. Now, this is not the forum in which to debate the, the appropriateness of various visions of authorship in literary criticism. I mention them, these developments, because I think we should be careful about extending the coverage of copyright law and of traditional concepts of authorship based on unexamined cultural assumptions which may themselves be on their way to becoming outmoded. I think it's also important to remember that the authorship concept, as applied to motion pictures in particular, is quite a new one. When the film critics, French and then American of the 1950s and 1960s, developed this approach to discussing film literature, they were engaged in a campaign and this ploy, the introduction of the concept of authorship into the language of film criticism, had several very distinct and definite objectives. One was to raise the general level of the discussion and to promote serious interest in film as a visual art form, something which seemed to require the identification of film authors. Another was to provide a means, a mechanism, a vocabulary for talking about bodies of film in comparative and evolutionary terms. Another critical approach which is facilitated by the ability to identify an author. The means by which these various goals were accomplished was, to, re to repeat, through the identification of, of film authors, usually directors, and I think that that, that that campaign and that means accomplished a great deal and did a great deal 
to promote serious film study and serious film appreciation in the United States and elsewhere. Again, though, I think we should be careful about confusing this useful, essentially constructed notion of film authorship with some kind of external social reality to which we can refer as a source of guidance in a deliberation such as this one. There are some severe practical problems, too, in devising any solution to the problem of colorization, which is based on notions of authorship. In fact, of course, as has been pointed out on several occasions this afternoon, motion pictures result from a complex process of collaboration between various artistic and non-artistic participants in commercial filmmaking. And to single out a particular participant, or for that matter, particular participants in a process this complex, and to invest them with the characteristics of rights bearers on a general matter, is to invite difficulty. One of the things I do in, in the prepared version of my testimony that I won't repeat here in the interest of time is to talk a little bit about the concept of motion picture authorship in several foreign legal systems. Italy, France, and Germany, I think, are the ones that I mentioned. And I point out that far from giving us useful guidance in how to resolve the question of how to locate film authorship on a general basis for the purposes of the implementation of some scheme of moral rights, these foreign statutes seem to suggest the difficulty, if not the impossibility, of the enterprise. Each takes a different approach. Some are categorical. Some may take refuge behind presumptions, and some others leave the whole matter up to the courts to decide on a case-by-case -case basis. None of those examples from foreign law suggest that this problem would be easy to solve, if possible to solve, fairly and efficiently on a general basis in American law. For all these reasons, then, it seems to me that the colorization problem to which I referred before is unlikely to be addressed through an authorship-based moral rights solution. The solution that I think is required is one that I might term, which I, I think do term in my prepared remarks, a, a text-based solution, a solution that focuses on the work and on the audience interest in access to that work in its various forms, rather than on the putative author of that work. The most drastic text-based solution, of course, would be some form of absolute prohibition on colorization across the board. That approach, as satisfying as it might be in the short term to some audience members, would seem to me suspect in that it would fail to serve the access interests of other audience members. <coughs> a selective prohibition is, of course, a possibility, but there problems of choice arise. What will determine the contents of the list to be selectively safeguarded against <coughs> material alteration? Will it be the standards of elite film culture, the standards of commercial film culture, or some compromise between the two. We have, of course, in copyright, that thing which we refer to in passing all as a Bleistein problem. Well, it seems to me that the attempt to create a, a certified list of film classics for purposes of their preservation against alteration would raise, in effect, Bleistein problems of the first order. There's the labeling approach, which has the same shortcomings if done on a selective basis, and which if done on a gen general basis has the drawback of doing nothing affirmative to promote access, save to create conditions which might, at least in theory, permit market mechanisms to bring about the eventual increase of pressure for access. What I described toward the end of my prepared remarks are a few of what I th would think of as the, the utopian solutions to promoting the problem of access through text-based approaches. The imposition of some requirement on either film distributors or retailers to make both original and altered versions available to the public. The creation of government programs to promote and support the availability to interested members of the public in the, or 
the, the availability to interested members of the public of the original versions of black and white motion pictures. Professor Belton's suggestion of the National Film Clearinghouse fits very well into that general category of what I would term utopian solutions, utopian text-based solutions. Perhaps, indeed, it's the most practical of the imaginable text-based solutions which have yet been proposed. I offer these not because I have any judgment to give as to their political feasibility. Some, I'm sure, would be out of the question. Others, with modifications, might be within potential political reach. I offer these suggestions because it seems to me that it is important to try in a deliberation such as this one to focus as clearly on po as possible on what is really at stake. And some consideration of these perhaps utopian text-based solutions seems to me potentially useful in redirecting our attention from what seems to me an essentially false interest of analysis of, the, of this case, one that puts major emphasis on the stakes of filmmakers to what seems to me a more appropriate interest analysis, one that focuses squarely on the access interests of audience members. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You uh, just made it under the wire. <laughs> His clock stopped. <laughs> Uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Patrick for his question. I, ha I have no questions. Mr. Schwartz? Uh, no, it, I will, uh, I'll, I'll probably ask my questions of my former professor the way I always do by phone, if I have any. It's a great day when I have a chance to do it in the public eye, but in the interest of time, I'll spare us all. Ms. Schrader. Well, I'll join in also. Thank you for your comments. We'll certainly reflect on them. No questions. Mr. No, no, it, it's, uh, it's a schneid or, a <laughs> or however you want to call it. Um, but I can't resist commenting that uh, I hadn't realized until you gave your own that what you were really were saying was that we should shift away from the pursuit of false answers to, uto to seek utopian answers. But <laughs> I think that there's actually some more practical stuff in what you've said in the written statement. Utopia is not quite the right word. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I trust you understand that this means that I am going to have to go teach civil procedure. I don't thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It's a tough life. And uh, our last panel, we are extremely pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Thomas Dreyer and uh, Silke von Belinsky from the Max Planck Institute in Munich. Uh, they uh, get the prize for having traveled furthest. Uh, for the, uh, the hearing, uh, and uh, we welcome you and uh, urge you to uh, make the most of your time. Thank you very much. Maybe first of all I should uh, perhaps uh, uh, briefly introduce the Max Planck Institute. I know that's necessary, but uh, may not be known that widely in the United States. We are one of the institutes of the Max Planck Society, uh, which basically is a non-profit association organized under private law and which is financed by state and federal money. Um, we are doing basic legal research in the field of foreign and international patent, copyright, and competition law in Munich. Now, since um, we didn't bring any video um, and the presentation all it seemed to be somewhat dry, as we call it, uh, we decided to go uh, ahead with our testimony by doing some alternate speech like uh, piecing the whole thing up and uh, doing uh, 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 alternative uh, speech. On the other hand, if also we do some time compressing this in this respect, probably will be of no harm. First of all, we are the authors of the paper, and second, uh, you got the full text available, so access should be secured. If now we jump right, in, right away into the uh, legal issues, which um, today probably have not been addressed um, to that large extent, um, we should consider that the colorization of motion pictures does not give rise to just one legal question, but after all, raises separate, several intricate legal issues. Um, if one presents, tries to present them in logical order, um, they may be summarized somewhat as follows. To begin with, we have to look at the people who are involved in making a picture and who might have a stake in question in terms of authorship or in terms of moral rights. They would be, first of all, the authors, 
and here we would have to distinguish between the authors of pre-existing work on the one hand and on the other hand the authors of a cinematographic work as such. So this group of authors, this group of authors is joined then by the performing artists, mostly of course the actors, although there may be the case of a musician playing some music uh, uh, and it's filmed while he does that. But basically it's the authors of pre-existing work, the authors of a cinematographic work and the actors. Now, if we look at the situation of the authors, as well as of pre-existing works, as well as of the cinematographic work itself, the first question, of course, um, would be uh, to find out whether or not to colorize, colorize a black and white movie amounts to the preparation of a derivative work. If so, colorization would be subject to an exclusive right of the respective authors, provided, of course, the film and the pre-existing works have not yet fallen into the public domain. The next question then would be, to what extent these original authors have transferred or assigned their exclusive right to colorize the film to the producer? This may have happened either because the producer is considered the original author, or as in most of the European countries, maybe by statutory presumption or by contract. If we look at the possibility of transferring these rights by contract, um, an additional question in this respect would be how far does broad contractual language go? Because most of the uh, pictures in question um, have been uh, uh, made some years ago at a time when colorization had not yet been known. So you wouldn't find any contract, if you find one at, uh, at all, as we just heard. Um, who would make specific reference to colorization. Here now comes into play something which might be totally, um, uh, which Americans might totally be unused to, and that is um, the question of the new ways of exploitation. Um, under most of the European laws, the idea is that you cannot deal away your exploitation rights as far as new ways of exploitation are concerned. You shall have um, you shall retain the power to bargain on these new exploitation forms whenever they show up. If one then comes to the conclusion that authors of pre-existing works as well as of the film are no longer the owners of the exclusive right, because one says that colorization finally does not amount to a new form of exploitation since the uh, exploitation is done by TV and by video, then still there would be the issue of moral rights. In this respect, of course, the first issue would be whether the alteration is detrimental to the author's reputation and whether therefore in violation of the author's right of integrity. Finally, another question, or the last question on the moral rights issue would be uh, to what degree authors contractually might waive their moral rights, either in advance or uh, afterwards. Now this situation, as briefly outlined, is basically similar for actors who have to be considered as performing artists. In general, they have the right to authorize the reproduction of their performances, and this may well include the right to authorize an adaptation. Moreover, in most of the uh, West European countries now, performing artists also enjoy personality rights. However, several copyright laws restrict or exclude these rights of performing artists, if the performances form part of a cinematographic work. <coughs> In practice, however, two issues have to be added. The first one is a rather technical one. Of course, whenever you try to figure out uh, what the situation under a copyright law is, you have to go to the current act. On the other hand, the current act might tell you that you have to go back to the situation, um, how the law was when the film actually had been shot and when the respective contracts have been concluded. Now this for the black and white films becomes particularly important since uh, quite a few of the European states enacted new copyright legislation at around the 50s and 60s of our century. The second issue, which in practice is much more important and is a very tricky um, question is, um, it's like a classic conflict of laws problem. And the question here is, which national law would govern the respective issues involved. For example, in his capacity as an author, 
can invoke the provisions of a foreign country's copyright? And according to what law would foreign courts decide who is to be regarded as an author? I mean, the case of Asphalt Jungle, Jun Asphalt Jungle um, which gave rise to the first litigation in France, is a very perfect example of that, and we'll come back later to that. It's obvious that no existing copyright um, especially deals with the issues of, um, of uh, colorization. Um, first of all, colorization is a quite new technology, and second, of course, it's such a specific question that the more general rules of concept I would not deal with it expressly unless a blatant inadequacy of the existing principle uh, had become apparent or an urgent need for special rulemaking had been uh, uh, shown. Now this was like a summary of the legal issues to be involved. We will now give you um, an overview of how these issues have been addressed and tried to be solved by first the international conventions, second on the German law, and third how the French courts decided. I hope that time will permit us to cover all that. Um, the question of how the framework of national protection, uh, what that looks like, should be all the more of interest since the U.S. is about to adhere to the Berne Convention. And with that, I give the word to my colleague. Yeah, so first, I'm going to speak about uh, the situation under the Berne Convention about, uh, of authors and their economic rights. Under the Berne Convention, member states have an obligation to protect uh, both cinematographic works as well as the respective literary, musical or other pre-existing works. Duration has to be for the life of the author plus 50 years in the case of pre-existing works and in the case of cinematographic works, however, member states are free to grant protection only for 50 years after the work has been made available to the public with the consent of the author. Excuse me, um, could you pull the microphone a little bit closer? Okay. Uh, Thank you. Protection has to be granted to works of authors who are nationals or residents of a member state and to works of non-qualifying authors which for the first time or within 30 days of first publication have been published in a member state. In addition, enjoys protection any cin cinematographic work, the maker of which has its headquarters or habitual residence in one of the member states. Since the Berne Convention only deals with the protection of foreign works, it does not affect the protection granted by a state to works for which, according to the rules of the Berne Convention, the state is considered the country of origin. Protection in the country of origin is and remains governed by domestic law. In general, the country of origin is the country where work has first been published. For details, uh, one should uh, look at Article 5, Paragraph 4, Berne Convention, which contains a special provision for cinematographic works first published in a non-member state to the effect that the member state in which the maker has his headquarters or his habitual residence will be considered the country of origin. In any member state other than the country of origin, foreign authors enjoy the rights which the member state's respective laws grant to their own nationals, and this is the famous principle of national treatment as laid down in Article 5, Paragraph 1, Bern Convention. Consequently, the extent of protection as well as the man means of redress afforded, afforded to the author to protect his rights shall be governed exclusively by the laws of the country where protection is claimed. However, in addition to this, foreign authors can jure conventionis invoke the minimum rights granted by the convention. Of interest in respect of the colorization of black and white motion pictures are First, the right of adaptation in Article 12, Berne Convention defined as, I quote, the exclusive right of authorizing adaptations, arrangements, and other alterations of their works, end of quotation. And uh, second, the special cinematographic adaptation right contained in Article 14, paragraph 1, little i, and uh, paragraph 2, Berne Convention as to authors of pre-existing works, and in Article 14 bis, Paragraph 1, Berne Convention, as to authors of the cinematographic works. The former group of authors 
has the right to authorize the cinematographic adaptation of their work, and the former and the latter group both, enjoy the right also to authorize, I quote, the adaptation into any other artistic form of a cinematographic production. At first sight, it may not all be clear whether colorization amounts to another artistic form of a film. However, since Article 14 bis, paragraph 2 little b, Sun Convention, expressly lists subtitling and dubbing as acts generally <coughs> reserved to authors, it may be inferred that under the Bern Convention, colorization as well as, as well constitutes an act subject to the author's authorization. In practice, however, this does not have a decisive effect, since the Bern Convention does not preclude member states to enact legal presumptions, providing that, absent any contractual agreement to the contrary, authors have assigned their adaptation rights to the producer. National legislation only has to leave the general contractual freedom to the authors to reserve the rights. And now I'm going to speak about moral rights. However, independently, independently of the author's economic rights, and even after the transfer of the said rights, the author also enjoys moral rights. Of interest here is that he may, I quote, object to any distortion, mutilation, or other modification of a work which would be prejudicial to his honor or reputation. End of quotation. This is uh, laid down in Article 6, B, yeah. Paragraph 1. Member States of the Bern Union have an obligation to grant these rights, at least for the term of protection of the economic rights. The Bern Convention does not further specify what acts acts to amount to such a distortion, mutilation or modification, nor does it say what exactly is to be considered as prejudicial to an author's honor or reputation. However, it should be noted that the notion of other modification covers a broad range of changes made. The main focus, <coughs> therefore, will always be on the question of detriment to an author's honor or reputation. As to the question of whether or not moral rights may be waived, the Bern Convention is silent. It should be noted, however, that moral rights are inherently linked to the personality of the author. According to continental European authors' rights, tradition which has made its way into the text of the Bern Convention, and therefore moral rights may not be assigned nor waived as such. However, the courts in most of the European countries do accept that the author may either transfer or waive the power to exercise his moral rights. However, each moral right has what is called a positive nucleus, which is regarded as being so vital to the expression of the respective personality that any waiver in this respect would be regarded null and void. Let me very briefly say something to the performing artists uh, which, who, who are not protected by the Berne Convention, but by the Rome Convention. And uh, as, as far as actors are concerned, the Rome Convention for the Protection of Performers, Producers of Phonograms and Broadcasting Organizations only deals with economic rights and does not contain provisions on moral rights. However, member states are free to also grant moral rights to performing artists on a national level. Also, the Rome Convention does not regulate the adaptation or subsequent modification of the performance of a performing artist. Even if one would bring colorization if, uh, within the reproduction of a fixation of a performance made for purposes different from those for which the performers gave their consent, this is the reproduction right laid down in Article 7 of Rome Convention. This article would not apply where, in the case of a cinematographic work, the performer once had given his consent to the incorporation of his performance into the cinematographic work. This is laid down in Article 19 of the Rome Convention. Okay, let's now turn to uh, what the law under the German Copyright Act might look like 
Under German law, no court had yet to speak on the issue of the colonization. And I think this is by no means a surprise, because if you look at the market figures, um, there are, if my information, which I got from the German video industry, are correct, currently about 8,000, around 8,000 titles available um, on the German video market. And, but there are only four titles in colorized version which have been marketed so far. One of them is Way Out West by uh, St. Laurel Oliver Hardy, and the other English one uh, is Little Shop of Horrors. But no German films, to your um, knowledge. No, <laughs> I got it here. There are, yes, there is one German film, um, which looks like a, which I don't know personally, but it looks like a comedy out of the uh, 50s or 40s, something like that. Colorized with the consent of the, uh, the director um, and this screenwriter? I do not know. Um, it's sure that in German TV, no full-length film has been uh, aired. Um, however, uh, we have something along the lines of that uh, informative uh, thing which we just saw on, on video cassettes, uh, which probably would be covered by a citation uh, or freedom of the press uh, uh, under such a uh, theory. However, um, I think there's a clear uh, situation, or given the situation under German law, one may uh, summarize, come, arrive to quite uh, decisive conclusions. First of all, under the current act, it may well be assumed that colorization is, in fact, an adaptation or transformation of a cinematographic work. Consequently, authors whose creative contribution to the film will be altered by the colorization process itself would enjoy the right to authorize the colorization process. Moreover, authors be they authors of pre-existing works or authors of the film itself, have the right to exploit any cinematographic adaptations or transformations of the cinematographic work. However, now, in order to facilitate film distribution, the German Act contains legal presumptions to the effect that, uh, that authors of pre-existing works, as well as authors of the film, uh, transfer these rights to the producer by signing the production contract. Can I interrupt for just one second, uh, Dr. Dreyer? We do have these, uh, these uh, production problems ourselves, and uh, the uh, court reporter does have to leave at this moment. We will continue to, trans mm -hmm. to uh, record on the, on the videotape and be able to transcribe your remarks mm -hmm. uh, uh, subsequent, uh, subsequently for the, for the record, so if nothing is lost. But we do have to provide uh, the opportunity for the court reporter to uh, retrieve her car before the uh, authorities claim it. And uh, Professor Patry uh, uh, himself uh, has uh, some logistical problems. He has to teach a class tonight, too. And uh, we have to excuse him. But uh, he's given me the questions that, that he was to uh, ask. And, uh, and I, will, uh, I will ask them in his stead. Thank you very much. Yes. You may continue. continue. Thank you okay. very much. So we're at the point that, that also in the German law, they do have the right to um, uh, 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 to authorize the exploitation of any cinematographic adaptation or transformation of the film, but that the German Act, in order to facilitate film distribution, does contain um, legal presumptions to the effect that the authors have transferred these exploitation rights to the producer by signing the respective production contract. However, and there comes the important drawback, which also might not be known to the United States uh, uh, film uh, industry, um, this uh, general legal presumption knows an important limitation. Um, and it means that it only applies to the manner of exploitation known at the time the contract has been concluded. Uh, with regard to authors of the cinematographic works itself, um, that's what the law clearly says. The law is silent in this respect as to authors of pre-existing works, but here the general rule, as stated in section 31, uh, paragraph 4 of the Act should apply, according to which, and I quote, a license purporting to grant rights with respect to unknown means of utilization and any obligations with respect thereto 
shall have no legal effect. The question of paramount interest, therefore, is whether colorization does constitute such an unknown means of utilization as the law frames it. Here, of course, different arguments might be drawn up. Industry, on the one hand, argues that colorization is not an unknown means of utilization, since films in the colorized version are exploited in as much the same way as their black and white originals, that is, by video sale, rental, and by TV. Moreover, it's argued that technical corrections and modifications of light and color have always been used in the post-production process, and have therefore already been known at the time uh, the, uh, the, the traditional film material had been created, which even might be true for some black and white filming where some color corrections had been done in the post-production process. On the other hand, one might draw up the argument that the underlying rationale of the general rule um, is to prevent the author from and let him participate in any further exploitation, the economic impact of which he couldn't have judged and foreseen at the time when bargaining for remuneration. The material test under the rule is whether or not there is a new and technically as well as economically distinct and separable way of exploitation. Since industry itself considers the distribution of colorized black and white motion pictures a distinct area of marketing, albeit within the existing categories of video and TV, it may be argued that colorization has to be regarded as a new form of exploitation. As stated, the result then would be that the legal presumptions of the German Copyright Act would not apply and that the producer of old black and white films or the owner of old contractual rights, although being the owner of the adaptation rights, would need additional authorization from the respective author. It should be added in this respect that under this theory of the unknown means of exploitation, anyone who only owns rights um, prior to the date where TV or video became known would have to bargain for TV or video exploitation anyway. So if you have an old black and white film, you're the producer of an old black and white film, let's say it was shot in 1930, um, and your contract dated from that time, and you had no additional further agreement with the respective authors, you could not go ahead in marketing them by TV or by video. Uh, you would need... Okay. <laughs> so, um, the respective dates for TV uh, by court decisions have been set at around <coughs> 1939, and for video only in the early 70s. Well, this should be, it doesn't have anything to do with the colorization process, but it shows you that if you have no additional contractual um, agreement with the respective authors and you want a TV or video market old black and white films, you have to bargain in you anyway. Um, this was basically the question of um, the economic rights. Uh, maybe one sentence to sum it up. Um, colorization does amount to adaptation you probably do need authorization. This authorization, uh, however, will be given by general legal presumption unless you consider colorization a new form of exploitation. Now let's turn to the moral rights. Yes. In the case the economic rights are, uh, don't help the author, there's still a second weapon, namely the moral rights. Um, since works are inherently re related to and emanating from an author's personality, the author under section 14 of the German Copyright Act, as well as under most of the other European copyright laws, has the, I quote again, right to prohibit any distortion or any other mutilation of his work, which would prejudice his lawful intellectual or personal interest in the work and of quotation. Here also the act, in order to facilitate exploitation of the film, restricts the moral rights of film authors as well as authors of pre-existing works to, I quote, only gross distortions or other gross injuries of their works or of their contributions and the quotation. Moreover, with regard to cinematographic works, authors, I quote, in the exercise of this right must take into account the respective legit legitimate interests of the other authors as well as the legitimate interests of the producer and the quotation. 
as is said in section 93 of the Act. This, however, does not mean that an author would necessarily be barred from exercising his moral right just in order not to hinder the exploitation of a film. According to what has just been said, the debate focuses on the main issue of whether or not colorization does amount to a gross distortion or to gross injur injury. It will, of course, be a matter for the court to decide this question in each individual case. However, several criteria can be retained. First of all, colorization does not alter some pre-existing work and some film contributions at all. This would be true, for example, for the novel on which a film is based, the dialogue especially written for the film, or any music, whether especially created with regard to the film or not. Also, the work of the cutter seems, if at all, only to a minor extent be concerned. This may be different for those who created the film props and become highly arguable in the case of the cinematographer and the director. It seems that whenever the special way of lightning, setting of shadows, contrast and the like form an essential part of the artistic creation, colorization will most likely amount to gross distortion. This is certainly true with regard to expression of film, but also with regard to black and white films of later periods, uh, for which John Huston's Maltese Falcon or Astral Jungle might be a um, perfect example. Moreover, it would be beyond doubt that <coughs> colorizing Woody Allen's Manhattan, which purposely had been shot in black and white, or Edgar Wright's Heimat, which in its original version cut colorized and black and white film sequences, would constitute such gross distortions. Whether the same would be true for the less artistic B and C movies, which quite often out of financial necessity or just because color film material didn't exist yet were shot in black and white, seems at least arguable. But here too it should be borne in mind that the shooting in black and white material almost inherently set specific criteria for the choices to be made, but which were creative choices nevertheless. This smaller right under German copyright law may not be transferred. However, as I said already uh, under the Bern Convention, the courts do recognize a waiver to the effect that the power to exercise the moral right may be transferred for example, to the producer. But the validity of such a waiver is limited to what does not form part of the so-called positive nucleus of the moral right. Any gross distortion or other gross injuries, however, certainly form part of this positive nucleus and consequently corresponding waivers, which have not even been common in German legal practice, would have to be considered void. From the foregoing, it may be concluded that under German copyright law, at least those authors whose artistic creation has found ex ex its expression in the characteristics of black and white shooting, that mainly the director, eventually the <coughs> cinematographer, could prevent colorization of their films. This may be on the grounds of their adaptation rights, since colorization may have to be regarded regarded as a new form of exploitation to the effect that it does not come within the scope of old assignments of the adaptation right, or they certainly may prevent colorization on the grounds of their moral right. Again, very short to the performing artists, should be noted that for actors the situation is somewhat different. Here, an analysis of the gravity of prejudice caused by colorization has to be based on the following criteria. First, one might argue that colorization does in general affect the performance of an actor who presented him or herself to a camera knowing that the shooting was done in black and white. We just heard, that the, heard the example of Cary Grant with his fabulous contractual agreement. And wouldn't it be also de detrimental to marry Lena Dietrich's acting and appearance? if today she would just let me be colorized. Second, however, one might assume that in a considerable number of cases, there's no gross distortion of an actor's performance, since large parts of its like 
texture, voice, etc. remain unchanged by the colorization. Again, however, this may be different if colorization does its effect and materially it distorts an actor's mimic acting or where the young hero in the colorized version appears pale as death. Now I pass the, the, again the word to Thomas Dreyer about the French copyright law. So maybe in the end we uh, add some further detail about the uh, very often referred to French court ruling, which unfortunately so far has only been in a preliminary proceeding and uh, therefore did not have to try the case on the full merit. Um, only few issues therefore have been addressed, however, some clarification has been brought about. Now the facts of the case are as follows. Um, the fifth French TV channel, La Cinq, um, had scheduled for June 26 a program on the subject of film colorization. What they intended was to show the colorized version of John Huston's Asphalt Jungle, which had been produced in 1950 by Metro Goldwyn Mayer, um, and La Cinq intended to have that followed by a feature containing information about the techniques of colorization process, including examples, etc., etc. Eventually, discussions should follow, and finally, after the colorized version had been shown, the original black and white version of the film should be aired. The heirs of the late John Huston filed suit and tried to enjoin La Cinq from transmitting the colorized version of this or any other film by John Huston, which had been colorized by the aid of this new technology. The claim was based on deceased John Huston's moral rights as director, who shortly before his death, we just saw it on uh, movies and uh, the uh, video screen, uh, at the occasion of the colorization of the Maltese Falcon, had expressed his disapproval of the colorization process. Uh, the defending TV channel, joined by MGM successor Turner, uh, which was, as we just heard, responsible for the colorization, brought forward several arguments. First, defendants argued, and we already heard it, also heard it today, that the integrity of the work was not violated, since the colorization process had not been applied to the original negative or film material itself. Second, it was argued that according to the terms of the employment contract and of the instrument transfer transferring the rights from John Huston to MGM, Turner, as MGM's successor, now owned all exploitation rights. Third, under US law, it was argued, um, which according to defendants should govern the question of authorship, MGM from the very beginning had to be regarded as the original author since the film was a work made for hire. Now the Tribunal de Grande Instance de Paris, uh, of Paris as court of first instance ruled on June 24, which means two days before the whole thing was to be aired, and did not follow the defendant's arguments. <coughs> um, the court considered the issues involved too complicated to be decided um, on, uh, uh, on the merits and therefore uh, and to be decided in a preliminary proceeding and therefore only granted a temporary relief. However, according to the uh, uh, provision in the new civil procedure court, um, which allows the court or gives the court discretion to grant uh, whatever measure it uh, considers necessary to prevent imminent damage, the court uh, made an inquiry whether such imminent damage might occur to the interests of John Huston. And the court argued that irreparable, irreparable damage might well result for plaintiffs since given the particular care devoted to the research of contrast by a very considerate choice of the colors film, which then turn out in several gray shades in a black and white movie, moral rights of John Huston as director of the film might well be violated. This interest, uh, the court held, was overriding defendants' monetary interest with regard to the cost of extensive program advertising, which would ensue if the program could not be aired. Defendants immediately appealed, and the very next day, on June 25, the Paris Court of Appeals confirmed the lower court's ruling by adding, however, some clarification. First of all, the Court of Appeals held that the heirs of John Huston did have standing to sue in France in a copyright litigation, irrespective of the fact 
that the contracts between Houston and MGM are governed by US law. It also seems, although it's not quite clear, <coughs> that the court also was of the opinion that French law should as well govern the substantive question of authorship. Second, the Court of Appeals very clearly stated that the lower court was not at fault considering polarization a violation of the author's moral rights. It also concluded that the contractual clause contained in the agreement between Houston and MGM, by which the uh, adaptation rights were transferred, could not possibly have taken into account the process of polarization which did not exist at the time. Finally, another argument was brought forward by the court saying that the showing of the colorized version on TV might cause confusion in the minds of the public as to the true nature of the film. And in order to avoid such confusion, the court held even explanatory statements would not suffice. The first thing which is obvious, of course, is that neither court responded to a defendant's argument that the colorization process did not alter the original negative itself. Um, there seems to be in the United States somewhat a misconception about the uh, uh, notion of a work. Uh, the alteration of the original negative may have to do something with film preservation. However, if we talk about moral rights in relation to a work, it's not the material object, the material copy we are talking about, but it's the work understood as the immaterial creation. And this is affected irrespectively of whether you apply the colors to the original negative or to any videotape taken from it. It seems then that the Paris Court of Appeals had quite a firm opinion as to effects of colorization upon authors' economic and moral rights under French copyright law. Moreover, the Court of Appeals seems to be quite determined to have French moral rights applied even if the work in question has been subject to a US-American contractual agreement. <coughs> This, and that's very interesting, to some extent corrects an earlier decision by the fourth chamber of the Paris Court of Appeals, which Mr. Nolan made reference to. It was the case of Röwe versus uh, against the uh, Walt Disney Company, uh, where the question of the aristocrat was involved, and where, in this case, um, decided uh, in 1986, the court had refused plaintiff to invoke French moral rights, where the contract transferring the copyright and together with it any exploitation or adaptation rights had been governed exclusively by British law. Also in this earlier decision the Paris Court of Appeals had held that moral rights only to a very limited extent be part of the French order of public and therefore would have mandatory force overriding the application of British law. However if one compares these two decisions it seems likely that the second one, the Walt Disney decision, I mean the earlier one, um, is not really free of doubt since it leads to a negation of moral rights by conflict of law rules. And this effect would undermine the principle of national treatment as it's contained in the international conventions. <coughs> According to that principle, a foreigner, in respect of works for which he is protected under the convention, can claim the same rights which the respective country grants to its own nationals. Um, as uh, at the moment I was preparing that statement, it was not yet clear whether the case involving John Houston Asphalt General would be settled or would be tried on the merits or not. That's the state of affairs in France. And now just for a very brief conclusion after this very long, I must admit that uh, this uh, topic is very, uh, raises very uh, difficult legal issues very long statement, I would um, like to summarize the main three legal questions in the question of colorization of film. The first is, does colorization itself amount to adaptation subject to the author's consent? And is exploitation of a colorized black and white film subject to the consent of the authors of pre-existing works of the cinematic cinematographic work and or of the actors as performing artists. The second question is, who owns originally or by way of legal presumption or of contractual agreement the respective adaptation and exploitation rights? And at last, the third one, probably the most controversial of all three questions, 
does colorization in a given case violate author's moral rights? And if so, to what degree does the answer to this third question depend on the artistic value of each film concerned? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, uh, for uh, a very uh, profound statement and one that will be an important part of the record. I, uh, I have a, a host of questions to ask. Uh, I, I, in the interest of time constraints, I won't ask all of them, but, uh, but I would like to ask, uh, ask some of them. Are there any circumstances in Germany or in France uh, that you know of uh, in which the uh, producer would be considered the author of the film? Even if the the, the the director was clearly subservient uh, to the producer in every material respect, um, under German law, the producer um, would never be considered the author of the cinematographic work. What he has is he gets some exploitation rights. Um, this is the only question actually you can infer from the legal act who actually are the authors of a uh, film um, is not clearly stated and laid down as such. There's a majority view um, on who should be the author of the film and who should be considered the author of a pre-existing work. Um, what the producer gets is he gets assigned several rights, mostly by legal presumption or by contract, and he also gets a certain um, protection, performance rights protection on his own for the organizational and uh, financial effort he does undertake. And who else uh, under German law is entitled to exercise their moral rights under the under the Berne Convention and wander under German law? Um, it's every author, I mean anyone who is uh, to be considered as an author. Um, if you have co-authorship, um, every um, author can exercise his moral rights and there is even an argument that uh, a co-author could exercise the moral rights of a fellow co-author even if his own contribution would not be altered. It's a very, not many decisions or if any about that, um, but if you have co-authorship and you want to alter the work of co-authorship, then you have to get permission basically from all co-authors, even if what you change and what you alter is only the contribution of one of the co-authors. And by, if you turn the argument around, you might conclude that even one of the co-authors whose contribution is not altered as such may raise his finger and say, I object to the alteration of the contribution of another co-author. So even if the, uh, the, uh, the other co-author agreed to it. For instance, the screenwriter could object to the colorization. Um, yes and no. I mean, the theory is correct. However, it should be noticed that under majority view um, are only considered co-authors of the film those authors whose contribu contribution to the film cannot be independently marketed. So that would do away with the music score writer, even if the music is, is expressly written for the film, because you can market the music apart. Also, probably, the screenplay as such might be marketable. At least you can detach it from the film without doing harm to the film. So in some of the cases, maybe even in most of the cases, the film would turn out not to be a work of co-authorship, because the only one person left who did a viable uh, um, uh, contribution as an author would be the director. Well, how about the, uh, the controversy between Jean-Luc Godard and, and his cinematographer? Who exercises the moral right there? I think they would come down to the question whether both did um, creative contributions, which would, about, uh, which would be a question for the courts to find, fact, factual question. And then, of course, you have a real interest if you have two co-authors, um, and they, of course, have to cooperate, and you cannot you withhold up the German under the German law. You cannot withhold your consent to any alteration in bad faith. 
and uh, uh, this consent obligation, so to speak, uh, may be enforced uh, by legal proceedings. Give me an example of bad faith. Um, let's say uh, we two sit together, we produce a book. Um, I don't know, you write the first part, I write the second part. Um, and it comes out as a single book, and then we have the second edition. Second edition needs some minor updating, which really doesn't harm to any of us. You want to go ahead with it, and I say, come on, I don't want it any longer, I'm, I'm fed up with that stuff. Um, you probably could enforce me um, doing, I mean, that little effort to uh, not to hinder your contribution uh, to be away from the market uh, within that uh, common co-authored work. We have, we have in our law this system of balancing interest, uh, interests. I mean, it's not at all that strict. Uh, we made just reference to that other provision saying that while exercising your right, um, the authors have to uh, look to each other's interests and they also have to balance their interests with the producer's interests because you always have these like several parties involved. Um, all we are saying is that this requirement of balancing interests does not in any case, in every respect, um, oblige the author of a film to give way and to give in only to facilitate and to enable the producer to go ahead with produ this uh, production a uh, distribution. Um, on the other hand, of course, the distribution interest of a producer certainly is of major concern. I mean, the whole set of rules in that field is drawn so that distribution is facilitated. Um, in this respect, you only could have some doubts um, because colorization, the question is, does it really uh, form part of what initially has been uh, uh, understood or intended as a, the distribution of a film? That it forms part of distribution, I mean, probably nobody would, would doubt that. I was struck by the, by the fact that you thought that the question of uh, whether colorization of a film would amount to a, a gross distortion, uh, whether, whether that, that question would turn on whether or not the, uh, uh, there was a, a large degree of artistry in the film, whether it was a grade B or C film or, or a, a, a quality, quality film. Uh, that, that's, that's a difficult concept for me to appreciate. Uh, as a practical matter, uh, would the question of a, a moral rights violation hinge upon the, the degree of aesthetic or artistic quality of the original work, which was uh, allegedly mutilated, or is the cultural quality of the mutilated work uh, a question that goes to the, the, the damages that are assessed at the end of the process? Um, I'm right now uh, not uh, very sure about uh, your question. I was wondering whether or not the, the quality of the original film yeah. goes to the, to the resolution of the question uh, as to whether or not there was a violation of the moral rights or whether or not it goes to a question of the amount of damages that the, that the, uh, uh, the wronged party would be awarded after the, after the, uh, the determination of the violation. Um, well, I mean, in this concept, what I've uh, brought with the artistic um, worth of the film, it's arguable, I know, but um, in any case, you have to find criteria, and the uh, Berne Convention doesn't say anything about the criteria, so. Mm -hmm. um, you said that a judge might be able to find the, yeah, would uh, have this, to this question, but in this country, a jury would have to find that question. Well, I know this is a general problem and when uh, the law is very broad uh, or has a broad language and the judge has to uh, argue or to, to find criteria and to um, um, find a decision on such kind of question, what is uh, related more uh, less to law uh, or to logic than to um, estimate or worth or um, maybe taste even. I know there's a problem, but in this area, there won't be any um, logical uh, criteria or very mathematic criteria you can um, um, use to make a decision. <coughs> so you just can try to 
find out what is common sense, common taste of uh, of uh, standard of quality. Yeah. Well, and the only one could assume that uh, author or director of a film or cinematographer who is uh, of a very high art artistic standard um, has uh, more tight concepts of what he's doing when he realizes uh, this, uh, his ideas uh, and when he that he m most often puts his um, or has really ideas where other people wouldn't have ideas and tries to realize it, uh, them in for example in um, making different shadows and so on and so all this would be um, made by intent and consciously and consequently when this would be uh, mutilated there would be more harm or one would, would care, uh, one could better uh, pretend that more rights are um, Um, <laughs> violated when a work is colorized. Mr. Schwartz? I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you both. I think the paper will be very helpful for our study. Appreciate it. Schrader? I'd like to explore a little bit this question of new utilizations, if I may, to see if I understand your analysis of, uh, of German law as it affects uh, the colorization issue and, and, and similar uh, adaptations of film. Uh, and I'm, I'm really just exploring this issue to ask your opinion. I realize as lawyers that uh, uh, absent definitive court decisions, there may not be any really settled law about it, but just, just to explore the matter. As I understand uh, your analysis, it seems very likely that a colorized film would be an adaptation which is subject to the exclusive authorization right of the authors of the film, which would of course generally be def defined by national law, but there would be uh, a number of authors, certainly the director. Uh, you also suggested, I believe, that uh, depending on the age of the film, if, for example, it were a pre-1939 film, then the, in order to show the film on television, you would have to have the express authorization of the, the author, say the director, uh, that one could not interpret a contract that had been entered into uh, before 1939 as covering television uses. Uh, obviously, if the director is alive, you would have to seek that person or the heirs, the heirs authorization. Um, do, then what, hap what if the film has been authorized for showing on television? Do you mean that it's been authorized as a black and, wo and, black and white film? And that authorization would not extend to the the colorized version, that there would have to be a separate authorization for the colorized version even after there had been a, an express authorization to show the black and white on television. Uh, the point I wanted to make is that once it has been authorized to be shown on TV, and now the question is whether or not a colorized version can also be shown on TV, um, the question to be asked and the, the legal discussion to be followed is exactly the same process as we do for the question whether you can show it on TV or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all looked upon as in terms of does the way of exploitation amount to a new form of exploitation unknown at the time the contract had been concluded. Well, let's put it this way around. You have a film prior to 39. Um, you bargained for um, TV rights 1950. Um, then today you will show that film in black and white and in the colorized version on TV. You may do so in black and white, certainly, because 1950 is after 1939. 
whether, however, your 1950 agreement also covers colorization, that's exactly the issue. And what is your opinion? On the, on the other hand, on the other hand, if you let's complete that example. On the other hand, if today you would deal the rights or would secure the rights to show a film on TV, um, then you would be allowed to show it on TV in black and white since it's after 39. And then you have a very weak argument by saying, listen, I didn't know anything about colorization. Um, my personal opinion, it, it's really difficult. I mean, this amounts to whether you, to, to what degree um, you uh, uh, do follow the in, in views of the industry. Um, I always have the opinion that um, wherever we, they, they talk about the new market. Um, that our concept is, okay, when you've got a new market and you open a new market, then the author in principle should participate. I mean, it's something you created after all. I know the, the capitalistic approach um, is somewhat different by saying, hey, I get the object, now I do away with it, it's all right, and I get flat sum. Um, whereas our concept is, okay, well, th but still there is something. I mean, the author in the beginning, he doesn't really know what his little creation does develop to, does it stay a little flower or does it become one of these marvelous plants where you can take subsidiaries and everything and you have a whole jungle finally. Um, he, should, he should receive some remuneration if his, his little production turns out to be the marvelous uh, best-selling uh, best work. Um, and in this respect, I think also in terms of principle, uh, one should uh, not set a precedent to the effect that a new market is opened by colorization, in which finally the author does not participate. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, a, it's a theory approach. Uh, you know, I mean, there, yes, there's, there's heavy discussion in Europe going on, for example, the EC in its green paper um, is taking a different approach. They are not so much looking at new markets where authors should participate, they only think in terms of losses. Does the author lose something because somewhere a new market is opened? That doesn't sound that logical to me. I mean. uh, I'm also intrigued by the, the question of the conflict of laws issues, which again, mm -hmm. I, I believe have not at all been fully explored in litigation, at least in the copyright field. Uh, but your opinion is what I'm seeking. Uh, would it be your opinion that a United States national directing a United States production film, not produced in the United States, but simultaneously published in Canada and the United States, and assuming that your court would hold that the Byrne Union does apply uh, to this film, would it be your opinion that uh, this U.S. national, the director, could successfully sue in German courts to stop colorization of the film, or at least to stop showing of the film in its colorized version in, on German television? Um, I think that it's my opinion that the conflict of any international um, conflict of law rules, uh, which by the way for copyright law haven't been explored that much, as I'm aware of there's very little um, legislation um, there's very little even uh, a scholarly opinion about it. Um, uh, how things should be, what kind, how do you qualify the different things, what kind of facts should uh, uh, give rise to the respective laws to be applied. Um, but if we come to the, if, or if, if the outcome would be that the solution we find under a conflict of laws approach um, is contrary to what the international conventions say, um, I think that, that cannot be right. Um, if you look at it from the other way around, from the, the outcome, or the outcome is just, um, if you're sitting here in the States and you are dealing away with your rights, your worldwide copyright, what you're actually transferring is the copyright, a bundle of copyrights, of territorially <laughs> limited copyrights. So one of the copyrights you have given away is the German copyright. So why, even if you dealt away with it under an American law contract, why shouldn't the effects of that German part copyright, limited to German territory, be judged according to German law principles? Mm -hmm. Even from the outcome, I don't see, from the justification, I don't see any uh, real major problem with that. The effects of the German court decision would be limited to the German territory.
that was maybe the, the difference also to the to the case of the river versus uh, uh, Walt Disney, because it was a case about name attribution. Um, because here, Rewe was following in a theory he wanted uh, the resolution of the contract, flatly and plainly, which um, would have uh, the uh, consequence that the French court would have decided that the worldwide transfer of copyright uh, would be void. I mean, this is a different question. Um, and this sounds more like Rewe getting back the rights of a film which in between had proven very successful. So that eventually Walt Disney had to give him all the, all the gains and the profits. Um, and this may have led the court to um, decide on a, different, on a different basis. Mm -hmm. But I think the principle of uh, uh, the, the international conventions should uh, override, well, should not override, but uh, uh, it's only possible to find something as laws, the solutions, which are not contrary to the uh, international conventions. Uh, I have one other question. Uh, it's my understanding that there's relatively little uh, commercial <coughs> advertisement, uh, little insertion of commercials as part of showing films uh, on uh, television in Germany. Uh, and perhaps, perhaps you never do insert the film, the commercial, uh, to interrupt the film. Perhaps it's always shown. Uh, as, a, as an entity, as a whole, and the commercials at the beginning and the end. But to the extent that there may be such a practice of inserting commercials in uh, a television program, has there been some objection uh, by authors in Germany? And I have a, a second part of this question. What about the process of panning and scanning uh, films for the purpose of showing on television? Have authors objected to that in Germany? Um, to answer the first question of the uh, interruption by commercial, um, the uh, main TV stations, the state-owned TV stations, are forbidden by law to interrupt the, the films. However, some of the private um, uh, uh, outlets they do interrupt, um, only to a very modest extent. I think only once. Um, yeah, if I'm right, only one. So there might be some objection, but it has not surfaced to an extent where you really had a strong lobby uh, standing up. As to the panning and, and scanning questions, um, I was told by German industry that this process has been used for films distributed in Germany. I have to tell you that I myself have never been aware of, maybe because you never know the original. Um, however, what I can tell you is that to the letterboxing uh, we are perfectly used to. I mean, most of the uh, Cinescope films are shown with black stripes on top and on the bottom. There is no lettering in the letterboxes, but that's for another reason where we have a bad record on, and that you will almost find no film in Germany which is subtitled, because all the foreign films are dubbed. Uh, you can't imagine the uh, uh, sudden laughter of an American citizen watching Humphrey Bogart movie. Because Humphrey Bogart doesn't sound like Humphrey Bogart at all. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Clark. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm interested in knowing um, whether you can give us any information as to how the moral rights interests of film authors are dealt with in the uh, contract practices between film producers and broadcasters in Europe generally, or Germany in particular. Well, there's one remark I could make. Since, according to German law, um, even by statute, um, the author is only uh, protected against gross distortions. And since, on the other hand, the authors and the performers are always in kind of a weaker position, uh, you probably wouldn't have anything to the contrary, I mean, saying, okay, only minor modifications might be in violation of moral rights. Um, the other interesting thing which may be found in history or in the German practice is that in the model contracts uh, in the years uh, 30, the 30s up to 45, which is like the Nazi period, where they had that strong um, community uh, approach by saying that, okay, it should be the population or the, the folk as such, which 
as the overriding interest, even then, under that period, authors were prevented on the contractual basis by the model contract against gross distortion. As to the general uh, uh, situation uh, of today, um, I have to say uh, I don't know. I'm curious whether, uh, you know, as a general policy matter, is the growth of commercial television in Europe generating any greater pressures to allow broadcasters or film producers a greater freedom from the traditional restraints of moral rights obligations they owe to authors? Well, this is a, uh, the introduction of private TV in, in Germany um, as well as in other European countries, as you may know, um, has basically been a political concern. I mean, you, you saw the, uh, the selling off of state TV stations in France after the conservatives uh, came, came to power. Um, you saw in Germany um, where uh, the regulation um, of the permission to grant to broadcasting stations is not a federal matter, but a state matter. You had a clear dividing line between the policies of the Christian Democrats and the uh, Social Democrats. Uh, the Social Democrats now giving in and saying, okay, we have to give room to these private enterprises because otherwise we are running behind. Um, so, of course, obviously, there is a strong link between the policy regulations, the legal regulations in the media law field, and um, political and therefore industrial uh, uh, pressure, pressure groups. I think that uh, maybe given this one question of the interruption of uh, uh, films by commercials, apart from that, no pressure on uh, the moral rights have been, uh, have been surfaced yet, at least I'm not aware of it. Yeah. That's it, thank you. Well, I, uh, I thank you very much for your participation and your contribution. We have reached our journey's end. Uh, I thank all of you stalwarts uh, uh, in the audience, uh, the bitter enders who have stayed with us, stayed with us throughout. Uh, the uh, the hearing is uh, is now complete, and uh, I adjourn the hearing subject to the call of the chair. Thank you very much.